So good morning, everybody, and welcome to today's session on strong interactions on hadron physics. So my name is uh, Carlos Munoz, and I'll be chairing the first part of the session. So we have a full agenda, and I would really ask the speakers to keep the time allocated, which is 12 minutes, uh, to allow a few minutes of questions at the end of their talks. If you have questions during a presentation, please uh, raise your hand using the raise hand button in the Zoom app, and I'll call your name at the end of the, the talk so you can ask your, your question. So without further ado, let's start our first present presentation, which is uh, by Christophe Kutar. Uh, Christophe, uh, please uh, go ahead. Good, good morning. So I will uh, start to share my screen. We can see it. Yeah, okay, good. So I will go to uh, presentation mode. Okay, so uh, thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to give the talk. So this is a, a talk based on uh, papers written together with uh, those people. Okay, I cannot go to next slide for some reason. Oh, sorry. Okay, now it's fine. So uh, the KT. So first, I'm going to uh, discuss uh, just KT factorization. So the KT factorization is a framework where uh, already at uh, leading order gives you uh, access to the uh, full phase space. So similarly to uh, collinear factorization, uh, you have a hard matrix element and uh, part on density function, which now depend on the transversal momentum. So this hard matrix element here, uh, you calculate it with offshell initial state partons, which carry some transversal momentum. And, uh, and the as I said, the, the part and density used here, used here depend on transversal momentum too. So to see this, uh, this is the diagram which shows, uh, uh, I mean, incoming partons in the collinear factorization have to be uh, back to back uh, because of the momentum conservation. In the KT factorization, it is not uh, necessary uh, you, uh, because uh, the in incoming uh, momenta can be offshore, so you have access to the full phase space uh, in the end. So the, the final state partons can be um, just uh, at any uh, azimuthal angle. Uh, okay, S and here is the uh, basic, uh, I mean, delta phi distribution of, of digits, which shows you that, that you ha have uh, uh, you can have the full distribution uh, across the, the whole, all values of delta phi. And in standard collinear factorization, you will have a delta function just here uh, at, at delta phi equal pi. Okay, so to calculate matrix elements, it's kind of, uh, as it's, it's the, the basic idea is very simple. So you have uh, just uh, draw your Feynman diagrams and uh, for the offshell initial state gluon, you just uh, apply certain uh, polarization sum, which is uh, which which uh, kind of tells you that the incoming pattern is offshore. And so, so this is the the basic. Uh, I mean, the, the idea is that the, that the offshoreness in principle comes from some uh, auxiliary auxiliary. Uh, parton which which gives this KT to this to this gluon and, and, and then it becomes offshore. However, to go to more uh, kind of uh, complex calculations, one one needs to develop uh, a method 
which allows you to calculate any any uh, process uh, at, 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 at this moment at three level, or, or, although we have also results, uh, preliminary results for NLO. Uh, so the idea is to use the framework of uh, uh, cleaner factorization and to embed the KT dependent uh, matrix element in a larger process, which actually uh, puts this initial initial partons offshore. And then by uh, um, observing that that one needs to have all this kind of contributions to have uh, gauge invariance, one takes a pro uh, takes a certain limit. And uh, this is the method which uh, allows you to calculate actually any three level uh, matrix elements in this uh, KT factorization. So this is uh, in agreement with, with, uh, uh, with uh, Lipat of effective action who derived from QCD uh, methods to, to calculate uh, such uh, offshell uh, um, diagrams. And uh, then there is a, also some more formal derivation by Piotr Kotko based on uh, gauge links, which is actually gauge link is just such a line and, and which, which, which uh, also keeps the gauge invariance of, of the offshell matrix element. Uh, yeah. And this, all these things is implemented in a, a Monte Carlo event generator called KT. It's available on the, on the web. It's written by Andreas van Hameren. So now the next step is the, is the uh, parton shower. So if you have this offshell uh, matrix element, uh, one can do many processes without using Monte, uh, I mean, parton shower. But if you want to really look at the details of uh, all produced final states and put some additional cards, etc., uh, and constraints, you need uh, Monte Carlo. So then there, there is a Monte Carlo for TMD parton uh, densities. It's uh, there were already talks by by uh, Bermudez Martinez and Taheri uh, on, on on this, uh, so I will be brief. But the basic idea is that uh, emission of such gluons uh, allow you to, and, and, the, and, the, and keeping the exact kinematics, allow you to, to construct uh, TMD uh, parton density. And uh, this, this construction uh, works for uh, all flavors and, and gluons. So in principle, uh, there is a full framework for uh, matrix elements and uh, Monte Carlo uh, working on this within this KT factorization. However, there is one uh, shortcoming here that the splitting functions uh, are still collinear. And so the KT is, is generated uh, only via transversal, uh, via momentum conservation. So here are the, uh, the the plots of the of the of the um, gluon densities uh, that were that were uh, obtained within uh, this uh, this uh, Monte Carlo uh, part of branching Monte Carlo. So this is just to illustrate that it works, gives gluon densities, and very and and uh, also some um, yeah. Okay, so here is the some. Uh, application uh, of of this of this uh, of this framework. So, for instance, uh, I'm showing now a z, a z uh, and jet production. So this is a PT uh, of z, uh, where we uh, compared uh, the calculations with uh, existing uh, Monte Carlo uh, generators, and we see that in particular we can we can demonstrate that in the low PT region. For instance, uh, there is a large, uh, I mean, there's a contribution of MPI effects, which is taken into account in PowPEC, but, but we don't uh, take into account. However, our calculation is, is purely based on this TMD physics. And, 
and it's a, it's, it's a kind of a, a three level uh, calculation but it's already uh, I, I would say uh, reasonable okay so here is application to uh, digest production in central rapidity region so this is uh, so here we we just compare the calculation just part on densities and 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 matrix elements that's that this is this line uh, the blue line is um, matrix element part on densities and on top of this we take into account uh, uh, shower fine initial state shower which 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 uh, shows that that uh, this such contributions from shower is is relevant at at, at smaller values uh, of, of delta phi Okay, uh, now uh, application to to production of of trijets in a more forward uh, rapidity region. Uh, so uh, the part on level calculation is just this this black black continuous line. However, uh, if you want to, uh, what uh, then then we compare also just uh, matrix elements convoluted with, 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 with parton densities. And then we, we, we actually, uh, in this case, uh, for trijets, we are uh, on top of uh, this parton level calculation. So it seems that the, in this case, uh, for higher multiplicity, shower uh, is actually um, affects the distribution uh, less. So the kinematic is already better better described, uh, better accounted for for more multiplicity finite state. So this this method has been also applied to construct uh, part and densities for uh, for uh, for lead uh, to be able to calculate observables in, for p lead at, at LHC. So the idea is to take some initial condition from uh, collinear gluon densities and to evolve it uh, using the uh, the parton shower uh, parton branching method. Uh, and you Christoph, have, uh, yes, uh, you have one minute left. Okay, uh, and so those are uh, our uh, results uh, for distribution of of uh, of Drellian pairs in PLAT. So you see that we are at the three level, but we did describe the PT distribution in, in an, another, uh, and, and it's it's very good description in, in uh, yeah. So here are the preliminary results for, for, uh, um, for electron ion collider. So here the final state is, is electron and pair of jets. So this is the distribution that 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 we, that, that we get. Uh, this, here we compare some nonlinear equations uh, versus linear equations, and we see that this process is insensitive for for this let's say saturation effects, which uh, which you can expect. Uh, so here is the basic thing about saturation. If you go to lower and lower x, uh, the gluons start to recombine, and actually you need to change your factorization scheme from the simple one, which I've presented before, we have more complicated, where uh, this, these things here uh, are uh, just take into account the nonlinearity, but the structure, overall structure is, is the same. Uh, okay, and here are some results for the saturation for proton lead at LHC. We compared this framework, uh, which, which was on two slides before, uh, against the proton lead data and proton-proton data as measured by ATLAS. And we, we describe uh, shapes of the distribution very well. And this is to describe this, saturation is necessary and also some other effects like the initial stage shower effect called also Sudako form factor. So here is my uh, summary. Uh, yeah, so I, I I will just maybe you can just have a look read it because I don't want to take more time. Thank you.
I don't hear the chairs, but can I ask a question uh, while we're waiting? Yeah, yeah, sure. OK, thanks. You can hear me. OK. So I was wondering about your slide with the ZPT, where you were comparing to the POEC predictions. And we're mentioning that this very low PT region is dominated by MPI contributions or is affected by MPI contributions. Did you check this by, by enabling and disabling MPI um, in the in the shower? Because I would be surprised yes, to see such yes. a big contribution there. But yeah. Yes, I mean we we, we just uh, this was this was checked. Okay. Yes. Thanks. Sorry, thank you. Can can you hear me now? I, I was uh, actually talking, but muted. Uh, I apologize ah, for that. Yes, we can um, hear you. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so are there any other questions uh, for Christoph? Okay. If not, let's uh, move to the next presentation. Uh, which will be by Frank Seeger on measurements of prompt photon production with Atlas. Frank, please go ahead. Yes, so let me know if you can hear me and, and see my uh, slides. Yes, we can do both. Okay, very good. Then I'll get started. Yes. Thanks. Yeah, it's a pleasure to present the latest measurements of prompt photon production on behalf of the Atlas collaboration today. And I get started right away. And uh, Start with one plot which, which people typically associate <clears throat> to, to this phrase of prompt photon production in Atlas, namely the left hand plot, where we use photons, the, the, the photon process merely as a, or the, the photons merely as a tool to discover actually another process, namely resonances like the Higgs boson in this case here, or also for, as a tool for, for things like jet calibrations or, or PDF fits using the, the, the photon data. But today I actually want to talk about the prompt photon processes. <clears throat> excuse me, talk about the prompt photon processes themselves because they, they are actually quite an interesting process in terms of uh, testing for perturbative QCD. And that is even despite they are such a simple, apparently QED core process. So we'll, we'll see later in my talk that, that this is actually quite interesting for QCD. That's why it's in this session. Now, if we're talking about prompt photons at the LHC, there are different sources uh, of such photons. And the one which is the most abundant uh, by far is the one on the right-hand side, um, which are actually the ones that we're not interested in, namely non-prompt photons, which come from hadron decays like the pi naught. And they're actually the main background for the searches or for, uh, sorry, for, this, for the measurements that I'm going to present today. So we'll see those uh, later in a, in a little bit. And the other one on the other side of the page uh, we've already seen is the resonant production of photon pairs. And those are of course part of the, the prompt photon measurements that I'm going to show today, but they're completely negligible in the phase spaces that we're looking at. So if you are actually interested in those, I uh, invite you to, to look at the dedicated Atlas uh, searches or measurements presented uh, by other people at this conference. So that leaves us with the middle of this whole slide, namely the continuum production of photon pairs which um, on the theory side is, is typically described by direct production of photons and matrix elements or fragmentation production in fragmentation functions and parton showers. And experimentally is accessible by looking for isolated photons, isolated from hetronic activity and with the strict uh, uh, identification of the photon within the EM shower shape. So those are the ones that we want to look at. And Atlas actually has a very active prompt photon measurement program. And I've tried to give an overview by dividing it into this landscape of uh, the number of photons involved in the measurement and the number of jets involved. And of course, it starts with the single photon measurements on the left-hand column, where we have lots of inclusive photon measurements at the various center of mass energies, photon plus one jet measurements, and also photon plus two or more jet measurements um, in, the, in this case. And going further on the on the x-axis to the right, we also have a di photon measurement at, at various uh, center of mass entities, and actually one of them being brand new, um, public today and, and shown for the first time. So we'll go into a bit more detail on that. And last but not least, we also have three photon measurements um, at ATV uh, in, in the Atlas measurement program. So clearly this is uh, too much to talk about uh, in 12 minutes today. So I'll focus on the most recent measurements, namely the, the, the single photon plus two jet measurement shown above here and the new diphoton measurement in 13 TV um, just released today. So let's look at the uh, analysis definitions first um, of those two measurements. Um, <clears throat> The, the definition of the fiducial phase space, I've, I've put it here up as, as tables, uh, but don't expect you to look into, into all the 
details of this table, let me just point out that one main difference is that the single photon measurement is using a, a very hard photon requirement of 150 GeV of PT, while the dye photon measurement is relatively soft with 40 or 30 GeV, which makes a bit of a difference. The different observables are constructed from these, <clears throat> from, from these uh, final states, and I'll show a few results of those in a, in a minute. But before we actually go to the results, we have to talk about the difficult parts of the analysis. And one of the, the main uh, difficult part is estimating this background from the jets misidentified as photons that we saw earlier, where the photons are actually coming just from a pi naught. And the problem is that our simulation is not working very well to, to model this kind of background. So we can't just uh, subtract it using Monte Carlo, but we have to estimate it in a data-driven approach using uh, background-enriched control regions, um, typically um, based on the uh, a loosened identification and isolation cut as shown here on the top right, um, those two variables uh, try being the ones that identify our signal. And there's the, the, the basic idea here, and that is also the one that is used for the single photon analysis, um, is this ABCD sideband technique where you, you basically assume that if you know the ratio between D and C and D and B as a background between those background control regions, if you know the, the, the ratio of the background between those and the two variables are uncorrelated, the isolation, the identification, then you can directly get your background prediction in the signal region A from those uh, measurements. And then you correct for it a little bit uh, with a correlation factor R that takes into account the correlation between isolation and identification. And this was applied for the single photon analysis. Uh, while for the dye photon analysis, it's a bit more complicated. Uh, obviously, we have to extend this to the case of two photons now. So we have two photons times two identification or isolation uh, variable. So this is basically 4D. So we don't have just four regions, A, B, C, D, but actually 16 regions in our, in our um, fit now, um, with one of them being the signal region and 15 background control regions. And we also have more processes that can contribute to the background. So we can have the case where, um, besides the signal, of course, just one of the photons is produced by a jet uh, or faked by a jet, or both of them are faked by a jet. So this is fed into a likelihood fit. Uh, and then comes out a plot like the one on the right hand side for each of the observable bin, where you see the decomposition of, of the different processes in each of the bins, and then a lot of signal in the signal region, of course. All right, so once uh, we've identified this main background, then I also just want to touch briefly upon the subleading backgrounds in the diphoton case, where the one of them is uh, basically photons uh, faked by or radiated off electrons. And that is, as expected, just relevant in certain regions, namely where the Trajan process is relevant around M gamma gamma or MEE in this case, and close to the Z mass. So you can see this magenta background here popping up around 90 GV. And then another even smaller background, uh, just 1% inclusively, that is very interesting because it stems from uh, two single photon events coming from different pileup interactions, so from different vertices. And while this is small inclusively, it, it actually becomes significant in, in some regions like the cosine theta star uh, going towards one region, uh, which is kind of a decorrelated configuration. So this is uh, actually interesting to get this shape uh, also correct and the normalization, of course. So this is done in a sophisticated data-driven estimation, um, which uh, there's a slide in the backup in case you're interested, we can discuss later. All right, now, now that we've uh, the backgrounds under control, uh, let's see what the uncertainties are, the main uncertainties in the two analyses. In the single photon case, we're dominated by the jet and photon energy scale uncertainties. So in, in green here, the jet energy scale, and in red, the photon energy scale uncertainty, which becomes large at high uh, photon energy, photon transverse energy. Uh, maybe noteworthy is that the background fit uncertainty is not large here um, related to this main background I was talking about because at this high uh, transverse mass, a uh, transverse energy of the of the photons, we have a very high signal purity. So with these uncertainties uh, propagated to the results, we can look at the first results from the single photon plus two jet analysis here. I uh, flashed the fiducial region earlier and you might have seen that the phase space was divided into three different regions. Uh, this total uh, fragmentation enriched and direct enriched regions. And I'm showing you one observable from each of the regions. And it's actually quite quite nice to, to be able to do this division to be more sensitive to fragmentation components in, in the measurement. The description by the Monte Carlos used here is, is fair. Um, there are some, some problems there, um, the known high MJJ mismodeling. 
or uh, the Pythia part and not being able to describe the PT shapes very well, but this is kind of uh, also expected. So let's go uh, to the dye photon analysis. The uh, dominant uncertainties here are not actually the photon energy scale, but actually coming from the background estimation and from the modeling of the photon isolation variable. Um, the others are subleading, uh, compare, uh, which is different from, from the single photon analysis, as I mentioned earlier, simply because of the lower PT cuts of the photons here. In total, we have a, an integrated uncertainty of around 8%, um, which becomes larger in certain regions of phase space, like the low invariant mass region, where we go up to 25%. But we have to keep in mind that this is the, the first measurement in this region. So uh, the uh, low purity, uh, so high background rate, and the low data statistics in this multi jet dominated region is causing this large background estimation uncertainty. Now, with the uncertainties out of the way, we can go for right straight for the results, um, which are, as I said, um, brand new. We see an actually impressive impact from perturbative QCD, even on the simple uh, QED process, uh, even on the inclusive rate, as you can see on the right hand uh, top plot. Um, and also in the in the bottom um, for the different predictions that I've listed here at either fixed order next to leading order uh, with fragmentation from Difox or next to next to leading order from NNLO jet or a, a NLO merged uh, Monte Carlo uh, prediction from Sherpa. Actually, the, the perturbative regions are generally modeled very well by the most precise predictions, um, while in, in some of the soft collinear regions here, for example, at low PT gamma gamma, of course, the fixed order predictions are not expected to be valid. So we have here the, the leading and subleading photon uh, PT as a, as a distribution and the PT of the diphoton system. And going on to the, to the next slide, uh, we have two more observables, namely one being the invariant mass of the diphoton system, which has actually got quite an interesting shape, uh, which is sculpted by the PT cuts. And the region below the peak is, um, is populated through multi-jet configurations. So those are, of course, challenging to model. And, uh, this whole distribution is just uh, best modeled by these higher order predictions and in this low mass region, even just still barely within uncertainties. Um, on the right hand side, we see the scattering angle with respect to the beam axis in this special frame, uh, Colin Soper frame, which shows this uh, somewhat interesting behavior towards uh, uh, the value of one, which is sensitive to uncorrelated correlated photons, which are can, for, for example, be uncorrelated by uh, multiple jets being present in association with them, which is apparently described better here in this, uh, in the Monte Carlo, in the Sherpa Monte Carlo description. And last but not least, uh, three more observers, uh, three more variables which are um, more sensitive to this back to back configuration, which is sensitive to soft and collinear emissions. Uh, so, at fixed order, you would not expect these regions here always on the left hand side to be modeled very well um, because they're. Yeah, they would need resumation. Um, a merged approach with a pattern shower is modeling those uh, quite well in, in all three cases. The regions with a large decorrelation, on the other hand, are modeled well with the uh, highest precision predictions, um, whereas the NLO uh, prediction is struggling as uh, effectively for these observables. It's only leading order accurate, so it's not, not too unexpected. Right, that brings me to my conclusions. I uh, hope uh, you agree that prompt photons are a pillar of the LHC physics program and not just because of the Higgs discovery in the diphoton case, but because of the prompt photon measurements themselves. I've presented you two measurements today, one in single photon plus two jet production and one in the diphoton production uh, at 13 TV with the full run two data. And uh, found uh, we found impressive um, effects from from the strong interaction on this uh, sim simple QED process. Thank you very much for your attention. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Uh, thank you, Frank. Um, are there any questions? Uh, yes, um, Mirosav. Hi, Mira. Uh, on the previous slide, 21, I guess, I didn't get what's the small. Uh, zoomed plot? Ah, oh, sorry, yes, uh, I should have <laughs> said this. So there's a, a logarithmic plot, so both logarithmic in x-axis and y-axis is the main plot, and then there's just a linear inset plot, which is showing the region um, around um, the x value being at zero a bit oh, more okay. closely, so that you can see this, uh, this resummation behavior. Oh, thanks, thanks. Sorry, yes. There's also a note um, released today, which is linked here in the, in the conclusion slide, where you can see these plots a bit uh, more. 
uh, in higher resolution and and with more explanation. Any other questions for our speaker? Okay, if not, thank you again. Um, let's move off um, to our next talk, uh, who, which will be by Jerick uh, van Onsel, uh, who will be telling us about Monte Carlo modeling and tuning in CMS. Jerick, uh, thank you. I will share. Go ahead. Can you see the slides? Yes, please go oh. ahead. Yeah, so um, I will present the Monte Carlo modeling in, and tuning in CMS. Um, in a hadron collision, there is a wide range of different features that needs to be simulated by Monte Carlo generators. Uh, these include hard scattering matrix elements, the part and showers and radiation and the ionization and hadron decays. There may also be additional interactions taking place in a collision referred to as multiple partner interactions, MPI. And furthermore, uh, the remnants of the proton also still undergo interactions and hadronization. Uh, and the combination of MPI and beam rem remnants is typically referred to as underlying event. Um, the partons in the event exchange color and the rearrangement of these color fields uh, in the simulation is what we refer to as color reconnection. So in CMS, we um, commonly use Monte Carlo generators um, such as Powhag and Modgraph um, for um, both for fixed order matrix element calculations. Uh, Sherpa, which is a multi-purpose uh, generator, just like Pitya and Herwig, um, but these last two are often used um, to interface part and shower and underlying event simulation to the matrix element. Um, the underlying event, the part and shower development and hadronization typically involve lower energy scales, which means that these aspects uh, are not always calculable in perturbative QCD. Therefore, their, their modeling is governed by phenomenological uh, parameters that can be tuned to observe the data. Um, and CMS performed such a tuning for the uh, PTA-8 generator and more recently for um, the Herwig 7 generator for the MPI and color reconnection parameters in these tables. Uh, we consider a PT threshold, um, PT0, that governs the transition between soft and hard interactions. Uh, the lower this threshold, the more uh, MPI are generated, meaning more underlying event activity. This parameter has an energy dependence um, on the, yeah, and depends on the center of mass energy, which is uh, parameterized by an exponential function. Um, next, there are parameters uh, related to the overlap distribution between the two colliding protons. Uh, generally, a larger or denser overlap means more MPI. And finally, we consider parameters related to the color reconnection probability. A large value increases the amount of um, um, color reconnection and tends to reduce the final particle multiplicities. Uh, an important uh, remark is that the parton distribution functions and the strong coupling alpha s also enter these parts of the simulation and therefore affect the predictions. Um, and technically, the tuning is performed by fitting predictions to, to data using the Rivet and Professor frameworks. More specifically, this involves minimizing a chi-square uh, distribution, a chi-square function um, with respect to the tuning parameters uh, using the measured and observed pin contents. Um, the tunes are extracted from uh, relevant sensitive observables measured in minimum bias data. The observables include the charged particle multiplicity and scalar PT sum densities uh, as function of the PT of the leading track or leading charged particle jet. Uh, these are measured in the transverse regions. Uh, and as illustrated in, in this sketch, one can define um, a transmax and transmin region depending on where the most charged particles or highest scalar PT sum is located. Um, another observable used in the tuning is the charged particle multiplicity as a function of the pseudo rapidity. And these data are recorded at various energies um, by the CMS and CDF detectors. Um, components of the hard scattering, such as hadronization and ISR, FSR, uh, may affect these underlying event um, observables. For instance, the transmax region is more sensitive to ISR and FSR 
while transmitting more to MPI and, and beam remnants. And predictions for the for the distributions of the observables are obtained by simulating non-diffractive and diffractive inelastic events for each choice of, of tune parameters. So these are the results uh, for five um, CMS PTA tunes labeled as CP1 to 5. Uh, in these tunes, different assumptions are made for the order of the PDF set and the alpha S uh, value and running. We typically use higher order PDFs uh, in the analog matrix elements, so this may motivate the usage of higher order PDFs in the part and shower and underlying event. But in, in any case, the different assumptions uh, in the CP tunes allow us to check the consistency of matching the order of PDFs in the, in the matrix element and tunes. Um, CP1 and CP2 can be seen as LO PDF tunes, the alpha uh, as value. Um, so yeah, while CP3 is a is a uh, NLO PDF tune and CP4 and CP5 uh, and NLO PDF tunes, where CP5 just differs from CP4 by the uh, enabled rapidity ordering of ISR. Um, in these higher order PDF tunes, uh, the alpha S value is, is chosen lower uh, to be consistent with the analog calculation. Um, there are significant differences mainly between leading order and higher order PDF based tunes uh, in the values of PT0 and, um, and its energy dependence, as well as the amount of color reconnection. And these differences uh, can be explained by the different shapes of gluon densities at small x in the assumed PDFs, uh, as well as the assumed alpha S running. So these are example distributions uh, of observables in the transmin region used in the PTA-8 tuning. Uh, in the upper row, the LO PDF tunes, and in the lower row, the, the higher order PDF tunes. Um, at the left, the charged particle multiplicity density, and at the right, the PT sum density. Um, the rising part of the spectrum, uh, where, where diffraction processes become more important, is not always well described, but we should, we should note that, um, um, in fact, uh, in this very low region below 3 GeV, um, we, we don't include this in, in the tuning. Um, the, the different tunes all describe the minimum bias and underlying event observables uh, that we studied in a similar way. Uh, we have performed many validations of the PTA tunes uh, because ideally we would like an underlying event tune to be universal and describe a wide range of processes and observables. Um, event shape observables measured at lab are of interest um, because due to the leptonic initial state, uh, these observables are particularly sensitive to the alpha S value assumed in FSR. Uh, the so-called thrust observable T shown here, uh, where higher values of T means that uh, the event is more diegetic-like and lower values more isotropic. And we observed that the tunes assuming a lower value of alpha S are resulting in less isotropic events describe the data better. Um, in multi-jet events, we looked, for instance, at the angular separation between the two leading jets shown at the left. Um, where the predictions are obtained from NLO digest matrix elements uh, um, yeah, from PowerHack merged with PTA8. We see that tunes based on NLO alpha S uh, running are better than tunes um, with LO running, since the former results in a, in a lower uh, amount of FSR and thus less jet decorrelation. Um, validations were also performed using top quark pair events, uh, as shown at the right for the number of additional jets in the event, where the predictions are obtained from uh, interfacing NLO matrix elements from PowerHack with PTA8. Uh, and we see there that uh, an NLO alpha S value um, and an ISR rapidity ordering switched on, as assumed in the CP5 tune, is favored in these calculations. Moving on to the results of the Herbic 7 tuning, uh, we note that, that here um, different assumptions are made in the underlying event only for the order of the PDF uh, set uh, and the alpha S value and running. CH1 is a tune where an NLO PDF is assumed in the underlying event, um, which is changed, changed to a, an, a leading order PDF in CH2. 
and then CH3 has the same assumptions as CH2, but um, but just uh, the alpha S value is, is uh, chosen to be um, higher and, and matching the leading order. Um, in all these CH tunes and, and, and low PDF in the part and shower is assumed uh, consistent with the PDF we typically uh, use in matrix element calculations. Soft tune in this table refers to uh, default tune performed by the uh, Herwig 7 authors using Atlas data. Um, we see that the CH tunes have a lower PT0 and energy exponent compared to soft tune, which generally leads to an increased amount of MPI in these tunes. And from the chi square values, we can deduce that uh, generally a leading order PDF for the underlying event, as assumed in CH2 and CH3, is preferred. Um, but the, the choice of alpha S in the PDF seems less important. Um, so these are some example observables used in the Herwig 7 tuning. So at the left, uh, you can see the charged particle multiplicity as a function of the pseudo rapidity, where it is uh, apparent that in the CH tunes, there is an increased amount of MPI compared to soft tune. And at the right, the charge PT sum density is shown uh, in the transmin region. Um, and the, the CH tunes show typically a good agreement in the plateau of such spectra, but again, there are some discrepancies in the, in the rising part of the spectrum, which was not included in the tuning. And we performed again, uh, valid, um, various validations in different processes and um, observables. So the left figure shows the distribution of the PT of the hydronic top quark in top quark pair events. Um, again, with an analog matrix element calculation using PowHack interfaced with Herwig 7. Uh, generally, kinematic distributions uh, in top quark pair events are well described, um, but as one sees in, in the right figure, um, the CH tunes tend to underestimate a bit the high jet multiplicity, um, but there the scale uncertainties are expected to be higher. Um, in, in vector boson production, um, where predictions are, are obtained from analog matrix element calculations using MATGRAPH, uh, we checked, for instance, the exclusive jet multiplicity um, at the left, and, and we observe a similarly good description uh, by all tunes. And we also looked at the underlying event observables in, in Z plus jets production, such as the, the charged PT sum density at the right, uh, as a function of the PT of the dimuon system. Um, this observable is sensitive to the underlying event description at higher scales than, than uh, minimum bias data, and we see that the CH tunes describe the data well. So to summarize, um, CMS extracted and validated uh, sets of tunes for the underlying event simulation. Uh, for PTA8, it was observed that the new tunes improve on older tunes that were extracted at lower center of mass energy. Um, for the first time, predictions based on higher order PDFs um, were shown to give a reliable description. Um, in particular, the CP5 tune provides a good overall description, and this is the tune that is most used in CMS. We also derived the first Herwig 7 tunes uh, with CMS data, and um, they provide a good overall description, and the CH3 tune is, is the one that will be used uh, in CMS. Um, and we, we also found that in general, the underlying event simulation from the new tunes interfaced with higher order and multi leg matrix elements still provide a good description. And the extracted tunes and uncertainties are now widely used in the REM2 CMS measurements and searches. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, are there questions? I don't see any raised hands. So let me ask uh, you, you referred uh, to universality. I mean, and what's your opinion on the current status of these generators? I mean, are they universal enough? Or do you think it's if when they don't reproduce some of the channels, is it a matter of tuning or is it some physics uh, that should be implemented that it's not there yet? Yeah, I, I think um, they're reasonably universal. I mean, the, the things we see in the validations uh, across many processes and final states looks at least very good. But um, of course, there are a few cases where, um, where, where it seems that, for example, 
um, other tunes um, describe the data better than, than in other regions. So one can wonder why in some cases, for example, CP2 might describe a bit better the data than CP5. So in that sense, it's, um, it's, it's, it's not as universal as it probably could be, but I think, I think uh, it's definitely on the good, on the, on the good way. Okay, thank you. Uh, any other questions? If not, uh, let's thank Eric again and move to our next presentation, which will be by Miroslav uh, Miska. Uh, please go ahead, we can already see your screen. Uh, yes, hi. Uh, <laughs> we don't see your screen anymore. We'll... Yes. Oh, no, it's coming. Okay, very good. So uh, I would like to shortly describe how we implemented space-time coordinates of partons inside the PP collision modeling by Herrick 7 and how we used it for implement a new way of color reconnection. Uh, as we just had to talk about tuning, so probably everybody knows what the Herrick 7 is. So just want to point out its general purpose, Monte Carlo. So it calculates, it produces, provides you all the particles in the final state and the PP collision, not only just you know, products of the hard process of interest. And since the air reality of MPI, the simultaneous interaction of several pairs of partons within one PP collision uh, is modeled. There are actually many of them. Uh, and there is high uncertainty how to connect them in color lines in the color space. So there is one kind of artificial step coming in, which is called color reconnection. And this is what I will talk about. Uh, so far, the all the calculation is done actually in the energy momentum framework. Uh, it deals with the four momenta of the particles, but uh, we completely lack the information how far in spatial the particles, partons are. Uh, and there, that's what we wanted to use for color reconnection because color importance of this step, this algorithm rises, for instance, Top mass, top quark mass measurement reported uh, like 10% uncertainty coming from the color connection. And another motivation is also like uh, for larger systems like heavy ion collision, uh, that would be highly important to have this information how large the area is, where the parton actually is. As for losing energy, some particle traveling through the QGP and so on. And Herrick 7 is not alone, also PTR pursues this direction also. There is brand new paper, you can have a look at. So since the motivation started with MPI, let me say a few words about it. Uh, Herrick first generates samples number of uh, how many MPIs uh, will produce. And for this, uh, because it's governed by Poisson distribution, it needs the mean number and with the given impact parameter of the collision, it is calculated through the already mentioned uh, overlap function times inclusive cross-section. Uh, Herwig models this overall function uh, as a vessel function of third kind, which is the result of this electromagnetic form factor for the transfer distribution, this G function. And here I want to point out there is this parameter mu squared, also already mentioned, meaning of inverse proton radius squared. And you can see the overlap shape uh, for several mu square values. So the larger it is, the uh, smaller the overlap actually is, and more dense, let's say. So this is one parameter. Uh, the story goes a bit more complicated because you need to actually distinguish uh, which MPI are hard enough to calculate uh, perturbatively and which needs to be modeled 
phenomenologically. Uh, so we have a cut of PT min, which is also somehow extrapolated from some uh, basic value, which is tunable parameter. So these parameters go, comes from modeling of MPI itself. Uh, what is new, what we did, uh, we focused on transverse plane, X, Y plane, so perpendicular to the beam line. And uh, we assume that MPIs can actually interact in several positions in this space. Uh, so what we needed is the actual impact parameter of the collision, of the given collision we just calculate. So the logic is a bit inverse. So Herwig first samples how many interactions, hard and soft, it produces. And then we use it for actually getting the impact parameter of the collision. And this is how we kind of in the looping algorithm uh, decide where the position of MPIs might be inside this overlap uh, region. And we have several models like the Bessel function I mentioned, but we also tried black disk and caution. Uh, and the second source of displacement patterns can also be the, their evolution. Uh, this is quite old story. You can see the paper from BIFIA people, 40 years old. And uh, also code in Herrick 7 is uh, inherited from Fortran version. Uh, uh, so the model is that Pardon can travel according to its proper time, uh, which is governed by some random sampling for exponential law. Uh, and there is parameter mean lifetime. Uh, and this is as a function of its virtuality of the Pardon. Right? Uh, roughly speaking, it's one over a root square of virtuality. And this is what we observe, uh, that inside actually the shower evolution of the parton. So the first step uh, don't really allow parton to travel anywhere. If you look at the left plot, it's example event. So the black lines inside, you can see hardly, but there is. That's how far partons, any parton can travel inside the shower. And the red lines are the very final step in the shower where the virtuality is the lowest. So it's kind of last step jump, let's say. It can be even three Fermi's, as you can see. Uh, statistically speaking, there's a right plot. Just focus for the red solid line, for instance. This is percentage how far in the entire distance traveled by all partons, all particles. Uh, is these jumps last step shower partons. So it's almost 100%, like 95% in the all peaks. So we were playing with these virtualities, how to trunk it, how to cut it off. It's fun to 5G and so on. If you would be curious about the green line, uh, because Higgs can travel very far. So the distribution is different for Higgs. <sighs> So after playing with these virtualities, uh, we actually decided that all partons in this final step of shower will be assigned the same virtuality, we call it minimum virtuality knee, and we made it tunable parameter. So we actually decided to ignore all the shower except the last jump. And this what produced the example event, uh, you can see on the left, and there are these four circles, it's four MPIs in the event with their center and around this center, you have partons which evolve from the center. So we have green partons from one MPI, red from second and so on. So you can see in the transfer space, how it might look like. So now the color connection comes in, uh, Herwig uses um, cluster algorithm. Uh, so it creates in the default version, uh, or the original version, like mesonic cluster. So quark, anti-quark uh, creates a cluster, a colorless object. Uh, but we can also assume that such patterns can exchange very soft glue on and swap the color. So the upper plot well, this is the same event, but the upper plot creates different clusters than the lower plot. And there are many, many ways how to do it. 
you can have a look at the papers and have several motivations of today. What we pursued is called baryonic color reconnection. Uh, if you focus on the cluster A, uh, the quark and anti-quark, quark is white and anti-quark is black. Uh, so in the rest frame of this cluster, uh, they fly away each other and we loop over other clusters. And if it looks like in the top plot, uh, top picture, uh, that along the first anti-quark flies quark, we may want to connect them into a cluster C and the other to the cluster D. So it, this would be like mesonic color connection. But it can also happen that this white upper circle would be black. So we would like to say, okay, if there are another black, like in the left bottom picture, we would find three clusters aligned in the rapidity like that. We may create actually uh, so-called baryonic clusters created by three quarks or three anti-quarks. And of course, we need two things, some tunable probability, if to do it, if to reconnect or not, and of course, some measure uh, like to decide what kind of reconnection we prefer. Right? And this is, again, new step. Uh, this measure R squared is uh, now combination of delta y, the rapidity difference, and delta r, that's the distance of the partons in the transfer space. And here comes another tunable parameter, t0. Uh, I can call it like characteristics length. And it actually uh, scales uh, which of these two components of the measure are, let's say, more important for the color reconnection. So here finally comes some results. There are many parameters. I didn't cover all of them, but the new ones, the minimum virtuality assigned for last step, parton shower gluons uh, is the x-axis in the chi-square plot. And the uh, best value was found quite large, 4.5 g square. And the characteristic length d0 is 0 0.15 Fermi. Right? We also show two variations, like we decided to take it to show variability of the model, flexibility. Uh, we tuned the model on the Atlas CMS and some Alice data for minimum bias and underlying event. So just a taste of the results. So it's a rapidity of the charged particles for five event selections. Uh, you can see, for instance, in the upper line, that the red line of the best tune sits on the data quite well. So that's the actually main result uh, that we did not really jump somewhere away of data, uh, that the model would completely destroy the success of the Herwig. Uh, there is, for instance, transverse momenta of the charged particles, also against the minimum bias atlas data. So this is like <laughs> flagship results. So some modeling is very well. Uh, some modeling is, of course, not that well, uh, like PT of the leading track. But uh, this, this modeling, you see, it's actually related to Herrick itself as a known feature, not really unsuccess of, of the new color connection. And there, there are many results in the paper, if you, uh, other, a few others in the paper. Uh, but the, our conclusion is that we managed to actually assign position mm, trajectories to all partons inside the generation, we succeeded to uh, prepare such color connection, which would give, let's say, reasonable results and distort towards the heavy ion collision, let's say, maybe other issues is open now. Uh, that's it. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Miroslav. Other questions? We have a couple of minutes left. Okay, I don't see any. Uh, thank you very much. And let's uh, move to Leticia okay. Conqueiro now. Hello. Hello. Very good. We can see your screen. So can you see yes. my slides now? Yes. Please okay. Try. Okay. Very good. So hello, everyone. Um, I will be discussing a little bit uh, about the direct and indirect observation of the dead cone uh, with heavy flavor jet substructure. So the dead cone effect is a fundamental property of uh, quantum field theories by which uh, the radiation of particles from uh, uh, a massive particle with mass m and energy e is suppressed within a cone of angular size m over e around the emitter. So the first der derivation of the dead cone in QCD was done by Donchitz et al. 30 years ago. And uh, parametrically, uh, it can be described with this uh, equation that you see in the slide. So this equation represents the uh, distributions of distribu the angular distributions or distribution of gluons of a uh, heavy quark Q divided by the distribution of uh, gluons emitted by a light quark. And uh, you can see uh, that uh, parametrically, uh, this uh, ratio is suppressed and the suppression is governed by theta zero, which is precisely the ratio of the mass of the heavy quark divided by its energy. And on the right hand side, uh, you can see a um, simple drawing of this parametric dependence for um, different masses. And you see uh, how the strong suppression happens at, uh, at, uh, at small angles. So, uh, the fact that uh, radiation is suppressed uh, around uh, at smaller angles uh, has some very direct implications. The first one is that uh, um, uh, if uh, small angles are suppressed, then uh, it, this means that uh, the, the hard gluons with uh, the hard collinear gluons are, are suppressed. And then since QCD is uh, uh, divergent in that regime, that's where precisely where radiation is more intense, this would lead to a reduction of uh, a strong reduction of emissions and then a fragmentation function that will be picked at that larger values uh, offset. And then also logically, uh, uh, one expects lower hydrojet uh, multiplicities. So the dead cone uh, so far has been uh, uh, elusive. I mean, the direct measurement uh, of the dead cone has been elusive. And uh, this is because uh, there are several uh, complications. Uh, the main two are listed here. One is that uh, the decays of the heavy flavor particles um, happen to uh, happen at the similar angular scales, so at small angles, and then they darken uh, the dead cone. And uh, also the accurate determination of the dynamically evolving direction of the heavy flavor particle relative to which radiation is suppressed is not trivial. So historically, people have used uh, jet axis, have used the thrust in the event, um, Etc. So uh, the advent of uh, of the iteratively of the rec iteratively recursive techniques uh, brings open opens up uh, uh, new opportunities. So we found with uh, anti KT, for instance, which is the preferred algo at colliders, and uh, one takes the constituents of the jet and uh, reclusters them um, with a given metric, for instance, the Cambridge Aachen, which um, orders the constituents in angles. And then uh, what one does is uh, unwinds the cluster in history. And then at each step, uh, one takes the subleading prong and uh, one registers its kinematic uh, coordinates, the so KT and angle of the subleading prong and uh, projects it into, onto the loon plane, uh, which is drawn uh, um, on the left-hand side of the, of the slide. So the loon plane is a representation of the um, intrajet em emissions. Okay, so the, the coordinates of the subleading prong represent the, the coordinates of the, of the mid uh, gluons uh, through the jet shower. So the new ingredient here is that uh, instead of uh, following the, the hardest branch in the iterative uh, process, we follow the, 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 the chunk that contains the fully reconstructed uh, heavy flavor hadron at, uh, at each step. So an example um, of a lone plane now expressed in angle and energy of the radiator 
the energy of the radiator is the sum of the energy of the subleading and leading prong at each the clustering step. And uh, this uh, lone plane, well, this is a relative difference of lone planes. It's uh, the relative difference between uh, the lone plane of a, of a big quark and that of a, a light quark. And uh, you can see uh, a region uh, which is uh, in deep blue um, where uh, there's actually no uh, emission. So radiation is totally suppressed. And you see that it also coincides parametrically with the red line, um, uh, which is the, yeah, par the parametric line for the, for, the, for the dead cone. So the, the message to take home here is that uh, if one wants to see um, uh, suppression of radiation, uh, one uh, should rather look at small radiator energies uh, because that's where uh, the effect happens at angles that are measurable experimentally. So uh, two radians, uh, so log of one over theta equal to two is about 0 0.1 radian. So the philosophy of all this is to uh, use the iteratively clustering to penetrate the jet tree deep enough to um, then reach the small angle splittings that then are sensitive to the, to the mass effects. So experimentally, what we did in the least is we consider the decay channel of the D0 to uh, K pi, it has a modest uh, branching rate of 4%. And uh, what we do is we perform the standard sideband subtraction. So essentially, uh, we look at the um, uh, peak region in the invariant mass distribution, and we build a lone plane uh, with uh, those uh, jets containing the, the, the D0 jet candidates. But then, of course, we want to subtract. The, the map of splittings corresponding to uh, combinatorial D candidates, so background D candidates. So then we look into the green region um, in the invariant mass plot, and then also draw the splitting map. And then we perform a subtraction. So as it's written in the in the in the lower uh, left corner. So I mean, just as a detail, uh, you might be wondering what's the horizontal band uh, at low KTs. So, um, and, uh, and small angles, this is um, uh, splittings that come from the, from the, from the D star decays. So, so the, 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 this lone plane, that's why it's potentially very sensitive because of course, I mean, this part is a non perturbative part, but you can see that it's sensitive to, um, uh, to, yes, to decay or, or, or low KD splittings too. Okay, so uh, okay, there are also a little bit of more technical decays because we correct for the reconstruction efficiency. So the topological and the PID cuts that are used for the D candidate selection, they have finite efficiency. And also the fractions uh, uh, at the detector level uh, of prompt and not from uh, need to be estimated, at least we do with a uh, with a uh, with a uh, reweighting uh, with the experimental uh, efficiencies. So Essentially, we end up with a, a sideband subtraction, uh, subtracted lone plane. So again, KT versus angle uh, of for the uh, D zero jet candidates. And on the right hand side, you see the, 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 the lone plane for inclusive jets. Inclusive means everything without a heavy flavor uh, bias or without heavy flavor tagging. So mostly light quark and gluon, uh, gluon jets. So our main observable would then be uh, the ratio of the projections of these planes onto the angle axis. Uh, and then this will be done by considering cuts on uh, KT. So KT is the scale of the splitting. So um, it's as simple as a horizontal cut. And then uh, we can require the KT to be uh, two times lambda QCD, for instance, or, or lambda QCD in order to suppress the harmonization uh, effects and remain with a, a purely perturbative uh, splittings. So the fact that this is a ratio observable um, uh, means that uh, the detector, detector effects, they cancel out in the ratio. Um, and uh, okay, so this is the final observable. We call it R theta R because it's a ratio and the precise definition um, uh, is on the, on the upper right uh, corner. And what you can see is that uh, indeed the, 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 the splittings at low angles, so at large log of one over theta are very much uh, suppressed. And uh, you can also see that the suppression, the degree of suppression varies with the, um, with the, with the KT uh, cut supply. So the, the more stricter the KT cuts are, then uh, the, the more uh, of a suppression that we see. And here note that uh, we are binning on uh, radiator. Again, the radiator is the energy of the uh, emitter in the given splitting uh, between five and 15 GB, so uh, quite low. 
And then a word, of course, as I said, I mean, here we will have not only prompt uh, these, but we also have non-prompt. And then this means that uh, um, there are B hadrons that are decaying into these these zeros. So this means that uh, there are extra uh, pies uh, from the B hadron decay that will generate extra splittings at low angles. And in general, uh, they will darken a bit the, 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 the dead cone uh, effects. But this is like a 10% uh, uh, contribution that we have uh, that we have estimated. So another thing that one can do is to check uh, how this dead cone uh, suppression increases with uh, um, radiator energy. Parametrically, we expect that uh, uh, the larger the radiator energy, then the, the, the less of a suppression. And this is what we see here when we go from 5 to 15 GB. And uh, OK, so, so now, uh, uh, as I said, uh, so this is a, a direct observation because we are really looking at the distribution uh, uh, of the uh, splitting angles. But uh, now let's see what happens to the intrajet multiplicities. And one way to quantify it is to look at the NSD. So the NSD um, is the number of subjects or the number of prongs uh, that satisfy the so soft drop grooming um, condition so that they are sufficiently hard. And uh, what we see is that uh, for these zero tag jets, uh, um, in general, uh, the, the, well, the, these, these zero tag jets have less uh, prongs passing the, the, the soft drop gut than uh, inclusive jets in blue. And when we look to Pythia, um, what we see is that uh, for this difference between these zero tag and, um, and, uh, and, uh, and inclusive, there are also other contributions because of course uh, uh, there are color factors, right? So, uh, so also light quarks have uh, fewer um, NSD prongs than, uh, than, than gluons. So both color factors and mass effects are contributing uh, to this, uh, potentially contributing to this difference that, that we observed experimentally. So from this point of view, the ZG is perhaps more interesting because the ZG, um, which is the momentum balance of the groom splitting, this is theoretically um, uh, proved to be so color average, so it doesn't depend, uh, for, it doesn't change for, for light quarks or gluons, as you can also see um, on the PTS simulation on the right. So the SEGI is uh, similar for, for light quarks and gluons, and then it sticks out for, uh, for, for, for these zero tactics. So here we are potentially isolating uh, mass effects and experimentally um, uh, we have some hints that the uh, ZG distribution is more asymmetric in the case of uh, these zero tag jets than inclusive. And this is consistent with a uh, harder fragmentation for, for, for heavy flavor quarks. So I reach now to my conclusions and then, uh, well, yes, this is the first direct measurement of the dead cone. Uh, we've looked at the splitting angles in detail, and uh, we've also used the groom jet substructure, like the SEGI or the NSD, uh, to probe the direct consequence of the dead cone, which is the harder fragmentation and uh, also lower intrajet multiplicities. And uh, very quickly, uh, I would like to say two words on prospects. Um, one prospect is run three, so the run three projections that we've done uh, tell us that uh, we'll be able to measure the dead cone in a lease in PP using fully reconstructed behadrons. And this is a very nice opportunity. So this is uh, the R theta for B um, uh, tag jets to, to inclusive. So we will be able to scan the mass dependence. And then the next step would be to look at the uh, dead cone in heavy ion collisions because uh, in heavy ion collisions, medium induced radiation is not expected to uh, respect the, the, the vacuum rules and it's expected to fill the dead cone. And perhaps this brings a very interesting opportunity to explore a region of phase space where the vacuum radiation is suppressed and then everything's dominated by medium induced signal and this is this is the end thank you thank you very much Leticia. are there questions uh, yes uh, hannes absolutely this is a fantastic result i'm, I'm <laughs> very very excited about that uh, you you say only in in uh, the the next run you can do B um, or, or an analysis on on B hadrons. Why why is that? Is it because of statistics or because you need to fully reconstruct the B or? It's because, yeah, so the, the thing is that uh, um, in order to uh, get the, the subject energy at each step, 
uh, and also to avoid decay particles uh, darkening the effect, we really need to reconstruct fully the, the, the hadron. So then uh, for that, yes, it's uh, mainly um, uh, a matter of uh, statistics and, uh, and, and, and significance. So uh, it's only with, a, with an increased statistics of round three that we'll be, that we'll be able. So now, I mean, maybe uh, reconstructing uh, bees uh, via electrons uh, could be possible, but uh, yes, when you don't fully reconstruct the, the, the heavy flavor prong, then uh, the effect is diluted. Mm -hmm. so. Thank you. Any other questions for our speaker? Okay, if not, uh, let's thank her again. And thank you. Move to our last uh, talk before the break, which will be by Matthias uh, Schott on QCD right. instant stone at the LHC. Uh, okay. I guess I can start? Yes, you can go ahead. Okay, let's just directly go to the next slide. Um, okay, so you might have heard of incitons before in your very basic quantum uh, courses, because actually it's a very well-known process. The basic idea of what you see here on the lower left is such a double well potential, and one way to solve it is by just inverting this um, potential, then calculating the classical solution, and transform, transform this back to a, a quantum mechanical solution. And this tunneling process between this well is actually an instanton. Now, Toft already realized several decades ago that the same concept of instanton solutions can also be extended to any young Mills theories. So any non-abelian um, nature of the young Mills theories leads exactly to this effect. And what you see here on the lower right is such a kind of illustration. Um, so there we have a vacuum with um, several um, minima. And what you typically do is you use perturbation theory. You just choose one minima and develop around this. However, what you typically ignore are processes, tunneling processes, which are called instantons, or processes which are going you know, across this potential, which usually are called Sullivan processes. OK, so that's uh, what, what instantons are. Let's go to the next slide and um, see where this comes into the game when we look at QCD and uh, electroweak theory. So for the electroweak theory, um, these instanton processes or Sullivan processes are associated to uh, the baryon and lepton um, asymmetries or, or baryon lepton um, um, number violations. And actually, that's rather crucial for the evolution of the universe. So, the same effect, as I just told you, has to happen in the QCD. And, and there, actually, it's thought that these QCD instantons um, are uh, uh, also solving several problems like the axial U1 problem or chiral symmetry breaking. Now, very important now is obviously how big this barrier is between one and uh, the second vacuum, which you saw in the previous slide. So you can calculate this for the electroweak sector, and there you see that this barrier high is roughly 10 TeV. And actually means that if you would like to look for these effects in, in particle collisions, you, uh, the FCC wouldn't be enough. You need something like 200, 300 uh, TeV collider to be able to see this. However, the situation is completely different in QCD. Because there, the barrier high is um, given by this expression, which you see here. So it's v pi over um, 4 alpha s and rho effective. And this actually scales with q. So in some sense, if you go to very small, um, uh, very um, small um, uh, couplings or effective sizes, then actually then you can change this, uh, the size of the potential. That actually means that you can be, uh, in, principle be you're in principle, able to see these effects, these instantaneous effects in QCD. So in the next slide, actually, um, looking for these effects is not completely new. Actually, this was already done at the HERA Collider. Actually, most of the literature so far has been um, looking into uh, QCD instanton effects in electron proton collisions, which is schematically shown here on the right side. In principle here, the process um, is um, uh, characterized by two scales. First, obviously, by the um, available energy of the collision, but then secondly, here by this outgoing quark, which you see here as, as Q um, double prime. And um, the reason why this wasn't used is simply a theoretical reason, simply because to get um, an infrared safe prediction on these instant contributions. Now, um, actually, then this was looked for, and then there have been setting um, upper limits on the actual cross section of these processes. Now, uh, the complete picture is a little bit different for the QCDs at hadron collisions, because they are actually, it's quite difficult to, to um, have such a second scale par uh, parameter. And both of the incoming partons are therefore on the mass scale. 
And uh, as you will see in a second, this actually results in um, QCD instant on induced scattering processes, which produce something like soft bombs, which you can imagine as a decay of mini black holes. We will see this in a second. So let's go to page number five. Um, so actually, the following presentation now is based on this publication, which I did together with uh, Valia Kose and Frank Kraus. And since I'm the experimentalist in this group, um, unfortunately, I have to talk now in, in uh, eight slides about stuff which I only vaguely understand. So let's let's see how, how, how well this goes. So um, in, in the approach which was taken in this paper here, only small instanton um, processes contribute to the scattering process of QCD. And then once you see, once you think about this multi-final states, and obviously the one thing comes always up as a, as a critics, that one cannot make a fissured hadron collider. This essentially says that high multiplicity uh, final states should be largely um, um, depressed. Well, at the electroweak theory, this is uh, obviously already true simply by the fact that the barrier height is so high. Um, however, for the, uh, for the QCD part, um, they actually will see in a second uh, in, a, in, in some slides that um, the Sullivan size also falls with increasing um, um, center of mass energy. And we um, uh, get a uh, um, quite um, high suppression of, of, of scattering rates when we go to, to smaller energies, as you will see in a second. So this critics, I think, really doesn't play a role for us uh, in this case here. So let's go to the next slide and go a little bit more into the calculation itself. So what we want to calculate is actually this process, which is shown here. So two gluons go to this instanton, and this instanton um, process leads to um, the generation of, of several gluons, as well as all available quarks and uh, anti-quark pairs, which are in the kinematic range. We will discuss this a little bit later when we come to the implementation in a, in a um, generator. Also quite important for this process is that there are no fermions of opposite triality. So um, no left-handed quarks nor right-handed uh, handed anti-quarks actually are produced by this process, which actually is a core prediction of the QCD. So then we also can look at uh, quark-initiated incident processes, looking um, by this, uh, well, looking at the formulas below here. Essentially, we get this by just inverting um, the uh, two of the outgoing fermion lags into incoming antifermions in the initial state and then do the calculation. So let's go uh, to slide number uh, seven. So essentially, um, the basic idea here is that we can calculate this via the optical theorem. So compute the imaginary part of the two uh, to two fold scattering amplitude, which is actually shown here. So now let's look a little bit more detailed into this expression, what we actually have here. So the integrals here go over all collective coordinates of all of the instanton anti instanton configurations, which we have. So rho and anti rho are the instanton and anti instanton sizes. Um, U is a separation between the, or a small mistake, between um, the two instanton positions in the Euclidean space. And uh, omega is now a three times three matrix, which specifies the relative orientation in the SL3 color space. Now then you see there are more um, 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 factors or, or terms in this integral. So you see this D and this exponential here. So let's see what that is. So let's go to the next slide. So there you see the D. So this is essentially the uh, instant on density given by um, the one loop expression by Toft, which we use. So this is actually a, a rather old paper already. And this is just this expression here. You can plug this in and most of the constants are, are known. And then there is this exponential factor e to the uh, minus s um, double i, which is a semi-classical suppression factor for the process of the action um, of instant to un uh, instant to anti instant con configuration s as shown here. So s um, i i can be separated with these terms, whereas i simple is the action of the single or anti uh, single or anti instanton action. And u int is the integral between the potential of the instanton and anti instanton, which can be now attractive or um, repulsive. And actually, here the general expression was already calculated in 1991. So this is also known. Let's go to the next slide. Um, so actually, now this, uh, this uh, instanton anti instanton action can be uh, rewritten by the dimensionless variable, which we call now um, xi, which is r over rho. So rho again was the instanton size and um, well, leading to the expression which we have here. And this can be computed. And this is actually shown here on the, on the right, uh, right hand slide. The a little bit more interesting is the lower plot here where actually you see the leading order uh, contributions, which are the dashed lines and the next to leading order uh, uh, contributions which are shown here as dotted lines for this, uh, for this potential uh, independence of Xi. 
Okay, so once we have this, we can again go one step further to slide number uh, 10. And thank you. And then, then taking also into account the feminine contribution, uh, contributions, uh, we get to this expression. So the previous expression just put, plucked everything in what we had so far. So the problem now is, and this is why these uh, full uh, predictions of this QCD instant on processes are rather uh, uncertain, is that this um, suffers from severe infrared problems when we go to very large instant on sizes. Now, the basic idea to break um, this or to solve this is that we can break this classical scale invariance by inclusion of quantum um, corrections that describe um, the interactions of the initial state gluons. And this idea actually goes back already to a paper by Müller in 1991. And this is actually what we use here. So we use and, and put this in. That actually, this is in some sense our solution to the idea which was a terror to use this uh, scale variable to suppress this uh, effect. Okay, so we put this in and then we go to page number, uh, slide number uh, 11. I have to hurry up a little bit. And we get now to this uh, final uh, uh, cross-section on parton level. We do the calculation. Well, actually, this was done by Valia. And if you want to hear the details, invite him for a seminar talk or read the paper. Important now for us is here um, the, tab uh, the table here on the lower right. We actually you see now the final cross-sections of this instant on processes. OK, so this is only on parton level. So if you go to page number 12, you briefly see how we in included this into the Sherpa generator. So essentially, we just integrate now um, the parton density functions over this cross-sections, which Valia provided us um, on parton level. And then actually, you get uh, shown here in this uh, table below the next uh, the um, the actually proton-proton cross-sections using NMPDF 3.1. And now that's obviously gets interesting because once you get to uh, we have, when you have small energies, it's a very sizable cross section of uh, six millibar, and you can get that then obviously this this case, uh, decays exponentially. So we get something like three femtobarn for um, five hundred uh, GeV center of mass energy. Let's go uh, two more slides I have. So let's go to page number um, thirteen. What are we, if you want to see this, uh, find this is perfectly fine, page 14, thanks. So um, if you want to see these observables, what, or if you want to see an incident process at the LHC, what you would looking for? Well, obviously this depends a little bit on the available center of mass energy. If you look at low instant on masses, so a sm small s, then you would expect many tracks. And these tracks actually should, should be um, um, spherically symmetric. And um, there should be many of them. And they should come from all the quarks. So U anti U, D anti D, S anti S, C anti C. If you go a little bit, bit wider, then you get also tracks from B anti B. If you go to higher energies, then you would expect um, jets, lots of jets, again, spherically symmetric. The problem obviously is, and there are some of the distributions um, here, the problem is if you go for low energies where you have high um, cross sections, then clearly um, uh, this is very similar to underlying event. Now you have to come up with a strategy how to distinguish normal underlying event from these incident processes. And one idea would be, for example, that you fix your models for the underlying event in the forward region of your detector and then search for the um, QCD instantons in the central part simply because there they're expected to be more pronounced. Okay, let's go to uh, the last slide already. Um, okay, I discussed this already. Let's go to page number 16, just to the summary page. Um, okay, so this would be uh, this whole talk was a small teaser that I think you should or we should start looking for QCD instantons simply because they're the last prediction of the standard model, which has not been experimentally observed. I mean, by last prediction, the last core prediction that this should exist. And what we showed here was the first calculation on the incident processes at the LHC and the implementation in, in Sherpa 3.0. I think it would be good um, to have a next calculation where we use a HERA style setup. I mean, by forcing uh, one particle to be off shell and do the calculation again. And then uh, you see also in the uh, last slides, some promising observables for dedicated search for QCD instant processes at the LHC. And that's already the end of my talk. Thank you very much, Matthias. Uh, very interesting talk. So there is a question by, I don't know the name, but go ahead, please. Okay, sorry, I hope you are talking about me. Yes. Unknown name. Uh, unknown name, exactly. It's known <laughs> to me. Uh, uh, you know, actually, uh, I have a question because, hello, Matthias. I'm Hi, how are you doing? 
uh, I mean, you are talking about instant on production at, uh, at the LHC, but my, when I, uh, I, I'm completely far from this topic, but uh, you were showing the cross section and the cross section was much bigger for lower energy. Yes. Does it mean it is better to look for instantons at lower energy at RIC or some other accelerator or SPS? Uh, so a very good idea, a very good question. So the, the problem, so the cross section actually is, um, okay, so I, okay, good question. The problem with these calculations is that there are assumptions on the, um, on how the instanton behaves at small, at small energies, right? And unfortunately, our predictions, I would trust them uh, maybe to one or two orders of magnitude of size. So the problem what we have is when you go to very low energies below 20 GeV, which I showed, then rather soon your instant on cross section gets larger than the overall proton proton cross section. And obviously this is nonsense. So apparently it's just a sign that our calculation breaks down at some point at small energies. And that's the full problem. Yeah. So the this this calculation gets reliable more and more that you get to higher energies. When you get to low energies, then essentially it loses um, any predictive value. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any other questions for Matthias? Okay, if not, uh, thank you again. And I would like to thank uh, all the speakers of this morning. We'll have now a short break and we'll reconvene at uh, 9.40 for the next uh, presentation. Thank you, everyone. Hello. The speakers for the next uh, part of the session, can we check your connection and the slide sharing? I think the first speaker is Bo Lin. Uh, yes, uh, this is Bo uh, Hello. 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 Uh, let me try to share uh, my screen. Yeah. You can yeah. see the slides already? Yeah, just okay. change, change the slides uh, to, uh, to see if everything right. works. Let me see. Uh, right, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Okay. Cool. Well, thank you. Thank you. Then uh, we'll have Anton Churek. Churek. Yes, I'm here. I hello. Share screen. Hello, hello. Share screen. Uh, how I screen. Okay. Mm -hmm. Very well. Is that okay? Yep. Thank you. Yeah, it works fine. Then the uh, next speaker is Rafal Stashevsky. Do we have Rafal connected? Uh, not yet. So maybe uh, Rafael Sikora, if uh, you, can you hear me? Or oh, Rafael Stasiewski. Rafael, if, uh, if you hear me, can you just check that uh, your sh slide sharing works? Hello, Sharka. So this is me. I, I understand that I should also be sharing video. Hello. Does it work? <laughs> okay. I think it works. Let me let me try to find the slides. Try sharing. Yep. Yep. Okay. Works fine. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, and the next speaker then is Rafael Sikora. Rafael.
uh, not sure he's connected, maybe not yet. Um, Anna, I think we already tested your sharing, right? Would you like to try again or it's okay? Uh, yes, we checked before the first session. Yeah, yeah, I think it's okay. So, Arthur, Arthur Bolt. Hi, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Very well. Good. And then I'll also try to share my slides. So, these are here and I, mm -hmm. can, I can. Yeah. Slides. Very Works nice. very well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and then our last speaker will be Otto Nachtmann. Is he connected? Okay, I don't hear anybody. So let's say for the moment we are set up, and we hope that. Uh, Everybody will be will be here when his time comes. So we will start in uh, in about five minutes.
Okay, I see we have now Otto Nachtmann connected. Uh, would you like to check? Uh, uh, will you share your slides or do you prefer that we share them for you? Yes, uh, I will have, I have the slides on the computer here, so it should be all right. Should okay. we try out? Yeah, that would be maybe better. Yes. <laughs> just so as a practice. Then, yes, just a minute. But if the, if the host stops share stops sharing, maybe for, for for a minute. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so try again. And so now I click here, double click, uh, Thailand. Ah, here it is. Yeah, perfect. Okay, That's very right. well. Oh, thank excellent. you. Super. <laughs> yes. Thank you very much. Okay. So, Stop and so it should work. Thank you. Yeah, All right. thank you. So now. Uh, okay, so I think we. Stummschall. We start. Yeah, you stop sharing. I think it's okay. Uh, so welcome to the second part of uh, our uh, of our session. We'll hear mostly. I, my name is Sharka Todorova. I will chair you through this part, uh, which is devoted mostly to exclusive and diffractive processes. And our first speaker is Po Julin from the Compass, who will be talking about deeply virtual quantum scattering and exclusive meson production. All right, uh, so this is Peru. Thank you. Uh, I will try to share my slide. Hopefully you can see it already. Yeah. OK, uh, so uh, it's my pleasure to present you the DVCS and exclusive meson production measurement at the Compass uh, experiment on behalf of the Compass collaboration. Uh, so, right. So uh, firstly, the Compass experiment will be uh, briefly introduced, followed by the discussion on the deeply virtual Compton scattering, DVCS, and hard exclusive Mason production, HMP. And finally, a summary and outlook will be given. Oh, sorry. Uh, so Compass is a uh, fixed target experiment located at CERN, uh, utilizing the M2 beam line at SPS. So Compass has the uh, luxury of receiving a variety of hadron and lepton beams. For the highly exclusive measurements, uh, the polarized muon beams of 160 GeV were used. So in the picture uh, in, uh, given uh, in the middle, uh, the incoming muon beam, uh, which uh, has uh, opposite polarization uh, with a different charge, would impinge on the LH target. And then the thus generated particle would penetrate through the two-stage uh, large angle uh, spectrometer of compass, which consists of two dipole magnets, SM1 and SM2, uh, three stages of electromagnetic calorimeters, EKL01 uh, and 2, um, and uh, different stages of uh, tracking and triggering stations. So a key ingredient uh, for the exclusive measurement is the recoiling proton detector, which is called camera, that, is, uh, consist, uh, that consists of two rings of uh, scintillators uh, with uh, LH2 target in the center and try to deter, uh, detect the proton in terms of the TAOF uh, technique. So after a uh, successful pilot run uh, of four weeks taken in 2012, there were de uh, dedicated runs taken in 2016 and 17, and about 10 times more statistics were accumulated. So uh, here I present you uh, the kinematic coverage of different experiments uh, in terms of Q-square versus x -Burgen. So in the low S, uh, so with the low x covered by the H1 and Zeus data, and with the uh, relative higher x covered by the Hermes and JLab data, you can see that the compass kinematic coverage, which is given in the shaded green, Okay, uh, a little bit overlap with the Hermes, but it has its unique place in the C quark domain uh, before the EIC era. So, um, DVCS, 
the plot on the left uh, shows you the so-called handbag diagram, which give you, uh, which is uh, represent the leading order and leading twist of DVCS process. So uh, in the diagram, you can see that the virtual photon is emitted by the incoming lepton, which is then absorbed by a parton coming from the proton carrying a longitudinal momentum fraction of x plus psi. Then this parton emits a high energy photon in the forward direction, then recombines with the rest, uh, keeping the proton intact while leaving a small form of momentum transfer T uh, to the proton. So DVCS has been regarded as the key uh, cha uh, golden channel uh, uh, for the probing of uh, GPDs, which encapsulate the transverse uh, position information with the uh, longitudinal momentum distribution. And uh, it interferes with the very well-known uh, beta hydro process where the real photon is actually emitted by the leptons so that it provides a handle cr to crank out more information from the process. So experimentally, the uh, measurable that we have is the energy of the lepton, the virtuality of the virtual photon, Q squared, and x can that can be related to the psi, so-called skewness, and the former momentum transfer T, and the phi, which is the angle between the lepton plan and the virtual photon plan. Uh, the photon plan. So with these measurable, we try to access the information of the GPDs that depends on these variables, x, psi, t, and q squared. And uh, at the small uh, experience coverage of campus, we focus on the measurement of uh, GPD edge. But with that being said, uh, what actually is measured in the experiment uh, is the so-called Compton form factor, CFF edge, just due to the fact that X is not a direct measurable in the uh, in the experiment. So CFF edge is a uh, GPD edge integrated over X, and the uh, real part and imaginary part of then is intercorrelated with the presence of the D term. So um, being interesting and important in its own right, uh, the investigation or the study of uh, 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 CFF edge is interesting because uh, it can be correlated to some uh, interesting properties of the uh, nucleon. So the imaginary part of the CFF edge can bring information on the transfer size or extension of the parton in the in the nucleon. And it would be interesting as well to see how it evolves as a function of X, uh, while the D term can provide insight into the pressure, dis uh, pressure distribution uh, in the nucleon. So uh, by doing this so-called bin charge spin sum, which sums up the cross-section uh, that we get from the mu plus and mu minus, we get contributions from the beta Heitler, DVCS, and also the interference between them. To extract out the DVCS contribution from the rest uh, of the other terms, we, for, uh, we try to examine the experience dependence uh, uh, of each of them. So uh, uh, the three plots on the top shows you the phi distribution of the event with increasing experience from left to right. So in the left plot, you can see the data, compass data uh, represented at the, the solid circles is well described by the uh, beta height of Monte Carlo, which is given in the black histogram, which shows a uh, beta height of dominance is in, the, in this uh, small expiration uh, regime. Uh, while going uh, up, uh, going for a higher expiration, can, we can see the data now uh, just cannot be fully described by the uh, beta height together with the pi zero background. So then we can, uh, at this high x uh, uh regime, we can then take out the beta height contribution, remove them, and with the uh, symmetry in five of the compass acceptance, those uh, uh, five dependence terms can be integrated out. So we are left with the C0 DVCS term, which is uh, can be linked to the imaginary part of CFF edge. Okay, then that brings uh, our uh, the, bring us the information of the transverse uh, extension of the parton. So the uh, cross-section as a function of uh, T, uh, which is given uh, in the plot on the left, is fitted with the exponential dependence, where the so-called uh, exponential slope parameter B uh, extracted is 4.3, and that can be translated into the transverse size, uh, or represented as R per here of the parton, and that is about 0.5 a femtometer. So the plot on the right shows you uh, the compass result, given as the solid red uh, circle together with the other data coming from Hera. And in the plot, you also see the model prediction coming from uh, KM15 and also GK uh, parameterized, uh, parameterized with the Q square from at the minimum and maximum of the data covered uh, in this plot. 
So uh, with the uh, 2016 and uh, 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 17 data, uh, with 10 times more statistics, hopefully we campus can provide uh, three more beams uh, in the data. Uh, I mean, in the campus uh, coverage here so that we can have a better uh, uh, view of, or say insight into transverse size evolution as a function of hexagon. Uh, so a quick glance on the progress on the 2016 and 17 data. Uh, so uh, we have a comparable result of uh, these uh, plots showing you the data and beta hydro Monte Carlo uh, comparison using only 13% of the, uh, 2016 and 2017 data. So we are progressing on this and uh, we give a big thanks to the Blue Waters com uh, computing facility, which uh, helped a lot in generating these results. So um, very, um, so the universality of the GPTs also grants us the ability to probe them with the Mason production, uh, which is uh, like illustrated in the plot on the left. So in addition to the four chiral even GPTs that can also be probed by the DPCS interaction, the Mason production uh, also grants us access to these four chiral odd or sometimes called uh, transversity transverse uh, GPTs with the subscript of T uh, in each of them. And often we see this uh, ET bar term that is represented as a combination of the HT tilde and ET. So uh, since uh, different masons with uh, carry different uh, uh, quark and uh, content, also quantum number, it can uh, act uh, naturally as the quantum flavor filter. So with the ability to probe the chiral uh, GPDs, uh, the mason product is complicated, uh, complicated by the involvement of the non perturbative turn uh, from the mason wave function. So in, the, in addition to the study of nuclear structure, the mason production also provides us insight into the reaction mechanism. Uh, so firstly, about the pi zero production uh, using the 2012 data in Compass, the differential cross section can be uh, for the pi, on, uh, pi zero production can be decomposed into these terms, uh, representing uh, sigma t, uh, sigma l, which represent a different polarization of the virtual photon, and the sigma t t, sigma l t uh, is the interference terms. So sigma t, uh, l term has been uh, like a as the leading twist was expected to be the dominant term, but it was found out that it's only uh, is just a few percent of the sigma t term. And for the interference term, one term that is uh, of special interest is the sigma t t term, since it uh, simply depends on the uh, et bar uh, of the uh, of the GPT. So the uh, extraction of the uh, different terms of cross section can be checked uh, through its uh, different dependency on the phi. And the extracted result is shown uh, in the plot on the left. So for the compass result, we see a, a large contribution or say a significance of the sigma TT, which indicates a, uh, a, a, a good impact coming from the ET bar. And uh, we measure the sigma LT term is smaller, but it's uh, positive uh, significantly. So the plot on the right shows you the the dependence on T of the cross section together uh, with the predictions given by GK. So the compass result is shown as the solid circle while the GK prediction is given in two curves, one with uh, the compass data, which is the lower curve and the one without uh, the compass data, uh, which is the upper curve. So that you can see with the inclusion of the compass result, uh, the, G, uh, the model prediction of GK actually gets scaled down by a factor of two, which shows the importance of the compass data in uh, putting the constraint of the GPT modeling in the kinematic coverage of compass. Okay, um, then uh, the, for the uh, study of exclusive pi zero, uh, omega production, sorry, um, by studying the uh, angular distribution of the omega production, we can extract out 23 uh, spin density matrix elements with uh, SDMEs, and uh, they can be categorized into five different categories depending on the helicity transition from the gamma star to omega. So under the scheme of the S-channel helicity conservation, it implies that um, uh, some terms of then uh, in the sector A and B that they should sum up to zero, which is checked uh, within, uh, within error. And, but also SCHC, um, this uh, uh, helicity conservation also uh, says that all elements in this uh, sector C to D, E uh, should all be zero and which is clearly violated in this section C. And one term that is R500 um, that is um, definitely violating the SHC, HS, SCHC uh, in, in the study of uh, Gloss-Kokov and Kroll, they 
correlated uh, this fact to the presence of the ET bar and HT. And this complements uh, the previous study done by Compass as well in the zero uh, row and omega production with the transverse uh, polarized target. So uh, we were trying to submit this, uh, this result to archive very soon, hopefully in the uh, next few weeks. So a quick summary, uh, I've talked about the uh, study of GPDs, which involves the uh, study of the imagine, uh, imaginary part of the CFF edge that can provide us uh, the information on the transverse extension of partons. And uh, with the inclusion of 2016 and 17 data, we can do this uh, bin charge spin difference, then we will try to extract out the real part of the CFF edge, and together we can get the D-term uh, for the pressure to, uh, distribution. So uh, in the uh, S2, the edge GMP, uh, in addition to the pi and uh, omega production that was uh, discussed, we have uh, studies going on uh, with uh, rho, phi, or j side production as well. So uh, it's a pity that the, uh, due to the time limit, I cannot go through all the uh, details of them, but hopefully the point is made that uh, with the, uh, the data provided by Compass, it's going to give us a fruitful insight into our understandings of the transverse, GD, uh, transverse GPDs and also hopefully uh, will help on the flavor of the composition. So we have ongoing analysis on the 2016 and 17 data at this moment and we're pushing forward to the release of new results. Uh, that would be all. Thank you for your attention. Thank you uh, for this nice talk and uh, important uh, measurements. Uh, we have time for just one quick question. Anton? Anton Schurek. Hello, hello. Uh, really very good talk uh, and interesting results. Uh, I'm interested in this quick, uh, very quick uh, dependence on TD of the T distribution, which is going down, whereas exactly on this figure, whereas even if Goloskokov um, crawl model is adjusted, it has now this minimum uh, close to 0 0.6. Uh, so the question is that maybe this is multiple scattering effects, uh, which creates, uh, actually we don't know what is this minimum, but I think uh, uh, such effects, uh, some sign, signs of such effects are observed in other reactions. So, um, okay. So I don't know if the formalism is sufficient to describe your data. This is my uh, comment. Right, 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 exactly. We noticed uh, this discrepancy at the high T prime uh, uh, I mean, behavior as well. Um, so um, I believe that uh, Peter Kroll is uh, trying to tune something on that, uh, but uh, since we're not sure, uh, and definitely there is something uh, that need to be uh, uh, compensated into the match of the data with the model in this high T behavior, for sure. Okay, uh, I think we have to move on. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh, Anton, please stay unmuted. It's your turn now. So next speaker is Anton Shurek uh, talking about inclusive production of F2 tensor mesons at the LHC. Okay. Okay. With a sharing, landing here. Sorry, I have problem. Yeah, we see your slides. Okay. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. So I sm start more or less on time. Uh, so I will be talking about uh, inclusive production of tensor meson at the, the LHC and the mechanism uh, uh, I'm going to consider is gluon gluon fusion. And this will be done in the KT factorization approach. This is work done Together with uh, together with Piotr Lebedovich, uh, it was put on archive uh, last week. Uh, actually, we want to put even corrections to this paper already. Uh, so, uh, so I will present short introduction here. Uh, I I will mention about uh, quarkonium production, uh, pseudo scalar and scalar quarkonium production, where the uh, gluon gluon mechanism is the, seems to be the dominant mechanism. Uh, also, uh, last month since we studied production F0, 980, uh, inclusive production where gluon-gluon mechanism is important, but uh, certainly not the dominant mechanism of the F0 production. And here uh, I will discuss uh, production of F2. So we will start from gamma-gamma going to F2 
and then we go to gluon gluon to f2 this will be done kt factorization i will use different unintegrated gluon distribution and i will mention about some pi pi final state rescattering effects which must be present also uh, so introduction uh, the string model is usually considered as a mechanism of production of hadrons however as far as f2 is considered uh, there is very little produced via string models in f2 and Pythia cannot reproduce the data i will show uh, i will show uh, in the moment so uh, there's a question how f2 is produced uh, uh, so gluon gluon fusion uh, was considered for eta c and chi c in our paper which i will show in the moment uh, and um, the question of some iso vector uh, like meson production is really i would say terra incognita uh, and uh, we just started to look at this and gluon gluon fusion is one of potential mechanism which can be important and you will see uh, where we are uh, in the moment. So these are our recent papers. So first one is on our ETA C production. Second, uh, uh, Isabella Babias was talking about this. Second one is about Chi C zero production, not discussed at this conference. This is about F zero. And now I'm talking about this new archive. So the mechanism I'm talking about is gluon gluon fusion going to F2 uh, tensor meson. And this is inclusive measurement. So I don't care about what else is produced. Uh, so first of all, uh, I should start from the vertex. And before I go to gluons, uh, I go to um, photons. And actually, photon, uh, photon coupling to F2 was studied by uh, our friends, uh, Otto Nachtman and collaborators. And actually, they uh, have written the vertex, corresponding vertex by two tensorial structure, one corresponding to helicity zero, second corresponding to helicity two, and this tensorial structure were given in their uh, analysis. Uh, of course, there is a question that we don't know coupling constants. It is very difficult. It's non-perturbative. Uh, these are non-perturbative effects. So to extract coupling constants, we need some data. And actually, uh, uh, our friends um, obtain this coupling constants by uh, adjusting to uh, radiative decay width of F2 to gamma gamma. Uh, there is some, uh, some freedom in setting uh, how much is zero helicity and how much is two helicity. Uh, the general conclusion is helicity two dominates and uh, helicity zero is nine percent, uh, but perhaps even less because there are some other effects which I, I am not going to talk about this. So the, the decay wave can be expressed uh, in terms of these couplings uh, of our friends in this way. And these couplings are uh, shown here. Uh, I omit here uh, signs only uh, absolute, I am showing absolute values. Uh, there is another uh, approach, Pascalutza, Pauk, Van der Hagen, and this also uh, started even earlier by Poppe, uh, which consider general structure of photon photon to tensor mesons. And uh, they have shown that in general, there are more couplings. Uh, when uh, we go off shell, there are more couplings and there can be five uh, different couplings. And here I am showing their result of the coupling for virtual particles. And you see this five uh, in colors, you, you see form factors uh, related to those couplings. Of course, those form, uh, form factors are not known. Uh, in Otto Nachtman and collaborators approach, they are only this T2 and T0 T uh, form factors and no others. However, anyway, we don't know much about this blue form factors, which I will mention. Uh, here there are some technical things, which I think I can skip to accelerate a little bit. Uh, uh, we have checked that these two approaches, EMN and PPV, uh, are equivalent on mass shell uh, if we do the following correspondence between them. If we do this, they are fully uh, equivalent uh, on mass shell. However, as you will see, of mass shell, they are different if we use the same form factors. Uh, of course, this is complicated story. Uh, what are form factors for uh, 
uh, photon photon going to F2, but also for gluon gluon going to F2. And uh, in our paper, such form factors, we try different forms of the form factors, some motivated by PQCD, some motivated by uh, some other approaches, some vector dominance. Uh, uh, actually, I should mention, maybe this is not nicely presented here, but before us, there was a calculation on F2, inclusive F2 production by Yeon and collaborators some maybe 15 years ago, I don't have date here. Uh, so they also consider such approach with a little bit older uh, gluon distributions and special coupling. Uh, so I will be talking about KT factorization approach. Uh, so the cross section, inclusive cross section, which depends on rapidity and transverse momentum depends on gluon and integrated distribution, gluons and offshell matrix element. And we calculated offshell matrix element and gluon distribution we take from the literature, we take gluons which are, which describe many other data uh, I will mention, but uh, just to mention it shortly now, Kimber Martin Riskin, which described nicely, for instance, charm production or uh, uh, Jung uh, Houtman distributions, which, uh, which are fixed to deep inelastic data. So this is CCFM approach. Uh, there's no time to talk about uh, about uh, gluon distribution. This is technical slide how to calculate matrix elements uh, for KT factorization from usual uh, vertices. This is written here in the KT factorization, but I'm not going to discuss. And here I am going to the result of Yeon et al. from 15 years ago. He has written general structure, but he assumed that um, photons coupled to F2 via energy momentum tensor. And this is his result. Uh, this is uh, a little bit long formula and I'm not going to discuss this. But first question, how this formula compares to the vertices, which I mentioned this uh, Heidelberg uh, group and Mainz group. Uh, in order for, to go uh, from uh, photons to gluons, I had to replace electromagnetic couplings by strong coupling constants and also uh, include color factors and also include fact uh, that when photons couple, you have to include charges of quarks and you have to take average um, squared charge of quarks, which is this amount for, the, for this for as, when assuming such flavor structure. Uh, we are taking running coupling constants uh, and in, in the infrared we use so-called shirkov solotsev prescription how to extrapolate down to small renormalization scales. Uh, I want to mention that in this old calculation, the strong coupling constants were completely uh, ignored. I mean, I mean, they are running and everything was put to one normalization factor. Uh, we will consider also another mechanism because uh, in high energy collision, proton, proton, there are many pions produced and uh, F2 could be produced as an effect of final state interaction of pions. Uh, so uh, this can be, these pions can create F2 in the final state. Uh, and here we also uh, made some little uh, model in order to see what can happen. Uh, we know that at, uh, we will be talking about seven uh, TD energy and ALICE data. We take uh, data for pions and we parameterize this uh, parameterize this, this this distribution which are written here in this formula 24 uh, by um, uh, some phenomenological form levy parameterization this has no importance for us uh, and uh, now we are considering model which is uh, quite similar to color evaporation model used for jsi so uh, to calculate number of f2s from, uh, from those pions, we do such a convolution. And here there is some magic parameter, uh, probability to form uh, F2 by uh, pi pi fusion. And this is probability of formation and survival and includes everything. So this is, this is why I'm saying it's magic <laughs> number. And uh, we are doing this convolution using this data for pions and using Tsalis parameterization of those data. Uh, recently, there was some work uh, by Utheim and Siostran, which consider this more uh, sophisticated way. However, I didn't see comparison to experimental data. Uh, uh, experimental data show 
dn over dpt. So we have to transform cross section uh, by using inelastic cross section and we use a recent measurement of totem and atlas uh, average value of this uh, in order to get uh, these numbers. And now I'm coming to experimental data and this is a uh, first result. This is experimental data which was presented in Lee thesis some years ago. So I call it preliminary Alice data and our calculation. So you see on the left panel, we are using uh, Heidelberg vertex with different form factors. Uh, uh, and on the other uh, plot, uh, mind uh, form factor with different form factors. So you see everything depends on form factors and some form factors are excluded. Uh, some form factors are almost fitted the data at larger PT. Uh, in principle, they could be adjusted to the data uh, uh, we didn't do such fit because uh, this is first study, so we want to understand the situation. So these form factors are crucial, and uh, depending how you parameterize them, you can get different results. Of course, you cannot exceed the data, so this is a condition. Uh, in this calculation, we are using Jung Hautmann, an integrated gluon distribution, which worked also very nicely for uh, eta C. Uh, production. Here I am showing two contributions, helicity 2 and helicity 0 uh, for, uh, uh, for Heidelberg vertex and for Mainz vertex. Uh, and uh, you see uh, they are different off shell. This is PT of the meson, which depends on virtuality of gluons. So result is different from these different uh, vertices when uh, and uh, the compo uh, com uh, composition into helicities is also uh, different. Uh, here I am uh, showing, maybe I will skip the left, uh, the left uh, um, panel where I compare uh, Mainz and uh, Heidelberg vertices, and I go to the right panel when I'm showing Gaussian distribution, which are often used for unintegrated gluon distributions. So here you show that uh, I'm showing results for different sigma zeros, a smearing parameter. So there is no sigma zero which can describe this data with Gaussian distribution. So this is such a simple check. Now I'm going to two-dimensional distribution, transverse momentum of one photon versus transverse momentum of the second photon for Jung Hautmann, an integrated gluon distribution, and on the left-hand side with uh, Heidelberg vertex and uh, Mainz vertex on the right hand side. Uh, these two uh, look very different uh, in this broad range. So it means uh, these vertices are not completely equivalent. However, let's concentrate on this uh, corner close to zero, zero. Uh, and uh, we checked that in this regime, uh, these two uh, comes to unity uh, when uh, transverse momenta go to zero uh, and both transverse momenta go to zero, zero. Anthony, you are running out of time, so... Okay, okay thank you. Um, we, so, so shortly, I, I, I am almost uh, uh, finishing. Uh, we also try to analyze these other terms, uh, which are in Mainz vertices with helicity one and, uh, uh, and some others. Uh, but, uh, of course, we don't know, we have no uh, clue how to find them, uh, but if we assume uh, similar form factors uh, uh, for, for them, uh, they could be important at large virtuality, so it means at large PT of the mesons. Uh, we have also tried, uh, uh, this is last transparency, we have also tried uh, to look to what is contribution of exclusive processes, which we studied with Otto Nachtman, and its contribution, this dotted line here, red, is very small, so cannot explain. The blue line is pi pi vertex, and this black line is blue on blue on fusion. So you see these two contribution uh, compete, blue on blue on fusion and pi pi rest scattering, most probably. So, uh, uh, so I am skipping to conclusions, but I will not repeat uh, my conclusions for this short talk. Thank you, sorry for uh, for being uh, too slow. Yeah, unfortunately we don't have <laughs> much time. Thank you very much for these Thank calculations, you. for the comparison with the data. Uh, unless there is a very, very urgent question right now, which I do not see. We thank you again. We are looking forward for uh, the rest of the story. I think uh, there is still work to be done. Thank you very much. Thank you. And uh,
we will move to our, our next speaker is uh, Rafał Stashev, Stashevski, who will be talking about the measurement of soft QCD and diffractive processes in Atlas. Hello, can you see my slides? Yeah. Very good. So thank you very much for the introduction. Uh, in my presentation today, I will cover two uh, recent uh, measurements from Atlas in the topics of uh, diffractive physics and minimum bias interactions. Uh, I will first discuss with the, the measurement of single diffraction. So uh, here on page three, I would like to briefly uh, remind the kinematics of the process that we are interested in. So this is single diffractive dissociation uh, and a colorless exchange uh, between the two protons with one proton uh, dissociating into a system with some higher, higher mass than the mass of the proton. Uh, the three relevant variables that I will discuss is T, which is squared for momentum uh, tr transferred from the, from the proton. It is related to the scattering angle and transverse uh, momentum of this, of this outgoing uh, forward proton. Another variable is Xi. It is related to the energy that was lost uh, by this proton and transfers, transferred into this higher mass state X. And uh, you can see the definition here. And the final variable is the rapidity or pseudo rapidity gap uh, between the, uh, the first particle of the X system and the uh, uh, edge of our, uh, our detector uh, that we use for, for measuring this, uh, this pseudo rapidity gap. Uh, first, let me remind you some, some history also. Uh, we were interested in ATLAS in this process already for uh, quite some time. Here you can see an example from, from an analysis from 2012 already, where we looked for large rapidity gaps uh, using our uh, calorimeter detectors. Um, and uh, by requiring large gap sizes, we were able to reduce the non-diffractive uh, co contribution. Uh, however, it was not possible to distinguish single diffractive uh, from double uh, dif diffractive dissociation processes. Uh, because when you just use calorimeter, you can still have uh, double diffractive uh, dissociation where, where one of the dif dif dissociation mass is small so that you don't really see the second dissociation and you cannot distinguish that this from a process where, where only one, uh, one proton is dis dissociating. Uh, in order to do that, one has to use a direct detection of this forward proton, which we call forward proton tagging. And for that, we use a dedicated system of, of detectors, which we call uh, alpha. These are detectors using the Roman pot technology, where the detectors are operating uh, inside uh, the actual beam pipes of the LHC accelerator uh, at the distance of uh, only a few millimeters from the, uh, from the beam. Uh, this is possible using a special dedicated optics of the, uh, of the LHC and requires special, uh, special setup, uh, so it's not uh, it's not a very straightforward data taking, but it is, it is possible. Uh, the data that I will be discussing uses exactly, uh, yeah, was, was based on exactly such run. Uh, this is coming from 8TV running, uh, beta star, uh, which defines them, the, uh, this optics was 90 meters. Uh, and also this, uh, this made pile up uh, very, very uh, small, but also this means that the luminosity was, was quite small. We measured this intact proton using alpha. The dissociated proton was measured using ATLAS tracking detector. Uh, for the trigger, uh, we used alpha in coincidence with a dedicated triggering detectors, which we called MBTS from minimum bias trigger scintillators. These are uh, scintillating detectors that are installed in the uh, far, in the forward rapidity region in, in ATLAS and can be used for, for triggering. Uh, the acceptance and the fiducial re region for the measurement is defined here. So it is, uh, it is coming from the limitations of our detector. This is the, uh, the, uh, the limitations on the, pro on the measurements of charged particles. Uh, here is uh, the MBTS range and the range, kinematic range of the, uh, regarding the proton is coming from, uh, also from, uh, from alpha. Uh, detector. Uh, on slide number six, uh, I would like to briefly uh, discuss the event selection and the detector properties. So uh, 
we required that there is exactly one reconstructed proton in two stations that are on the same uh, in the same armlet. Uh, and in addition, we required an elliptical cut in the plane uh, where on one axis is the position of the pro of the trajectory and on the other axis is the angle of the uh, of this trajectory. So you can see here that for the si simulation signal process, we expect this to be uh, to be this kind of elliptical shape. But when you look at what we see in data, this shape is very different with many, many events uh, far away. Uh, please take a look that the, the, the range of the axis here is different on these two, uh, on these two plots. So uh, we remove much of background coming, for example, from, from halo, uh, beam halo events, we remove by, uh, by that way. And also we have uh, some imperfections of our detector apparatus, which leads to, to smearing of the observables that we measure. Uh, here you see uh, the, uh, the matrix is describing this, this smearing, and this was all, all taken into account and corrected by unfolding procedures so that the measurement can be interpreted without the understanding of the detector. Uh, the main background that we have, uh, the first one is coming from coincidence between a proton in alpha and uh, unrelated activity in the central atlas, which is ma mainly coming from non-diffractive uh, minimum bias and interactions. This is the largest background and we estimate it using data-driven techniques and control it in a, a dedicated control region. And you can see here that the description of this background is quite nice. Uh, the dominant physics background is coming from central diffractive events. Uh, so we estimate it using Monte Carlo simulations and al also control it in a, another uh, control region. And the description is also, also nice. Uh, the measurements that we get uh, concern the uh, Pomeron intercept, which you see here, uh, we obtain value of 1.07, which we get from a fit to log Xi uh, distribution using a Rege theory inspired formula. We also measure the T distribution and fit uh, the, uh, the exponential slope of this distribution and we get value of 7.6 uh, inverse GeV squared. Uh, both these uh, values are in uh, uh, rough agreement with what is being used in, in uh, different tunes of, of Pythia, which, which we were using for estimating detector effects. Uh, we also measured uh, the rapidity gap distribution and the integrated uh, cross section. Uh, so you can see that the rapidity gap uh, that uh, that we get is the, sh the shape is nicely described by different Monte Carlo generators, but the the overall uh, normalization largely disagrees. And you can see it also in the table where you can see compared uh, fiducial cross section and the cross section extrapolated to the full T range and you see big disagreements. So there is clearly some improvement needed uh, in, our, in our understanding of the uh, normalization of these cross sections. Uh, the second measurement that I want to discuss is about uh, uh, distributions that are sensitive to underlying event. Uh, and these distributions uh, we measured in events containing Z boson. Uh, so uh, the, the motivation is presented here on slide 12. It is coming from the fact that hadrons are complicated, uh, complicated particles with uh, a very complicated internal structure, and so when we when we collide two of these, uh, the event is also quite uh, has a quite complex uh, complex structure in involving uh, different effects, uh, also non perturbative ones. Uh, there is also no non really no really a clear separation between hard and uh, soft. Uh, processes here. So uh, this all is understood presently in terms of phenomenological models implemented in MC generators. And these models need tuning to really describe the data. So, so the goal of this study is to provide some data that can be used for tuning. So we measured, uh, uh, so we, uh, for each event, we defined a transverse plane with respect to the direction of the Z boson, where Z was decaying into, into gamma gamma. Uh, we, disc we divide it into toward region, away region, uh, and transverse regions. In addition, these transverse regions were, one of them was called transmin, one of the other one transmax, based on the sum of PT that, uh, that was produced in, this, uh, in these regions. And there were four observables that we, that we measured, the number of charged particles in each region, PT of charged particles, sum of PT, 
and mean PT. Uh, the measurements was done in, as I said, in different regions, also in different beams of transverse momentum of the Z boson and in different beams of uh, transverse thrust when transverse thrust uh, defines the overall shape of the event and is, is defined here. So on slide 14, you can see examples of different distributions, uh, transverse momentum, number of particles, sum of PT and mean PT. Uh, if you look at these plots, you can see that none of them is described by none of the uh, Monte Carlo generators that, that we looked at. So this clearly shows that, uh, that there is a need for, for better tuning and better understanding of these processes in, in our present generators. Uh, these plots here show you what is the difference between the two transverse regions that, that we distinguish, the transmax and transmin, and you see that actually uh, the difference is quite large, and this difference is coming from the fact that uh, when we produce a Z boson with a large transverse momentum, uh, there is always a recoil jet, and this recoil jet can also uh, be partly present in, in the transverse region, and of course, uh, uh, yeah, when we when we distinguish two transverse regions, the, the one with less uh, activity is less sub suspective to uh, to this to these effects. And the plot here on the right uh, shows you uh, the different the de dependence on um, on the transverse thrust with uh, activity uh, higher activity in low thrust uh, events. Uh, please also take a look that. Uh, that we made all these measurements as a function of transverse momentum of uh, PT of the Z, and we see this characteristic flattening of, uh, of activity as a function of PT. Uh, the last plot that I want to show uh, today, uh, they show you, they, they present differential distributions of all these observables in different beams of different variables. So here in the top row, uh, you can see uh, you can see low PT of Z and distributions of PT of charged particles. Here is the bottom, the bottom row, uh, high PT of events of the Z boson and left, left uh, column is low thrust event, uh, uh, right column is high thrust uh, event. Uh, so this, is all, this all can be used for tuning. And my last summary slide, I want to mention only that uh, if you are interested in forward proton tagging, there are also three uh, very interesting uh, additional talks from ATLAS regarding a different detector, which is called ATLAS forward proton, uh, which can be used for measuring gamma gamma processes. And we have two technical talks. And later today, we also have a physics talk where we show uh, how this can be used for photon fusion uh, measurement processes uh, in ATLAS. So that's all from me. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rafael. Thank you for this nice talk. Uh, do you have a question? I don't see any. Maybe I have a question concerning this uh, large discrepancy in the normalization for diffractive processes. Are there some understanding where this may come from? Uh, I, I, I am I am personally not aware of uh, of, uh, of of a good. Uh, reason for this uh, for this uh, discrepancy it is possible that maybe the the models that are implemented in Pithyat to which we use as, as comparison uh, are not the most sophisticated ones on the market so i think this is uh, this is now a role for theorists to try to compare to more sophisticated models and see if if they get an agreement or not okay thank you i hope theorists are listening to us <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you very Rafael. much. Rafael. And we will move on. Uh, our next speaker is Rafael Sikora from STAR, who will be talking about central exclusive production of charged particle pairs in proton proton collisions. Yeah, we see your slides. Please go ahead. OK, can you hear me? Yeah. OK, yeah. thank you. Uh, Hello, everyone. I would like to give a talk on behalf of the STAR collaboration on the measurement of the central exclusive production of charged particle pairs in PP collisions at 200 GV with the STAR detector at RIC. All materials that I am going to present has been recently published in the Journal of High Energy, High Energy Physics. A brief introduction to the process. So we talk about the central exclusive production if the two uh, beam particles uh, remain intact after the collision or eventually get excited, uh, you can see it marked with red, while the fraction of their inner energy 
is transformed into the central state, which is here marked green with X. And this central state is separated with the outgoing beam particles or the remnants with the so-called rapidity or pseudo-rapidity gaps. In general, the, the, the process can proceed threefold through double photon exchange, through double pomer through uh, photo production, or through double pomeron exchange, with the last being the dominant at the rig energies. Uh, what makes this measurement uh, made by star particularly important and interesting is the fact that all particles have been measured, so all so the forward scattered protons in the Roman pot detectors. Uh, the process is topologically simple because here I'm talking about the production of uh, H plus A minus pair, but it's complex and hard to be theoretically described. Uh, at lowest QCD order, the pomeron has a representation of a pair of gluons, which makes it the double pomeron exchange suitable for the global production. Uh, here, where, where the low masses are produced, there is no hard scale and PQCD cannot be applied. Uh, in addition to this, there are absorption effects which suppress the cross section. So there are some additional soft rescatterings which may produce additional particles which fill the gaps. Uh, not, not only this, but for the two pair product, hadron pair production, we can have either continuum production or production of a resonance that decays to the uh, pair of hadrons. And the two uh, amplitudes can interfere, leading to uh, some structures in the cross sections. Uh, at the time of preparing the paper, uh, there were two phenomenological models of the continuum uh, implemented in the generators. These are DIME and GenX. Also, Pythia uh, has uh, the minimum bias Rockefeller model, which was tuned to CDF data. Uh, so uh, we decided to compare our data with these uh, three uh, predictors, predictions from the Monte Carlo generators, DIME, GenX, and Pythia. Uh, I will only remind you, these are only continuum models and they do not contain resonances that also show up in the spectra. Uh, the star data that was used in this measurement uh, was uh, collected during several big periods in the regular runs with the average pileup between 0.2 to 0.9. In the offline selection, we require two opposite charge, charge tracks in the time production chamber of the transverse momentum greater than 0.2 GeV and pseudo rapidity less than 0.7 on absolute value. And we require two uh, forward going uh, protons in the Roman pots, on one on each side of the star central detector. In the fiducial region, which is marked in the top right plot with the black envelopes, uh, in the bottom plot, you can see the T's of those protons within the fiducial region. And you clearly see that the distribution starts at 0.04 GeV squared, which means that we basically cut off the photo production uh, uh, contributions. Because we measure all four particles involved in, in the process, uh, we can define the transverse uh, missing momentum which we require to be consistent with zero within the two and a half resolutions, which correspond to 75 MeV. And we have additional cuts, which are intended to uh, increase purity of our sample and stay to, to leave us in the region of high identification efficiency, because we can, uh, we measure not only pi plus, pi minus, but also we identified K plus, K minus pairs and PP bar pairs. Uh, so here are plots demonstrating our particle identification capabilities. In the top uh, row, we show the chi-square DDX, which is a measure of uh, compatibility uh, with a, a given hypothesis. It was calculated based on the uh, DDX measured for each of two uh, centrally produced tracks. As not only this, we, we have used the time of flight measurement uh, to, to reconstruct the squared mass of a particle. And the squared mass of particles are shown in the bottom plots you can generally see that the Monte Carlo predictions for all these three species uh, nicely describe our data, which demonstrate uh, high uh, purity. And uh, we have uh, numerically, it is less than 1% of misidentifications for pi plus and PP bars and less than 3% 3 3 for K plus K minus. So we really have a good uh, particle identification. Uh, regarding the non-exclusive background, uh, we can generally that define uh, three ingredients to this non-exclusive background. 
the two main uh, come from the central diffraction process. So the process were with the same topology, except that in addition to the uh, oppositely charged pair, we have some other particles, either charged or neutral. And the third uh, ingredient to the background is accidental overlap of the pileup events, mainly overlap of the elastic scattering. So this we see in the Roman pots and some minimum bias uh, 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 process in the central detector. Uh, on the left-hand side, you can see the figure demonstrating the transverse momentum, uh, missing momentum uh, for the pi plus pi minus channel. You can see a clear peak of the signal with the, with the red arrow marks the region which we cut. So uh, the right-hand side distribution shows the row counts for those events from the peak as a function of the invariant mass of the two pi and pair. With this missing transverse momentum, we can determine fully from the data the uh, amount of the background under the signal peak shown with magenta. And we can do this differentially as shown on the right-hand side plot. You can see the distribution of the background with the field magenta histogram. And we do this for all the observable for which we calculate the cross section. At the end, we have very pure samples of uh, pi plus, pi minus and k plus, k minus, less than 6% of background. And for PP bar, we also have small backgrounds less than 12, 12%. So the backgrounds are under control. Uh, let me move to the results. So here we show the differential fiducial cross section as a function of the invariant mass of the two pion pair. Uh, regarding the uh, systematic uncertainties, we show them only for a few selected beans. You can see it with the gray boxes. Uh, because they are f very strongly correlated between beans and they should be understood as allowed collective movement of the entire cross-section upwards or downwards. And uh, since I mentioned the uncertainties, I would like to stress that the uncertainty here is four times better co compared to the uh, measurement uh, of the double pomeron exchange with detection of forward protons that was uh, published before, before this paper uh, based on the ISR results. So now let me explain the structures which we can see here. The dip around 0.5 GeV is the acceptance effect. Then we have a peak at 1 GeV followed by, by a sharp drop, which we attribute to F0 980 meson, which interferes with the continuum. Between 1 and 1.5, we see a clear peak that we attribute to F2-1270 resonance. And at 2.2 GeV, we also see a clear resonance structure. Uh, among the continuum predictions that we show here with three colors, we, we generally attribute dimeson to the best described the continuum. And please take into account that Pitya here is square, scaled by factor 0.25 to uh, make the visual comparisons easier. So Pitya overestimates the cross section uh, quite significantly. Uh, no, we have measured not only pi plus, pi minus, but also on the left hand side, we show the invariant mass cross section uh, for k plus, k minus on the left and on the right for PP bar. Uh, on the left-hand side, we can see a, a peak in the F2 mass region, as well as a peak in the region of F2 prime, 1525, as well as some enhancement in the cross section in the region of, in the region of F0, 1710. Regarding the PP bar, uh, the statistics is, uh, is low. Nevertheless, we can say something about uh, the uh, Pythia because you can see that even though it's scaled, it's over the data. So Pythia over predicts the cross section for exclusive PP bar by a factor of eight. Uh, we uh, use the benefit of reconstructing forward scattered protons. Uh, so here we show the differential cross section as a function of the azimuthal separation of the forward going protons. It is correlated with the delta PT uh, uh, variable that was proposed by Close and Kirk uh, as, a, as a global filter. So generally at small DPT, which corresponds to small delta phi, uh, the globals should be enhanced. And what we observe is, is indeed an enhancement of the cross section at delta phi less than 90 degrees compared to delta phi greater than 90 degrees. But uh, we attribute it mainly to the absorption, which is presumably stronger at the delta phi greater than 990 degrees. 
uh, and uh, we, we can see that DIME, which is only generator that has the absorption included, uh, re re well uh, describes the shape of the data. And uh, a an side note that the lack of the cross section at Delta Phi at 90 degrees is due to the fiducial cuts, so the limited acceptance of the Roman pods. Uh, so now we have uh, looked into the uh, properties of the central system as a function of the variables that describe the forward system. Here we have the invariant mass uh, uh, cross sections for two delta phi regions. On the left, if the delta phi between forward scatter protons is less than 90 degrees, and on the right hand side, greater than 90 degrees. So the first difference that you can, uh, you can spot is the uh, zero cross section below 0.5 GeV on the right hand side, and it is because of the fiducial cuts. But then you can see that there is a, a clear difference in the, shape, in the mag magnitude of the structure at around 1 GeV. So it, this structure is more, more pronounced at delta phi less than 90 degrees compared to delta phi uh, greater than 90 degrees which suggests that F0980 is uh, produced more dominantly at uh, this uh, delta phi less than 90 degrees. The same seems to be true for this uh, potential resonance at 2.2 GeV. It's also more pronounced in the left-hand side region, but uh, it is in the, the, the situation is the opposite for the F2, which is more pronounced at delta phi greater than 90 degrees compared to delta phi less than 90 degrees. Uh, the next uh, variable that we have uh, looked into is the total squared for momentum transferred in the process. So a sum of Mandelstam T's of the two protons. Here we show it separately for the PP bar, uh, sorry, for pi plus pi minus on the left, K plus K minus in the middle and PP bar on the right hand side. Uh, here also we can see that DIME is uh, the best working uh, Monte Carlo generator. Uh, Pythia also works fine, except that for the PP bar, Pythia predicts bigger slope than what is observed with the data. Uh, not only this, we have uh, studied the angular distributions in case of exclusive pi plus pi minus production. So here I demonstrate uh, a uh, azimuthal angle of positively charged uh, pion in a Collins Soper reference frame uh, in three mass regions. The left-hand side is for masses below 1 GeV, which should be dominated by the continuum production. The middle Rafael, is for, yes? Rafael, you are running out of time. So. Okay, I will speed up. So okay. uh, we have three, three mass regions and we generally see that in the left-hand side, the, there's dominant spin zero production. In the middle, we have dominant uh, spin two production, which is consistent with F2 meson uh, that we see and the right-hand side cannot be described by, by a, just one wave, which suggests a mix of the two waves and maybe also higher waves. And we have at the end extrapolated the fiducial cross-section to the Lorentz invariant phase space given here with blue. Uh, and we have performed a fit of the minimal model uh, containing a continuum of and three resonances. Among this, those three resonances, we uh, only fixed a mass and width for F2. The, the, the remaining two resonances were left free, but we find the two additional resonances consistent with F0980 and F0500. And for the last one, uh, we see uh, that it is enhanced at delta phi less than 45 degrees. So it's kind of uh, correlated with this global filter. So we see enhanced production of this resonance in the region where the global should be enhanced. And we know from other measurements that this state is considered as potential state with some admixture of gluon content. And we also performed a fit of the exponential function to the, 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 to the different double differential cross section in T1 and T2. And we see a significant differences uh, of the slopes for different masses and different delta phi regions, which can be connected with different amount of resonances in this, these uh, regions of phase space that could help uh, theoretical physicists to constrain some uh, PP to meson couplings. And because I'm running out of time, uh, time I will probably skip my summary. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rafael, for this uh, very nice talk and uh, very clean, interesting measurements. Uh, 
One question, Anthony. Uh, also, thank you for this extremely nice results because this is for the first time exclusive process. So congratulations. It was always uh, having some admixture and now it is higher energies and exclusive, which is really uh, great. Uh, I want to say on the comment that uh, in principle, we calculate all these resonances with Piotr Lebedovich Otto Nachman in the tensor Pomeron model, the tensor Pomeron model. And in principle, uh, uh, we can think to make such an analysis because it is crucial, as Rafał said, it is crucial to have these resonances because they do interfere with continuum and uh, Monte Carlo has only continuum. End of my comment. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you again, Rafał. Very nice. And uh, our next speaker is Anna Cisek or Cisek, uh, talking about exclusive and semi exclusive production of vector mesons in proto proton collisions with electromagnetic dissociation of protons. We see your slides. Uh Okay, uh, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Anna Cisek uh, and today I will be talking about exclusive uh, production of vector meson in proton-proton collisions and semi-exclusive production with electromagnetic proton uh, dissociation. Hmm. Uh, this subject, uh, which I will be presenting today, was studied in collaboration with Wolfgang Schaeffer and uh, Antoni Szczurek. Hmm. For uh, exclusive production, first uh, we uh, calculate amplitude for photoproduction in photon-proton collisions. Uh, and uh, this uh, process in photon-proton collisions uh, was uh, studied at HERA. And uh, next, this amplitude was used to, to the predict the cross section in proton proton collisions, and uh, this process uh, was studied at LHC. Mm. Exclusive, uh, uh, we calculate uh, separately the photon pomeron and pomeron photon contributions and the cross section as a sum of uh, these uh, two components. Uh, for photon-proton collisions, the full amplitude include real and imaginary part. Uh, rho is a ratio of real to imaginary part of the amplitude, and B is a slope a parameter uh, depends uh, on energy. The imaginary part uh, of the amplitude includes two important ingredients. Uh, on integrated gluon distribution functions uh, and uh, the quark, uh, anti quark uh, wave function of produced uh, vector uh, mesons. <clears throat> In our calculation, we uh, use different uh, model of unintegrated gluon distribution function and uh, we uh, used two different types model of the wave function of the vector uh, meson. Mm, uh, uh, Gaussian uh, and Coulomb. And uh, Gauss wave function better describe uh, uh, data, experimental data uh, than uh, Coulomb. Uh, how we choose parameters of the, of the wave function of the vector meson. First, uh, we choose parameters and uh, we calculate the GV, leptonic decay constants. And um, when we have GV, we can get a decay electronic uh, wave. And uh, when uh, we choose the decay electronic wave in such way uh, that uh, is the same uh, like as uh, experimental uh, values. Mm. When we have uh, amplitude, uh, we can calculate uh, cross section. Uh, and here I present uh, total results for total cross section for phi meson in the left panel and for J psi meson uh, in the right panel. And uh, this total cross section as a function for uh, uh, energy, as a function of energy. And uh, how I said before, we calculate 
uh, different uh, model of unintegrated gluon distribution uh, functions. Uh, um, and uh, here I present a result uh, for Gauss wave function because I, how I said before, Gauss uh, uh, wave function better describe data than uh, Coulomb. Uh, our results uh, are compared with uh, HERA uh, experimental uh, data. And uh, now I'm going to the proton-proton collisions. Um, here I'm presenting the formula for the full amplitude. The uh, full amplitude includes the Born amplitude without absorption and the absorptive correction uh, to the amplitude. Uh, S is uh, um, in the elastic matrix of proton-proton in the initial state and TK is uh, proportional to the scattering amplitude of proton-proton. And uh, how I said before, in photon-proton uh, collisions, uh, amplitude for photon-proton collision was uh, used to uh, predict uh, the amplitude in proton-proton uh, collisions, and here we have amplitude for photon-proton. And when we have uh, amplitude, we can calculate uh, cross-section, and uh, here I present results for rapidity distribution for j psi meson in the left panel, and for upsilon meson in the uh, right panel. For upsilon meson, I have different uh, values of uh, slope parameters. Uh, the results are for energy 7 TV, Kutak's test on linear unintegrated gluon distribution and Gaussian wave uh, function. And uh, more results for exclusive uh, production uh, can be found in our previous paper for j -Sci and but also for Upsilon, or Rho, uh, or Phi meson. Mm. And now I'm going uh, to semi-exclusive production with uh, electromagnetic dissociation. Uh, to calculate electromagnetic dissociation, we used parametrization of the uh, proton structure function, which are used to drive an, an inelastic photon flux. The semi-exclusive mechanism can be not completely removed by requirement of uh, rapidity veto. For uh, semi-exclusive production for j -Psi meson, uh, we uh, have calculated we calculate also another mechanism, diffractive uh, partonic and uh, diffractive uh, resonance. And uh, resonance excitation is important for very low excitate uh, masses. Mm. And uh, these results can be found in our previous paper for exclusive, uh, for semi-exclusive uh, production. Uh, electromagnetic dissociation is of the same size as strong diffractive dissociation. It even dominates in some regions of the phase space. Um, cross uh, section for semi exclusive production with electromagnetic uh, dissociation can be calculated in a such a way where, uh, in the such way where Z. Uh, is the fraction of the proton's longitudinal momenta. Uh, P is transverse uh, momentum of the vector mesons. Uh, Q, uh, Q is uh, transverse momentum of the outgoing hadronic system uh, related with uh, excitation. Uh, and uh, F is inelastic uh, flux uh, photon. Electromagnetic dissociation of uh, protons uh, is calculated using uh, an inelastic integrated photon uh, flux. We've calculated based on the model parametrization uh, of uh, a deep inelastic proton structure function. And the function of structure of protons depends on uh, x Birken and uh, Virt photons virtuality. We calculate for different uh, 
uh, we, we have calculation for uh, cross section for different model of unintegrated uh, of uh, structural function uh, of uh, protons. Uh, for example, LLM, uh, FFGLM, or SU. Mm -hmm. And uh, now I'm going to the uh, results. Uh, now I present results for semi-exclusive production with electromagnetic dissociation in rapidity distribution uh, for a free uh, vector meson, meson phi, uh, the left panels, um, meson uh, JSI middle panels and uh, meson on, on upsilon uh, right panels for energy 7 TV and for energy 13 uh, TV. Uh, for missing mass, the cuts is uh, 10 GV. And here we have uh, results for different uh, structure function of uh, Protons, more lizards can be found in uh, our last paper for semi-exclusive production of a vector uh, meson. And here I have the same uh, results, but in uh, transverse momentum distributions, uh, also for free vector meson, phi, j psi, and upsilon for energy 7 TV and 13 TV. Uh, and the cuts of mass is the same, uh, 10 uh, GV. And now I want to compare exclusive and semi-exclusive production of vector meson. Here I present ratio of electromagnetic uh, dissociation to exclusive production uh, of vector meson in rapidity distribution for uh, different uh, cuts. Uh, of mass to 10, 20, and uh, 50 GV. Uh, these results are for LLAM uh, structure function of protons. And also, I have three uh, vector meson phi, j psi, and upsilon, and two different energies, 7 TV and 13 uh, TV. Uh, uh, we can see that uh, 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 results uh, strongly depends on the parametrization. Here we can see that the results strongly depend on the parametrization uh, of the structure function of photons and uh, ratio uh, uh, and only middle in uh, uh, ratio uh, depends uh, in uh, rapidity. And uh, now I want to show you the ratio of electromagnetic dissociation also to exclusive production, but in transverse momentum distribution, also for three uh, different vector meson phi, j psi, and upsilon for energy 7 TV and 13 TV. And also the cuts for mass uh, are the same. 10, uh, 20, and uh, 50 uh, GV. And the electromagnetic dissociation gives dominant contribution and large transverse momentum of vector meson. Uh, therefore, the ratio of the semi exclusive to exclusive contributions depends uh, on PT. And they are my conclusion. For exclusive production, we compare our results with HERA data for photon-proton collisions and with LHCB data for proton-proton collisions. The results for exclusive production strongly depends on the model of the wave function and on integrated Coulomb distribution function. Gaussian wave function better describe data than Coulomb. Electromagnetic dissociation of protons is calculated using an inelastic unintegrated photon flux, which was calculated based on model parametrization of deep inelastic proton structure function. And the results strongly depend on the parametrization of the structure function, which we use. Uh, and the ratio of the semi-exclusive to purely exclusive contribution strongly depends on the vector uh, of the uh, transverse momentum of vector uh, meson and only on rapidity. Thank you for your attention.
Thank you very much, Emma. It's very nice talk. Uh, thanks for all the predictions. Other questions? If not, I think uh, I thank you again, Anna. Thank you. And uh, our next talk is experimental uh, about the measurement of raw product photo production at Hera, and the speaker is Arthur Bolt. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Uh, can you see my slides? Yeah, very well. Good. Uh, then, on behalf of the H1 collaboration, I would like to present to you a measurement of the exclusive uh, raw photo production at Hera. So after a short introduction, I will uh, first present or talk about pi pi photo production at HERA and how we can extract uh, the, the raw photo production cross-section from the pi pi measurement. And I will then present uh, kinematic uh, distributions of the raw cross-section that we measure. And as a final result, I will discuss how we can use our measurements to extract the, the leaving ratchet trajectory. The analysis has been submitted to EVJC, and you can find a preprint uh, under this archive number. Um, so the first slide, the so vector meson production is basically you have an interaction between a photon and a proton uh, that produces a, a vector meson uh, in the final state. So this is a phenomenon of this strong interaction. And in particular, you can use this uh, to study soft diffraction. So in the regit picture, soft diffraction is basically governed by the exchange of regions in the low energy regime and po the polymer in the high energy regime. And because you have no um, exchange of color between the two scattering centers, uh, one experimental signatures that you have these large rapidity gaps in the outgoing particles. In the shown example, this would be between X and Y. Uh, the, the characteristics of, of, of or one characteristic of, of these diffractive scattering events is that if you look at cross sections in the high energy uh, limit, they, they tend to rise with the energy a W to some power delta. And in this ratio theory, uh, delta is really related to uh, the ratio trajectories and, and the way that it's given. By the formula. And the other characteristic is if you look at the momentum transfer distributions, uh, the momentum transfer is given by T and we look at it at the proton vertex, you typically have very steeply falling or exponentially falling uh, cross-section distributions. In the figure, an overview of photoproduction cross-section is shown for various uh, vector mesons as a function of the, the scattering energy W. And for the light vector mesons in particular that you see on, with the high cross-sections, the high energy uh, dependence of the cross-section is really governed by this polymer exchange. So we can study photoproduction uh, of, of vector mesons at the HERA electron uh, proton collider that was operated here in Hamburg until 2007. Uh, and it, it had, a, in particular, a center of mass energy of 320 GeV. At HERA, there were two large collider experiments, H1 and SUS. They were just general multipurpose detectors with, in particular, very good calorimetry covering the full solid angle. Uh, for this analysis, it's relevant that the tracking, good tracking, is, was only available in the central region. And also, there were dedicated forward detectors that one could use to analyze uh, the, the, the scattered proton system. Um, now we want to study uh, photo production uh, of bromosomes at HERA or with the H1 detector. And the bromosome decays predominantly into a pair of charged pions. So what we need to study is pi pi photo production. Uh, now, to study photo production at the electron collider, what we do is we go to very small photon virtuality. So the, the photon emitted by the electron uh, is quasi real. And then we, we basically have this photo production process that I discussed before. Now, two things are very important. So because we only study the pi-pi final state, there's um, irreducible backgrounds from other processes that also result in the same final state. So for example, we can replace the row meson by other vector mesons, omega or prime. And we also have a large non-resonant uh, channel where, where pi-pi is, is, is produced continuously. And in particular, all these processes can interfere with one, one another. The other thing that we need to consider is, in particular, if you want to interpret our data, we need to separate elastic scattering from these proton dissociative events that were also discussed already in, in these previous, some of the previous talks. Um, now, how does pi photo production look in the H1 detector? So basically, in the photo production regime, the electron is scattered on a very small angle, so it leaves the detector undetected in the backward direction. Also, for these um, soft diffractive events, the proton is scattered in very forward directions. So also, the proton leaves the detector undetected through the beam pipe. And all we're left with is two pions in the central part of the detector. Now, the, the, the two pions have very small transverse momenta, which means that we cannot really measure them with a colorimeter, but we have to rely solely on tracking. We can do this analysis in H1 because we had a very nice track trigger, the fast track trigger, so we could trigger these events. And now the remaining challenge is A, that we need to separate the elastic and the proton dissociative events. We can use this by using dedicated um, um, detectors in the forward direction of the H1 detector that we can use to tag these proton-associative events and then later statistically separate them out from the sample. 
The other challenge is that if you only reconstruct the two pions, the system is kinematic um, the under constraint, so this deteriorates the resolution. So we need to do a full unfolding, which we will also discuss uh, a bit later. And also, the limited acceptance of the tracker that I mentioned before results in in various um, small but non negligible backgrounds that can contaminate the data sample. Now, the data sample that we use for for the measurement was uh, is only a subset of the H1 data sample because of the available ability of the trigger. But nonetheless, we have a very large sample with with almost one million selected pi chi events. What you see on, on this figure is the control distribution of reconstructed events as a function of the pi pi reconstructed invariant pi pi mass. You very nicely see you have this peak at uh, 770 MeV. Um, so the sample is really dominated by this row resonance. And we, we model our data with the, uh, uh, with a Monte Carlo model that is based on the DFM Monte Carlo gen generator. And particularly, we, we model the full pi pi signal, including the row and other contributions. And we consider various backgrounds for retinal performance from omega, pi, rho prime, and photon dissociation. So I really want to, to stress that at this point, everything that decays into a pi pi exclusive pi pi final state is considered signal, and only like reducible backgrounds with other particles in the final state are, are here considered as background. For the proton dissociation, we also use the DFM generator that, that basically takes measured dissociative distribution, and, and the Monte Carlo is tuned to describe these measured distributions. Um, now we come to the cross-section measurement. So as I said, because of, we have these backgrounds and because we want to separate the elastic from the proton dissociated uh, component, and because we have a limited detector efficiency and resolution, we do a full unfolding. In particular, uh, uh, the, the unfolding is done with a regularized template fit using the T-unfold package. And in particular, we, we have several detector level control regions where we employ these forward um, um, detectors to, to that kind of, kind of have control regions for proton dissociative and elastic scattering that we can use to statistically determine the, 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 the fractions of events uh, in these channels. And then that this allows us to measure the elastic and proton dissociative cross sections independently. Uh, the, the phase space of the measurement is given in the, the right table. So in fact, in the energy, we go from 20 to 80 GV. Uh, T is below 1.5 GV squared. Q squared is below 2.5 GV squared. And for the proton dissociative component, we go up to a mass of 10 GeV. Now we want to measure photo production cross section. So the cross section calculation is just uh, the regular one where you uh, like divide the number of unfolded events by the integrated luminosity. And in order to um, calculate the photo production from the electro production cross sections, we normalize all of this by the effective photon flux. So this is calculated using the white covariance approximation. And then we extrapolate to Q squared equal to zero using the VDM approach. So we really have real photo production cross sections. The first result is shown here. So it's a differential cross section as a function of the n pi pi mass. And now we have separated in red the elastic component and green the proton associated component. Again, we see we have this rho p, but now on this logarithmic scale, we also see if you go to higher masses, there's a second uh, rho prime resonance. In the table, this is uh, basically just the, the fiducial cross section that we get in the phase space together with the split up of the systematic uncertainty of time i don't want to go into detail here but just most of the uncertainties we have are really normalization uncertainties now how do we get the row cross section from the pi cross section so for this we use a serving model the, the the model basically models a row contribution omega contribution and non-resonant contribution they are added at the amplitude level so that interference effects are taken into account in the model and we can use basically then the model to fit the or fit the model to the data and extract the the row component to calculate the row cross section the model is illustrated in the plot as a function of m pi pi. So in blue, we have the rho contribution, in purple, the, the omega contribution, and in orange, the non-resonant continuum contribution. We add them all up, and you see there's a very large interference that gives rise to this uh, famous skewing of the rho resonance peak during black towards lower masses. Now, on slide number nine, I show a fit um, of uh, the sorting model to our data. The model describes the data really very nicely. And you see here the, the, the black curves are a fitted model compared to the data points that we saw before. And because the model does not take into account this row prime second resonance peak that I we, we, we saw before, we only perform the fit in this limited analysis range from 0 0.6 to 1 GV. One nice feature about our data is because we do this uh, unfolding, um, we can really see for the first time in row photo production at Hera this omega contribution, which gives this steep edge on top of the row peak. We can, of course, from this fit, extract some physical parameters, which are given here for the mass of, and, and width of the rho and the mass of the omega meson, and compare them to the PEG values. So these are, are all quite consistent. Um, 
Now we want to, of course, is that kinematic uh, row cross-section distribution. So in order to do this, we unfold the, the pi pi mass spectrums in very schematic things. So we consider one-dimensional distributions where we have nine um, and six energy uh, bins for, for the elastic and proton associated contribution, for example. But then we also have two-dimensional um, distributions where we have four times seven energy and T bins for the elastic and four times five energy and T bins for the proton associated component. And this is what you see on these two panels here. And then we again take the Sirding model, fit it to all mass distributions simultaneously. Then we have to make some additional assumptions on the kinematic parameter dependencies in order to reduce our number of fit parameters. And then we can integrate out the row contribution and get kinematic uh, row cross section distributions. The first distribution I want to present is the energy dependence of the row cross section, which is shown here again in red for the elastic and green for the proton associated component. And the elastic component is compared to data or to, to, to measurement from previous experiments. So we fix target experiments at low energy and then previous HERA and LHC measurements in, in the high energy regime. Uh, we can parameterize our data in, in, in the form of fit of this power law, uh, where the, the, the extracted parameters are given here. So one thing that is peculiar is that while the elastic cross-section indeed rises with energy as expected, the proton associated cross-section falls with energy. However, for a proper interpretation, one has to take into account that the proton associated phase space is restricted quite strongly. So we go only go up to 10 GeV in the dissociative mass. And this really strongly shapes the energy dependence of the cross-section. The other thing that we can do is we can take this donachin lanzoff model and describe the full data where we have a, a region contribution at, at low energy and then the polymer contribution at high energy to describe the full uh, energy range that's shown in the plot. And also here the parameters that we, we get from the fit are given here. Now one important thing to notice is that if we only fit our data, the parameter that we get is not really uh, the, the, the parameter for the Pomeron because it's a bit lower than when we also consider region contributions, which indicates that there still might be some region contributions in the considered energy range. And from the fit, they are estimated at 2% at, uh, uh, in the center of our phase space at 40 GV. So this is important for the interpretation of later results. On slide 12, the other thing we can do is we can also uh, study the T-dependence of the cross-section, which is shown again for the elastic on the left and for the proton associated on the right. As I said, one expects an exponential behavior. However, we found that there is significant deviation from this exponential towards larger T. So we use this modified um, uh, parameterization, which transitions towards larger T into a, a simple power law and describes the data quite nicely. And, and we can really then model and describe this deviation from the exponential behavior. Again, the, the parameters are, are given uh, here. Now, the, the final and most interesting result is, as I said, and as I showed you, we can measure also two-dimensional cross-section distributions as a function of T and energy. So they are presented on the left two plots, uh, the, 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 the differential cross-section as shown as a function of T, and then stacked on top of another in, in, in the four considered energy, ben, uh, energy bins for the elastic and proton associated components, respectively. And we can perform a two-dimensional regif fit uh, to the data. So the fit model is similar, like a combination of what, what I discussed before. So for the T-dependence, we use the same parameterization as before. And then we have this explicit uh, regge energy dependence where the energy goes to some power uh, or function of the regge trajectory. Now, the regge trajectory at small t, they're expected to be linear. However, we chose this um, uh, slightly more complicated formula, which looks complicated, but it's similar to a Fermi function. So it's very linear if you're at small t, but then in transitions, into a more flat behavior and, and finally saturates or becomes constant if you go to, to very large T. So all the curves that you see come from this 2D regit fit. So in the left two plots, the, the fitted cross-section function is compared uh, to, to, the, to the data. And then in order to visualize the regit trajectory that we're most interested in, what we do is we fit the energy dependence in all the T bins um, separately with a free fit parameter alpha T. And then you see these fit parameters alpha T as a function of T in, in the right two plots. And the curves you see in there, these are really the curves that we got from the full 2D regit fit using this parameterization here. Now for the elastic cross-section, uh, we get an intercept of 1.06 for, for the leading regit trajectory and the slope of 0.23. And we... you're, you're slightly over time. Oh, or... yes, okay. I'm, I'm done in, in one second. And we see there's some indication of saturation, but it's not really significant. So with this, I come to the summary. So just one last remark that I, I want to make is that the intercept compared to previous measurement, it's a bit low. Um, so normally for the donahi lanzoff you expect something like 1.08. And the probable explanation is that also, as I said, in, in the energy range, we have probably some small region contribution, which would lower the intercept. So with this, I'm done. Thank you very much for the attention. If you want to see more, just look up, please look up our, our paper. Thank you very much. Okay.
Thank you very much for this nice talk, uh, for the nice result. Uh, one question, Anthony. Uh, also, uh, congratulations for a very nice talk and nice results. Uh, I mean, you fit it. I, I just want to refer to your T dependencies. You fit it T dependencies, uh, but I think this change of the slope uh, for larger T may be an indication of some dynamical effect. Uh, of uh, something like uh, multiple scattering. Uh, and this is interesting in this context. Of course, you parameterize it, uh, but uh, it's a question what it means uh, deeper in physics. And uh, my feeling is it may be related to this multiple scattering. So maybe theorists should work, including us. Yes. Uh We'd be happy to, for, if, if you can do that. I mean, I think in the paper, we just- We should, we should- uh, we can describe the data and we don't try we, to-, to We should it. do something for this, yes. Thank you. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Arthur. The next speaker is Otto Nachtmann. We'll be talking about the central exclusive diffractive production of axial vector mesons. Yeah, we see your slides, please go ahead. But we don't hear you yet, are you muted? Hello? Is, do you hear me? Yeah, now we hear you. Now we hear. Okay, okay. go ahead. So, uh, uh, but, uh, oh, sorry, I'm still, uh, then, no, how do I, I'm still prob have problems with this, this machine, I'm sorry. Ah, Stummschaltung video freigeben. How can I? I think you might okay. be able to go back in the slides with a right mouse click. Have you tried that? Right. Does that go back? No, it goes forward. What or about keyboard? Left, or with the left cursor on the keyboard? Uh, I have no. Sorry. Stummschaltung Teilnehmer, neue Freigabe. Fernbedienung. No, sorry. Hmm. You, you will probably have to switch to the program that displays the slides and then go left with the cursor. But I can do nothing at the moment. Ah, maybe. Ah, no, it's, it's okay now. Keep going. Uh, now it goes. Yeah. All right. Okay. So my talk will be about central exclusive production of axial vector mesons F1 in proton proton collisions. And this is work done together with Piotr Lebiedovich, Josef Leutke, uh, Anton Repan, and Antoni Schurek. So it's a Krakow Vienna Heidelberg collaboration. So, this outline of my talk after an introduction, I will talk about the Pomeron Pomeron F1 coupling, show some preliminary results, and draw some conclusions. So, here's the introduction. In this talk, we will be concerned with central exclusive production, CEP of F1-1285 and F1-1420 mesons in proton-proton collisions. So proton PA, proton PB with momenta go into two protons, P1, P2, and in the middle, an F1 meson. At high energies, this should be mainly due to double Pomeron exchange. And I have shown you the figure here. So the two, the protons, they each shake off a Pomeron and then the Pomeron fuse to give an F1. So the relevant kinematic quantities are standard. I will not go through them. S is the center of mass energy squared. We treat our reaction in the tensor Pomeron approach, which was introduced by Everts, Maniatis and myself in 2014. And this approach has a good basis from non perturbative QCD considerations. Now, in this model, 
the Pomeron and the charge conjugation sequel plus one regions are described as effective rank two symmetric tensor exchanges. The Odoron and the sequel minus one regions are described as effective vector exchanges. I should say that a tensor character of the Pomeron is also preferred in holographic QCD. And here are uh, some relevant uh, references. There are by now many applications of our tensor Pomeron model to diffractive processes. Uh, we have treated many two body hydronic reactions, photoproduction reactions, especially also the reaction which Arthur Boltz uh, just uh, uh, talked about. We have um, got a very nice fit to low X deep in elastic scattering. And we have treated many CEP reactions. These CEP reactions mostly together with uh, Antoni Shurek and Piotr Lebiedovich. So CEP, central exclusive production, proton plus proton, giving proton plus proton plus X. And the X's we have looked at uh, are eta, eta prime, so pseudoscalars, F0, F2, proton, antiproton, KK bar, phi, two phi's, four pi's, and so on. So it would be very nice if uh, star uh, results uh, could be uh, compared to all our theoretical calculations. I think what's really missing are good uh, event generators. So from these studies, we know the form of the effective Pomeron propagator and of the Pomeron PP vertex. So new in our present work is the Pomeron Pomeron F1 vertex. So the second part, I will discuss this Pomeron Pomeron F1 coupling. And I will give you a coupling Lagrangian. And from this in standard way, one gets the vertex function. So here we have two Pomerons giving F1. Now, we, since we have tensor Pomerons, the Pomerons carry two indices, two Lorentz indices, kappa lambda rho sigma. We follow two strategies for constructing this coupling Lagrangian. The first one is a phenomenological approach. So we consider, and in this approach, we consider first the fictitious process, the fusion of two real spin two Pomerons of mass M. You can call this also tensor glue balls. And uh, then we ask that they give an F1 meson with spin parity and charge conjugation one plus plus. So here's our reaction. Uh, M is the mass of the fictitious Pomerons or glue balls. And epsilon one, epsilon two are the polarization tensors. Epsilon is the polarization vector of the F1. So let's work in the rest system of the F1, where the two Pomerons collide head on to give an F1 at rest. Now we can do a simple angular momentum analysis of this process. The spin of the two real Pomerons can be combined to give a total spin S which ranges between zero and four. And this then has to be combined with the orbital angular momentum L to give uh, J by BC one plus plus, the quantum numbers of the F1. Now there are exactly two possibilities, which we label by angular momentum, uh, orbital angular momentum L and spin LS, so it's two, two and four, four. And uh, it's easy to write down uh, corresponding uh, coupling Lagrangians. Uh, the 2 2 term looks like as follows. Here are the effective uh, Pomeron fields, P kappa lambda, P rho sigma, with two asymmetric derivatives in between, corresponding to L equal 2. And this is sort of the field strength tensor of the F1 meson. Um, you Beta is the field of the F1, that's d alpha u beta minus d beta u alpha. Here, M0 is introduced for dimensional reasons, it's 1 GV, and G prime is a dimensionless coupling constant. Gamma 8 
is a known tensor function. It looks too difficult, too uh, complicated for me to show you here. Now the 4-4 term looks similar. It has now four asymmetric derivatives in between corresponding to L equal four. And again, a coupling constant, uh, which is dimensionless and a tensor function, which uh, has now 10 indices. Now we use these couplings and supplement them by suitable form factors for treating our CEP central explosive production reaction. Now the second approach which we follow is coming from holographic QCD and it uses the Sakai Sugimoto model. Here are some references to this model. And there it looks much more sophisticated the pomeron pomeron F1 coupling can be derived from the bulk churn simons term, requiring consistency of supergravity and the gravitational anomaly. And then this uh, churn simons Lagrangian looks quite different. It has again two couplings, kappa prime dimensionless and <laughs> kappa double prime, which has dimension chef to the minus two. And here you have again the uh, F1 field, the two Pomeron fields and some derivative and epsilon tensor in between. Now for our fictitious reaction with real Pomerons, there is a strict equivalence. This John Simons Lagrangian is strictly equivalent to the a certain sum of the two, two and four, four Lagrangians. Of course, if the couplings satisfy a certain relation, a certain linear relation, G prime is kappa prime m zero squared over k squared minus kappa double prime m zero squared k squared minus two m squared over two k squared. And g double prime is kappa double prime two m zero fourth over k squared. Now that is strict equivalence for this uh, real fictitious reaction, for the fictitious reaction, I should say, for the um, reaction which we are interested, central exclusive production, the Pomerons, of course, are not on a fictitious mass shell, but their mass squared T1, T2 are less than zero instead of M squared. But replacing here in this rela relation, 2M squared by T1 plus T2, we expect still approximate equivalence to hold. And this is indeed confirmed by explicit numerical studies. So I come to preliminary results. We have compared uh, our calculations with experimental results from the WA102 experiment. This, this experiment studied proton-proton collisions at root S 29.1 uh, GV. And they worked at the omega spectrometer at CERN in the years 1997 to 2000. And they had the big advantage that they could measure the complete final state. So they gave us cross section and also dependence distributions in T in the, um, and in uh, an angle phi PP where phi PP is the azimuthal angle between the transverse momenta of the two outgoing protons. Similar angle was discussed by uh, Rafael Sikora in a previous talk. Now the cross sections which they get also had a cut on the X Feynman of the produced meson of less than 0.2 in absolute value. And the cross sections are around 7,000 nanobahn for the F2-1285 and about uh, 1,500 1, nanobahn for the F1-1420. Uh, so here are results. For the T dependence, the trans, the momentum uh, distribution. And you see that uh, with the two term, two, two term, the L equal two, S equal two term alone, we get a, a nice description of the T dependence 
end of this very non-trivial phi uh, angular dependence. And of course, our results depend on uh, a parameter in the form factor and uh, uh, this parameter, cutoff parameter in form factor has a reasonable value 0.7 GV. I should, and uh, this value then comes from fitting the total cross-section. Not only the distribution, but then the total cross-section. I should also say that absorption effects, which are very important in this case, have been included. So we can also fit this WA102 data using the 44 term only. In this case, we get a coupling constant in absolute value 10.3. Again, absorption effects are included. If we have only one coupling, then this cross section, of course, cannot uh, know about the sign of the coupling. Only a relative sign of two couplings uh, can be uh, gotten from experiment. Now, here is the uh, churn simons coupling. And also there we get, I only show you here the phi PP, the angular distribution. We get a, a co uh, corresponding fit to this phi distribution. And uh, uh, the kappa prime is minus 8.8 .8 and the ratio here minus one. And if you fit now these uh, numbers into the relation, which I showed you, you find that this roughly corresponds or very uh, rather precisely corresponds to a pure LS44 term. So I'm nearly done. I come to my conclusions. We have discussed in detail the forms of the Pomeron-Pomeron F1 coupling. I think we obtain a good description of the WA102 data at root S 29.1 GV. And our preliminary results for LHC energies indicate similar distributions as at the lower energy and a cross section of two to 35 micropan, depending on cuts. Details tests of this model are possible. And I think experimental studies of single meson central exclusive production reactions will give many Pomeron-Pomeron meson coupling parameters. And their theoretical calculation is a challenging problem of non-perturbative QCD. I think with this Sakai Sugimoto model, for instance, one is just at the beginning of such interesting calculations. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Marek. Yes, uh, very nice talk, Otto. Uh, Thank you. We heard yesterday that there is some experimental evidence for existence of the Oderon. Can yes. one play this game with Oderon and learn more about it from analogous processes where you have Oderon, Pomeron fusion? Yes, of course. Yes, of course. We had, uh, I think Piotr talked yesterday about phi and double phi production. These are excellent for studying the Oderon. No, but what Piotr talked about is slightly different, if I understood correctly. I mean, analogous to what you did. Yes. Instead of, instead of Pomeron, Pomeron fusion, Pomeron, Oderon fusion, which yes. will create yes. mesons with different Yes, yes, but phi is a, is a very good. Then you have to have a C equal minus one meson. Yeah. So phi or J psi is very good. Also okay. two phi's are good because you can have then a pomeron, odoron, pomeron as exchange. Uh -huh. So these are ex excellent uh, um, processes for studying the odoron at LHC. And we have uh, published two papers on this, on the single phi and on the double phi. I see, thank you. Very, uh, okay, of course. Okay, so there is another question from Anthony, very yes. quickly. Please. It is not a question, but because I know Rafa uh, Shikora uh, was probably listening to this talk, we kindly ask 
uh, Atlas and Star to look at F1 production, uh, then you should look to four pion channel, for instance, four charge pions. So okay, please. so at Star, at Star it would be hard, but at Atlas, uh, yes, some results should be released soon. So thank you, and we are waiting for those results. Yes, I mean, uh, for time reasons, I did not mention this. The F1 should show up as a peak, a, a sharp, sharp peak on the background from the four pions from the F2. So it could be a very nice signal for Atlas. Okay, thank you for the suggestions. I think, unfortunately, we have to cut the yes. discussion. We don't have more time. Yes, thank yes, you very much. Course. Thank uh, to all speakers. And uh, okay, for the audience, we are running slightly behind the schedule. We will reconvene, we will shorten the coffee break and reconvene at 11.40. Uh -huh. And uh, the speakers for next session, please can they stay connected and uh, check their sharing in the oh. meantime. Okay, thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Just uh, uh, talk. Can you can you stop sharing? So that yeah, you yeah. Can... Stop. <laughs> yeah, thank That's you. That's fine. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. Hi, Sharko. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Hi, Antonio. Okay. Hi, how are you? So I guess we go through the through the checks. So hi Wen Chen, I see you. Yes, hi. Could you share your your, your slides? Um, uh, not not yet. I would do it immediately. Okay. So all right, I see them. Okay, great. Okay, thanks. Sure. So Ilya already um, um, checked, right? The sharing. Right, I checked it. Okay, good. So Kang, I'm sorry, let me know if I'm speaking correctly your name. Uh, uh, my name is... I can see you. Yes. Okay. Sure. Okay. C could you share as well? Yes. Do you see it? Yeah. Okay. It's good. Okay. Now we can stop sharing. Thanks. Is Marco connected? Yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah. Good. I'm trying to share in a second. Okay. Is it fine? Can you yeah. Slide? Yes. Yeah. Mm, okay, okay, thanks. I, I can switch also. Thank you. Okay. Is Jennifer connected? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, okay. Will you share the slides? Yes, I'm trying to say. Can you see them? Just a second. I tried going full screen, which doesn't always work on a Mac. Um, I just see a message, but uh, not yet. Uh, okay, so let me uh, stop this in one minute. Um, sorry about this. Just that. Or. Now, okay. Okay. I see them. Okay. So that Jeff is okay. So now, uh, Dennis. Um, uh, is it Anton who is speaking? Just muting me for a minute. Uh, Dennis, are you there? Hello, Antonio. Can you hear Hi, me? Dennis. Yes. How are you, Dennis? Very fine. Thank you. How are you? Fine, fine. Good to see you. Good. 
Good to see you too. How, could you share your slides just for us to check? Give, give me just a minute, please. Yeah, yeah, don't. All right, I see the, the window. Is it okay now? It's okay. So you, 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 um, you do it from the browser? Yes, yes. I just opened from the browser, but I will download it and, and then make it. Okay. Okay, that should be fine. Um, thanks. And is Anthony connected? He's the last uh, speaker. I don't see him. Anthony Badea. To have a, a minute or so before we start, let's see. If... Okay, no, let's see if he connects uh, during the session. Right. So, Sharka, we said uh, 11.40, right, to restart? Yeah, I think, yeah, that's what we said. Yeah, so I think we're already on time. So, hello, everyone. I'm Antonio Villala Pereira, so I'll be chairing the session. Um, so, we start, so this session has uh, several interesting talks on very young um, measurements and predictions, jet substructure, and also hadronic event shapes. So, we start with uh, Wen Chen Chang. So I see already your, your screen share. Uh, ask everyone to please uh, keep to your allocated time. Uh, please do start. Thank you. Thank you. This is Wen, Wen, Wen Chen. So in this talk, I will uh, speak on the lepton angle distribution of the Drillian process and see how the QCD actually play the role inside it. And with this property, we can um, actually uses for the jets, the discrimination. So this is the work in collaborate with the Genji, Evan, and Oleg. So, so here is a, a simple cartoon showing the Zhao Yan is the quark anti-quark annihilates during the hadron collision with the dilepton detected in the final state. The definition of the ang uh, lepton angle distribution is actually constructed in the uh, Hadron plan, we we actually get the, the uh, momentum information of the incidence, the hadron, and and being. So, uh, for example, in the convention of the colin sober friend, we can define the z-axis bisects of this uh, two hadron, and then this uh, theta angle is actually this uh, lep uh, this uh, lepton vector with respect to this z. And then as mu so phi angle is how the lepton plane uh, separated from the hadron plane. So conventionally, there are two expressions for this angular distribution. Uh, the first one is this uh, one plus lambda cosine lambda mu nu uh, for the fixed target experiment. And this A0, A1, and N2 for the collider uh, ex experiment. So in the leading uh, uh, diagram of the Zhou Yan, which is come from QQ bar uh, uh, annihilation, uh, you can prove that uh, this uh, angular distribution should be one plus cosine theta square. 
that means that lambda is equal to one and all of this and mu so dependence should be gone. That uh, equivalent expression, it will be this A0, A1, and A2 are uh, going to zero. So uh, if for the Z production, actually, uh, we can look into a more, uh, uh, more higher moments that like something like uh, A3, A4, 5, 6, and 7. For example, here, A3 and A4, which is actually characterized in the uh, parity violation coming from the uh, virtual photon inter interference with the Z. So uh, when the QCD effect is coming, for example, we get this uh, guong in terms of the virtual correction or the uh, guong uh, radiate out in this QQ bar process or even the quark guong uh, Compton scattering comes in. So it was uh, in 1978, there's this uh, Lantong relations was proposed is the lambda was started uh, with this, the uh, QCD effect come in, the lambda will no longer to be one and the new can become non-zero. However, this one minus lambda to new, uh, as the uh, first order of the QCD effect uh, is proved to be, should be equal to zero. And uh, equivalent uh, expression is a, a0 equal to a2. However, in the later on, uh, the fixed target experiment using the pion beam, actually when people, uh, uh, you can, we can clearly see this and uh, uh dependence on, in terms of the phi for the Jeroen process. Uh, and we uh, looking into this uh, Lantong, relation and the find it's uh, clearly been violated at the large PT. So this was something that the first evidence find in the uh, lantern violation in the fixed target experiment. And then uh, recently from the C, uh, LHC, so CMS actually first uh, published uh, this uh, very uh, nice uh, accurate measurement of, of all of this A0, A1, A2, and A3, A4. In the final plot here, okay, so they clearly they show the very strong the, uh, uh, dependence on the transverse momentum, this QT dependence. And on, the, uh, on this plot, it's very clearly to show also the violation of the Lantone, which is the A0 is no longer into the A1. So other than this uh, Lantone violation and the transverse momentum dependence, um, uh, they also measure the rapidity dependence of all of this uh, AI parameter. So quite interesting, you, you find that the A0 and the A2, they don't show the very strong rapidity depend dependence while A1, A3, and A4. Indeed, the, the rapidity de dependence was there. Uh, and Atlas also making a, a, a similar measurements and the general observation is quite the same. So clearly observation of the lantern violation at the large PT and the standards, the A1 and A3 show the rapidity dependence. So, in general, from all of this uh, Joel Yang angle distribution, we observe a uh, distinct QT dependence, and we uh, we find out this uh, lantern uh, violation, which is seems that the some effect actually beyond of, of the first leading uh, leading order of the QCD effect. We observe the violation both in the fixed target and the collider experiment and also as well as the rapidity dependence. So uh, here we try to answer uh, two questions. The first one is, can this feature be understood by the PQCD? And the second one is, can we provide any simple picture for the interpretation? So uh, in this paper in the 2017, it's actually performed a state of art, the fixed order uh, PQCD calculation for the uh, comparison with the CMS data on the A0 and A2. So it's from here is actually going starting from the alpha S at the first power and move to the th uh, second and the third power. And here you can see that with this running out of uh, going up to alpha S third power is actually described the data rather well. 
And one interesting observation here is uh, because here uh, on the the uh, the panel uh, the bottom panel here is actually using the next leading order calculation result, which is alpha square as the uh, as a reference. As you can see, this uh, a zero calculation using uh, leading next leading order or next next leading order are actually quite uh, similar. However, the deviation is only in C for the A, A2. So uh, when you go to the higher order calculation, this A2 is actually reduced. So this is some uh, interesting observation from the QCD calculation. And similar result can also be seen from the comparison of with the Atlas result. And they also uh, a quite nice, uh, very good uh, description of this Lanton violation can be described by uh, uh, found in the CMS and Atlas can be described by this fixed order calculation. And in this paper is actually making the claim you, uh, we have to go to the alpha as the third power in order to give a reasonable description of the Atlas the data. So uh, in the recent work uh, we, we do actually, uh, as we, uh, we actually only perform the next leading order uh, calculation in this plot for showing the A0 uh, dependence uh, on the QT. And here, uh, here we overlay the, the, the contribution of the QG, uh, quark anti-quark term and the quark gluon Compton scattering term. As you will see, the, the, the experimental measurement is actually is the weighted average of the contribution from these two processes. So this is actually uh, uh, suggest if the experiment, they will be able to look into the, the, uh, the event sample, which is contained Z plus a single jet, uh, they can actually uh, find out the, the A0 from this uh, single jet event sample could be different from if they will be able to uh, make sure that jet is come from Guong or come from the, 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 the quark one. So this will be used as a uh, uh, use for a property in terms of the jet discrimination. And furthermore, uh, from here, we actually perform the next next leading order calculation. Uh, so it's actually described the CNAS data as well, uh, rather well. And we've, if we only uh, select it out of the event for the Z plus two jet, Actually, we uh, it's clearly see that the, this uh, lanton violation uh, signal will be enhanced in this kind of uh, example. So such kind of the information, I guess, it would be very useful to be wait for the confirmation uh, uh, by the, the the measurement by uh, either CMS or Atlas. So for the fixed target uh, experiment, we also perform the uh, uh, QCD calculation and the try to compare. And over here, uh, in general, it's described the general feature, but quantitatively, actually, it doesn't go through that as well. So for example, this lantern violation cannot be uh, described uh, at all. Even the sign are different. So here, for example, people uh, act already suggest some kind of the non-perturbative TMD ball model effect, try to accounting for this lantern violation in the fixed target that low QT region. And in the recent work, we also provide some uh, uh, prediction on the coming uh, measurement of the compass using the pion induced result. So the, the, the answer for the question is that the PQC can partially answer the, the describe all of this um, uh, data. So are we able to have some simple picture for the interpretation? So uh, we, we do some work and have this uh, suggestion. So um, when we look in uh, previously, when we look into the definition of the angle dis dis distribution, we only uh, look into the hadron plane and the lepton plane. But fundamentally, uh, if we uh, intro uh, introduce this, uh, the, the colliding direction of the quark and anti-quark uh, direction, of course, it's experimentally, we are not able to measure it. But uh, we can imagine this kind, if we are able to uh, align the, uh, this uh, lepton direction with respect to this uh, Z prime we call na na natural axis, then the, all the angular distribution will be most simplified over there. They will 
become is really something like a one plus the cosine theta square, uh, zero. Okay, but experiment uh, due to the experimental major constraint, we uh, we can only access the information through the hadron plane and the lepton plane. So in in that sense, we have to express this uh, theta zero uh, by the experimental uh, major theta and the five. So then that that's mean we have to make in some uh, mathematical transformation. That was the uh, would be related is the how this the uh, angle dependence between z and the, the z uh, experimental defined z and this intrinsic z plane, as well as the the, the so-called quark plane with the hadron plane. So after doing plugging this uh, experiment uh, mathematical expression, it's getting look like a little bit complicated. But if you make making the mapping with the experimental uh, expression, actually you can convince yourself all this uh, A zero parameter, they are actually the, is the event average of all of this uh, microscopic uh, theta, uh, theta one and the phi one, which is introduced on the previous slide. So based on these things, actually there will be uh, very, uh, on the first order uh, alpha s, if you consider only one single gluon uh, radiation from QQ bar or quark and uh, quark gluon Compton scattering, this uh, phi one that means the quark plane and the, the uh, quark plane will be completely coincide with the hadron plane. That's this phi one was actually zero, either zero and pi. That will be very in, uh, naturally explain why the at the leading order a zero and the a two are actually the same. When we move to the, the higher order, like a two gluon uh, uh, radiates from two separate quark line, they were making this phi one to be non-zero. And in that case, this A2 will be less than A, uh, A0. And it's also, that's what, what we observe from the experiment. So other than this, uh, we can also uh, consider uh, the similar property for the A0, A3, and A4. And we will see there will be some cancellation effect happen for them and uh, they can describe why they we observe the rapidity dependence for that. So here comes the summary, the, the PQC calculation and can really quantitatively de describe the Drell-Yen angle distribution from the collider. There is some deviation C in the fixed target data and the Z plus jets uh, angle distribution can be used for the jets uh, discrimination. And when we introduce this geometrical picture of the na natural axis, we can actually uh, describe quite a, a interesting uh, feature of we observe in the angle distribution. So this is the, the reference and thanks for your attention. Thanks a lot for this very nice talk. Um, so we have one question by Anton. Uh, hello. Uh, yes. My, my question is a little bit political. Uh, I mean, uh, because there is your interpretation uh, in terms of transverse momentum, this could be probably quantitatively addressed in KT factorization approaches. Uh, I am not sure uh, this is what you mean. Uh, but my question is, uh, in, in, what is your opinion you think this effect cannot be explained in uh, collinear perturbative QCD? Yeah, so all, all of this calculation was actually done by co collinear uh, P PQCD calculation. So there is no KT factorization and also no resummation effect is considered. I see. So, so you think it can be understood within collinear approach? Uh, at least at a large PT for the, from the collider, that is very clear. But uh, for the fixed target one, is still, uh, since we didn't perform the resummation one, so we cannot make in the claim. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hello, oh, this is Ilya Grubunov. Can I ask a question? Yeah, please go ahead. Uh, can you go back to slide number 12? Um, when describing the slide, you said that uh, um, you can use this information to better discriminate between uh, uh, quarks and gluon uh, jets, 
in experiments. Can you be a little bit more precise on how you suggest to use it for discrimination for such a... Right. So, so such a, such a uh, uh, thank you for your question. So this kind of a discrimination is probably difficult to be done on an event by event basis. But the, in, in our uh, thinking is suppose right now experimentally people propose some kind of the way to separate the uh, guon jet and the quark jet. For example, if this uh, quark guon content scattering, so the radiate one should be the quark jet and for this QQ bar should be the guon jet. S suppose the experimentally already proposed some of the way for this the jet discrimination and they uh, use in this way and apply to the real data and uh, they, they can uh, characterize their event sample. Then what we propose is actually they can look into this angular distri distribution of the event sample and uh, try to look into their, their A0 distribution to see whether they actually can be described by this uh, uh, pr prediction by the PQCD curve. That, that, that is what we mean here. And in that sense, they can give in the support or uh, confirmation about this experimental way of characterizing the jet discrimination. Uh, thank you. And one more question, if possible. Uh, in one of the last slides, you said that uh, in um, this geometrical approach, uh, you're expecting the to have uh, um, A0 and A2 uh, Lemtung relation to be true for the uh, for the cases with zero and two jet, uh, and one associated jet. Uh, but when having two associated jets, you're expecting it to be violated. Um, and in this sense, can you give some guidance on the choice of the um, uh, of the axes, uh, z axis in, in the experiment to prove uh, the statement? Uh, there, uh, there is no specific uh, experimentally. You can only uh, define this uh, z. You will be able able to construct this z prime. So Z, you, you still follow the, this uh, construction of the calling sober using the, the bin and the target uh, momentum direction. So the, the, the point is actually, if, if you experimentally, you will be able to characterize the event with the two jets in the, in the final state, then you're looking into this, uh, the Lanton by uh, this A0 and A2. So our, uh, Based on our, our thinking, this this uh, this uh, effect will be enhanced. Actually, based on PQCD is also is over there because right now the experimental measurement is the inclusive one. So in some sense, the this uh, lantern violation uh, signal is a little bit diluted. That is the message we, we want to say. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thanks again, Wen Chen. Uh, yeah, we welcome. Move on. Thanks again. Uh, so we can now go to Ilya uh, Gorbunov. Um, could you share your slides, please? So Ilya will talk about area measurements uh, with the CMS experiment. So please start when you're ready. Hello, uh, so I will um, so why is it important uh, why the drill young uh, measurements are important? First of all, uh, by um, carrying out drill uh, young measurements, we can uh, test some model, we can constrain part and distribution functions extract parameters such as sine squared, theta Weinberg, uh, forward backward asymmetry, angular coefficients, and others. We can uh, evaluate an important uh, source of background for many um, beyond model uh, 
physics, uh, we can test different Monte Carlo models and uh, test production mechanism dynamics. More than that, it is a precision measurement with a Hadron Collider. So, uh, a few words about Drelian process, the, pro uh, the production of Lipton pairs in, uh, is well uh, known and theoretical calculations are well established up to next to next to leading order and comparison of data in Monte Carlo provide a strengthening test of QCD and uh, can significantly constrain uh, PDFs uh, and Brilliant is a major background for TT bar and type boson measurement as well for uh, many new physics. So, um, uh, what, what, what are the new 13 TD results by the CMS? First of all, it's uh, the 13 TV results for the dual gun differential cross uh, invariant mass cross section. Uh, those measurements were carried out at 13 TV using 2.8 inverse femtobarns of 215 data uh, in the mass range of uh, from 15 to 3000 GVs. Uh, uh, the um, uh, the measurements were compared to different uh, um, theoretical predictions, namely Mudgraf and Fuse, uh, and the results uh, are now public and all the links in the talk are clickable. Um, then I would like to mention the 13 TV results for the uh, Z production cross sections. Uh, the, there are differential uh, PT, uh, star, phi star, and the rapidity cross sections as well, which are available both for electron and electron myon and combined electron plus myon channels. Uh, the, um, as well as the uh, cross sections. Um, then I would like to say a few words about the angular coefficients. Uh, so here is the cone super frame, which was used for uh, to measure angular coefficients with the um, CMS experiment. The angle, uh, the uh, cosine theta phi uh, um, differential cross section uh, was uh, which was used for the. Um, measurement uh, with the CMS experiment uh, is the following one. Uh, if this uh, expression is integrated over phi star, one can derive the expression for the forward backward asymmetry. And uh, here are the results for the uh, angular coefficients at ATV. Uh, which were derived using 19.7 inverse femtoburns of data. Mm, one can see that there are some strong dependencies, uh, rapidity dependencies for some of the coefficients, and there is a clear uh, Lemtung um, relation violation. Uh, here are some details on uh, the coefficients and uh, um, uh, well, the, the dependencies on the physics uh, physics per underlying physics parameters, and uh, this, those measurements can be further extending by measuring coefficients outside of the z peak. Uh, introducing additional coefficients and uh, trying to measure uh, uh, quark gluon and quark antiquark production mechanisms separately. Uh, then here are the ATV results for the forward backward asymmetry, and uh, here are the cosine theta. Um, 
cosentity distribution for two invariant mass regions uh, for uh, z to mu mu and z to e, e uh, for dimion and dielectron final states the top one is the left uh, hand side plots are for a low invariant mass region of 50 to 70 to 60 GeV and the right one is the, for the high invariant mass region of uh, 130 to 150 GeVs and one can see that for the high invariant mass uh, region uh, the uh, distribution is uh, um, asymmetric. Uh, and uh, this is uh, because of the forward-backward asymmetry, which is shown on the next slide. Here, uh, here is the result of the uh, forward-backward asymmetry measured at the CMS at ATV with 19 inverse femtoburns of uh, data. Uh, the, the, these are the combined results uh, in the electron and muon channels. The um, measurement is separated in uh, uh, rapidity beans to suppress uh, dilution, uh, as dilution is larger for the low uh, rapidity region and decreases at high rapidity regions, uh, while uh, the um, acceptance has uh, the opposite effect. Uh, and here is the uh, unfolded AFB distribution for uh, to, for the rapidity region uh, from 2.4 to 5 with the ATV for the electron channel separately. Mm. Uh, there are also weak mixing angle uh, measurements available with the CMS experiment. Those measurements use the uh, AFB and they rely on the feet of experimental AFB distribution with theory at next to leading order. Um, the statistic, uh, these um, for, for this measurement, 19 inverse femtoburns of data was used, uh, and the statistical and systematical uncertainties were significantly reduced with respect to 7TV analysis. Um, this is uh, uh, one of the most precise measurements, uh, although the, uh, there are still uh, combined uh, lab plus SLD results, which have better uh, precision, and, but uh, hopefully with the uh, high, um, high luminosity LHC and the upgrade of the CMS, one can uh, get even more precise measurement and uh, those estimations are described in the, um, uh, in the table below and uh, more details are available on the um, on the paper uh, on the, in the note uh, listed uh, on the slide. To conclude, uh, I would like to say that uh, high precision measurement, including weak mixing angle, are uh, available and carried out with the CMS experiment. Some channels are analyzed at uh, 13 TV, including the Z cross section, Brownian differential invariant mass cross section. And the others, uh, the uh, standard model predictions are testing, including weak mixing angle, asymmetry, forward backward asymmetry, Drellian angle coefficients, uh, Lampton relation, and the others. Then these measurements provide unvaluable constraining power on PDFs, in particular to PDFs. Thank you for your attention. 
It's a lot for design nice talk, uh, Ilya. Um, I see a question by Xingu Li. Please go ahead. Yes, so can you go to page four? So do you know which PDF set you're using here? It's the... uh, an, NLO, uh, an NLO PDF uh, no, version three. Uh, PDF set. Okay, did you know? It? Okay, um, then, um, so page 11, I don't quite understand how CMS can reach rapidity greater than 2.4. Uh, this is, uh, um, uh, this measurement is done with the, HF uh, Hadron forward calorimeter uh, of the CMS, which is outside of the uh, um, tracker uh, acceptance and uh, which uh, um, and, uh, but can still can be used to uh, extract, uh, to measure AFB. Okay, interesting, thanks. Uh, there, there are large uh, system. Uh, there are some systematic uncertainties, and uh, um, there are um, large corrections applied to these measurements. But uh, still, we believe it is uh, very valuable, being uh, of uh, uh, large uh, um, be, being done in large uh, rapidity region where the dilution effect uh, significantly reduced. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Okay, so I have time for just a quick question, if there is. Uh, if not, thanks again, Lia. Uh, the next speaker is uh, uh, Queen Wang. Uh, she talk about Drawian production at NLO in the part of bridge method. Uh, oh. Okay, okay, I see your slides. Okay. Let's start um, whenever you're ready. Thank Thanks. Thank you for the nice chance to present the Drawian production in quantum branching method at uh, low and high Drawian Mars. So I will quickly introduce the TMD and the pattern branching method and focus on its application in the dry yam production. So uh, the TMD, it is uh, the transverse momentum dependent pattern distributions. Uh, the transverse momentum effects are naturally coming from the intrinsic KT and the pattern shower. And with this new uh, approach, pattern branching method, one can uh, determine the integrated PDF from the pattern branching solution of evolution equation. And it could cover all the transverse momentum from the small KT to large KT, as well as a large range uh, in X and mu squared. And so it's a novel method to solve evolution equations. And besides, it could also determine the TMDs. Since each branching is generated explicitly, energy momentum conservation is fulfilled and the transverse momentum distributions can be obtained. So, and as for the fit, we use the X filter and uh, use the data from the HERA. Um, and the more details you can find in Saha's talk uh, on Tuesday. And the nice thing of it is, it can be easily extend to include any other measurement for the feet. So here I just show two TMD distributions. One is on the left is for the up quark and the right is a gluon at the energy scale 100 GeV with a small x like 0.01. In the plot, there are two curves represent two uh, different set, one is uh, PT ordering and another is uh, angular ordering. And we could see that uh, the difference of these two different sets are uh, essentially only in the low KT region. Uh, as, as for the uncertainty, the experimental and model uncertainty are obtained from the fit, which is quite small. Uh, small. And at uh, the low KT, the uncertainty from the 
CKT is uh, sizable. So now we, we move to the applications. So uh, from now on, the prediction I'm talking about is uh, with MC at NLO with TMD. So we use MC at, at NLO to generate the hard process while the soft and the collinear parts from the next leading order is, uh, are subtracted. And then we add it back by TMD. So, and we call it uh, MC at NLO with pattern branching. And we could see in the plot that we compare the prediction with the measurement of the dry in at ATV. And the data is from, is the black point is data and is from uh, Atlas. Uh, the blue and the red curve are the uh, PBTMDs. And uh, if you look at the ratio between the prediction and data, we could see that uh, the TMD with AMC at NIO describe the low QT region very well and with very small uncertainties. Uh, while the scale uncertainty is uh, sizable, but it's uh, coming from um, the hard process. And you may notice in the plot that at large QT, um, like the prediction uh, is a little like uh, underestimated the, the data because we miss the contribution from high order. And here from the pink curve, which is the dragon plus one jet, and we could see if we just add it, it's if this could contribute for the high PT of the dragon. And the more details actually is covered in Amando's talk. So, and here I just uh, cite one plot from him. So if we add the, the, the dragon with high order, we could see like uh, the, the, discrim uh, the, the, the high PT region is, is much better, which is the blue curve in the small figure below. And next slide. So we also compare the predictions with uh, the dragon at a certain TV with the data from um, CMS. And besides the TMD, they also compared with other predictions uh, as response or Geneva. And we could see that at uh, the low PT region, the TMD provide very good uh, description, while at the large region, uh, like we need a high order matrix element. And this is already correct because now we, we managed to uh, add high order now. And uh, the uncertainty in the pattern branching method is mainly uh, from the scale of the matrix element. So besides, we also look at the low mass and the low energy scale. And at the low mass, there is a very little room for the QCD evolution. Uh, and the PT of the drain is dominated by the interesting KT and the soft groans, which need to be resumed. And uh, so we try to compare with the uh, uh, latest uh, measurement from Phoenix at uh, energy scale 200 GeV uh, and the low dry in Mars around 5 GeV. And uh, two other older measurements are also compared at the energy scale, the 62 or 38 GeV. So we were wondering uh, if the part of branching method with AMC and O can apply on the small energy scale. Because uh, the, uh, last year there was a paper to declare that there is a, a small PT crisis. So we were wondering if we could do it. <clears throat> On this slide, so we compared the predictions with uh, these uh, three measurements at different energy scale. And uh, so the blue red curve are the, part, the, the PBTMDs with the band represents the different uh, uncertainties. And we could see the mass distribution is well described by the, the PB uh, TMDs. And uh, if we look uh, just at the first plot, there is one more prediction is an NPDF, the blue curve. And it looks slightly better because they have more uh, like PDF to, to feed the constraint. So, we could conclude that it's, uh, it's sensitive only to the collinear PDF. And uh, at the, very, the, the smallest uh, energy scale, a uh, large uh, X can be approved by uh, part branching method. 
but the the PDFs since we use only fit to the higher data, so it is not well constrained at the large X. And next slide. So we are looking at uh, the dry EMPT spectrum uh, in, the, uh, in this three experiment. Um, and uh, for the Mars, it's uh, around 5 GeV. And we could see that uh, like uh, uh, in, a, in a PT range less than 5 GeV, uh, the measurement is uh, with very, like uh, the, the PT spectrum is well described by the pattern branching mass. Oh, Quinn, are you, are you there? Seems so. Uh... Hello, Quinn, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. It seems I lost your audio for, 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 for a minute or so. So, so excuse but me. But now it's okay. I... Yeah, 12. Okay. Okay. Uh, okay, go ahead. Now I hear. Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. So I, I just, uh, so I mean, so on the 12 is uh, the PT spectrum or drying compared with this three measurement. I mean, you could see that the drying PT spectrum is well described by the pattern branching uh, TMDs. And we do not see this small PT crisis, which I cited in the backup. And uh, very good agreement with the uncertainty and with very small. Uh, k square is 1.27. So now I think we, we can go to uh, the, the conclusion. So um, for, the, for the application uh, in the dry -in from the pattern branching TMD, the dry -in QT spectrum uh, can be approved with, without new parameters and uh, it agrees uh, well with the result from LHC at a uh, low PT. Region. And the dry NQD spectrum at uh, low Mars and the low energy scale is also well described by the PBTMD. And we could see, uh, see uh, it's a success of the pattern branching TMDs with MC at IO, which can describe the dry production over a wide range. And uh, it could be a proper prediction of low PT spectrum, which is needed for the W mass determination. determination. And uh, I think that's all. Thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot for this very nice talk. Um, so we have a question by Wen Chen. Please go ahead. Oh, yes. Um, uh, in one of the slides, you, you say you actually uh, construct your, your uh, things using the X feature. So the first question is, do you include this uh, like a new C A sixty six the Q T uh, data in your uh, fitting. Here you say you include the yeah, data I, point. So are, are all of this data you show in the fixed target? Uh, are they already in inside your database for your X feature fitting? I don't know it by heart. Maybe uh, Hannes or Saha, could you comment on it? But uh, from my remember, I don't think so. I think only Harry. Uh, the, the, in the fit, it's only HERA data, the high energy HERA data. So no new C trillion data were included in the fit. So how, how can this PT information, so how in, in this low PT, how uh, <laughs> Uh, in principle, for this TMD, people need to get some kind of a PT spectra as an input in order to really get it, because all of this is non-perturbative effect. So I'm, I'm curious how this non-perturbative effect is uh, described in your framework, how, how you obtain this information. It cannot be simply come from 2CD evolution effect. No, there's one one piece when which comes from the the intrinsic KT distribution, which is parametrized, 
but everything else is coming from the perturbative evolution. Mm -hmm. So the Sorry, intrinsic second. the intrinsic KT is is a Gauss distribution with a width of 500 MeV, which we determined for the the high energy uh, LHC measurement. And then the same thing is used to describe the low energy data. Yeah. Sorry, second quick question is, can you apply your framework for calculate the angle distribution for Joe Yan? I guess so, yes. Thank you. And, uh, th this is Ilya Garbunov. Can I ask one more question? Yeah, yeah. okay. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, I'm. I see you. Uh, you 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 you, are you nicely describe uh, the CMS uh, uh, PT spectrum, ZPT spectrum slide number eight. Uh, but did you consider using uh, for for those measurements? There are also measurements of the phi star available. FISTAR is essentially the PT distribution, but uh, with the lower, um, uh, with, uh, with better resolution available. Um, did you consider using, uh, st studying the phi distribution? Yes, uh, thank you. And uh, actually the FISTAR is also included in the paper. So, I mean, so we also pr could produce a five star. And uh, uh, I, I do not remember if we compared uh, the predictions with uh, the CMS data yet. I think it's even in the CMS paper, if I start comparison. Okay, thanks again. Uh, very nice talk. Uh, if there are no further questions, we'll move to the next speaker, um, Marco Meyer Conde. We'll talk about area measurements uh, by compass. Okay, I see your slide. Perfect. Hi, so this is Marco yeah. speaking. Um, I'm giving a talk today about the, the dry land measurement at uh, compass on behalf of the collaboration. So the outline of this talk is presented here. I will quickly go through the experimental setup before discussing the results, uh, namely polarized Drelian, unpolarized uh, Drelian, and double jet type production. So um, the experiment was earlier presented by Polulini. Uh, so I will quickly go through the Drelian specificities only. Uh, however, um, uh, this is compass is a two-stage spectrometer of 50, 60 meter long. Uh, the picture is bottom right. Uh, in 2015 and 18, compass used um, nadron beam made of 97% uh, negatively charged pion um, to measure Dralian. Um, and uh, this setup uh, has two main hardware features, namely the polarized target and the hadron absorber. So that's what we are going to see in the next slide very quickly. Uh, so first, the dilution refrigerator is capable of cooling down uh, the polarized target to few millikelvin. The targets are in the picture bottom left uh, in yellow. Uh, there are two targets and they are made of a mixture between uh, um, solid NH3 bits uh, in a liquid helium bath. Uh, this low temperature is used in order to keep the high polarization of the proton spin about 70% uh, to uh, study uh, transversely polarized asymmetry. So um, uh, on the other hand, uh, on the right hand side picture, you have the absorber in purple. Um, it is an alumina structure uh, with a tungsten core positioned downstream of uh, the polarized target. Uh, moreover, it contains two active material, aluminum and tungsten used as targets for uh, physics analysis. Um, in the past, COMPASS measured non-zero asymmetries uh, of the spin structure of the nucleon using the, uh, the CDIS uh, channel. And today the purpose is to measure uh, the same asymmetries uh, using the same apparatus 
um, uh, but uh, through the Dryan uh, process. Uh, thanks to symmetry uh, between those process, uh, time symmetry, uh, the idea is to verify uh, fundamental features of the CMD uh, PDF factorization in QCD. And um, so the Dryan process is on the right hand side picture. Uh, it's a, it's a time-like process involving two hadrons in the initial state here. And uh, it has the advantage compared to uh, GIS to be a clean electromagnetic process and not involve a uh, fragmentation function. Uh, here, uh, as we have two hadrons, um, uh, one is coming from the target and the second one from uh, the pion. And we can, um, of course, uh, probe a wide range for the negatively charged pion PDF. Um, so due to the uh, correlation between Dralian and Cilis and the time odd nature of, of uh, the previously quoted uh, non-zero asymmetry, uh, one expects in the theory uh, sign change, and that's what, uh, what, what we are uh, aiming to uh, claim here. Uh, so um, additionally, uh, there is, uh, using the same apparatus, um, an overlapping region in uh, X and uh, Q square. So uh, we aim to have um, a minimization of uh, Q square evolution effect here. Uh, so at, at compass, the kinematical coverage can be divided here for this talk into two parts. Uh, on the on first, uh, charmonia mass range. On the other hand, uh, high mass uh, range. Uh, here in the picture, bottom left, we do bottom left which, which is showing the uh, mass spectrum of the daimion. Um, so uh, in the sketch, the hadronic interaction is shown um, in the target rest frame and uh, the phi sievers, phi s, is the angle between the uh, transverse component of the spin and uh, the QT. Um, again, um, bottom right, you see a plot which is um, the, the Birken uh, of the pion and the Birken of, of the target. And uh, as I mentioned before, uh, we have a quite wide range uh, to, to, to probe uh, that would help also understanding the pion PDF. So um, at leading twist, uh, the spin nucleon structure is parameterized by eight uh, twisted two TMD PDFs. On the picture on, on the right hand side for this talk, the uh, main contributor are uh, transversely nucleon spin polarization, um, more precisely the non-zero uh, amplitude uh, function, uh, sievers uh, for uh, unpolarized quark. Um, and uh, the single spin Dryan cross-section is defined here in the slide. Um, and expected uh, to uh, be uh, proportional to amplitude coefficients uh, that are shown uh, in the bottom of the slide. So those amplitudes are a convolution of the TMD PDF and split it into three parts. Uh, first, unpolarized asymmetry, uh, which is uh, still uh, ongoing analysis at COMPASS. Uh, this will help also to understand um, the, 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 the non uh, the lamp-tung relation and uh, uh, might provide some input. Uh, about this. On the other hand, you have also a uh, transverse asymmetry, uh, namely sievers pretelosity and transversity function, and uh, also a sub twist amplitude. So uh, now switching to uh, the first results, uh, the results of the, um, um, of the amplitude is, is, is assuming sign change here and gives uh, the, the following uh, results. Uh, so the different amplitudes are on the left and um, um, for the sievers, uh, we can um, we can see good compatibility between 2015 and 2018 uh, uh, results. So they are um, about um, 0.2 points, about 0.7 times uh, the, the, stat the systematics are about 0.7 times the statistical uncertainty, and are indicated in the plots uh, by uh, color bands. Uh, I also wanted to uh, highlight the, the, the sievers asymmetry here, which is which is non-zero, and uh, assuming sign change, uh, you you have here uh, in red uh, the data points um, uh, of published by Compass, compared with uh, three different uh, theoretical approach, um, uh, which assume sign change for sievers uh, function. Uh, these results are preliminary uh, for 2018, and uh, actually it's only 50% of the total statistics. Uh, so in the end, I wanted to highlight also uh, in the bottom uh, right plot uh, the different um, uh, asymmetries. asymmetries. Um, so the first one, Sievers, uh, which shows a positive sign uh, below, um, uh, above zero, uh, about uh, one sigma, uh, that will help understanding um, uh, sign change. Uh, the second one, um, which is uh, non-zero, uh, below zero, um, 
uh, above uh, two sigma, and that would uh, help understanding the universality of nucleon um, transversely uh, transversity function. Third one, uh, the pre-velocity, which is uh, near zero, and uh, the two last subleading twists, which are also compatible with zero, uh, and this is kind of expected because of the uh, subleading uh, nature. Uh, I would like now to uh, switch uh, to uh, unpolarized results. And um, so the, the unpolarized studies are currently in full swing and we aim to, uh, in the future to publish absolute cross section on different targets. At this time, we have projection of, of statistical uncertainty, uh, mainly on NH3 um, and also tungsten. In this picture, uh, you see the results um, of the projection uh, for COMPASS, uh, the projected un statistical uncertainty for two bin in mass using tungsten targets. Uh, this is compared uh, with the uh, results from uh, also E615 uh, and uh, DYNNLO simulation at NLO. And um, we aim in the future to have uh, better uh, systematic uncertainty compared to uh, past experiments, uh, meaning uh, below 10%. Uh, still in the scope of, of um, unpolarized Drelian and Jepsai, uh, the A dependence results uh, are also expected in, in the near future. Uh, as we collected results on three different targets, um, uh, we expect to uh, provide those results soon. And uh, currently, the statistical projections are shown for um, uh, the ratio between tungsten and NH3 uh, on the right hand side picture uh, as a function of uh, the X uh, target. Uh, this result in uh, black points uh, are a combination of 2015 and 18 data from COMPASS and uh, compare with uh, different results from NA10 uh, that was uh, an experience in the past uh, doing uh, some similar measurements. So following the EPBS extraction uh, of the PDF, we could contribute in the future to, to modification of the uh, proton-free uh, PDF uh, induced by the uh, nuclear corrective factor here. Uh, as shown in the formula. This will help to contribute to uh, the understanding of non-perturbative effect, as well as correlation with QT and underlying jet type process. So um, uh, I also wanted to show you here a picture of uh, the Hermes wall data and the sensitivity of the compass apparatus in the corresponding range um, um, for, for Trillian in that case, as compared to Hermes uh, in DIS. So along, along the line of the JEPSI, I would like now to just finish this talk and um, uh, discuss a few results about the uh, double JEPSI production um, that was studied uh, at, at COMPASS very recently. So the double JEPSI production, uh, long story short, uh, can, can be obtained from three different ways, uh, either introducing a charm uh, process, um, a single parton scattering, and uh, double parton scattering. The measurement was first uh, done uh, by NA3 experiment, which was also using a negative discharge uh, ion, which was also a fixed target experiment. Uh, however, uh, the published results was um, uh, the, the results was, were published uh, without uh, acceptance correction, which makes uh, the interpretation uh, more complex. Um, so at, here at Compass, uh, we uh, study the, the, the double jet type production, and um, uh, the measurement of the cross section of double jet type production is shown uh, on the right hand side, the ratio uh, first um, uh, between STS and DPS, uh, but also the cross section results for the three different targets. Uh, the systematics are about 25% uh, here, and com but comparable with the statistics. And um, these results can be compared with directly NA3 uh, results. Um, um, so um, in, in the case of the COMPASS data, um, the, the COMPASS data are um, uh, well describing the SPS and uh, intrinsic uh, charm uh, model. Uh, SPS appeared to be, uh, as shown on the bottom right plot, appeared to be a dominant uh, mechanism here, while uh, DPS uh, is expected to be strongly suppressed at uh, fixed uh, target energy. So uh, finally, to summarize, um, uh, here at Compass, we uh, measure uh, two years of data taking, and uh, half of the statistics for 2015 uh, remains to be uh, published. Soon, I introduce you also, uh, I show you some results about uh, the single spin asymmetries uh, and the ongoing an uh, analysis uh, for unpolarized trillion. Uh, so, uh, ending with this double jet type production. So, thank you for your attention. 
Thanks a lot for this nice presentation. Uh, is there any question to, to Marco? Hannes, please go ahead. Yes, I have a question on the unpolarized uh, trillion studies. Um, mm -hmm. do, do you plan also to have a PT uh, distribution of unpolarized trillions at some stage? <laughs> So just um, in light of the talk from, yeah. from Chung before it would be interesting. Yes, exactly. Yes, I think that Compass can contribute uh, quite a lot uh, here. Uh, in some sense, um, a goal would be to publish the correlation between x Feynman and PT, as well as um, uh, root square of tau and uh, PT. Yes. Well, this would be great. Thanks a lot. OK, David. Yes, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, good. I was wondering this conclusion uh, in your summary that intrinsic charm is uh, negligible. If you go back to slide 12, your uh, red line has both no SPS and intrinsic charm. So why do you say that the data does not support intrinsic charm? I mean, with these statistical uncertainties, you cannot tell, no? Can you? Uh, co correct. Yes. Uh, I was, I was uh, indeed comparing uh, SPS and uh, intrinsic charm model here in red. Um, however, the um, uh, interesting charm contribution in, in blue here is quite low. So um, uh, I wanted to highlight that, right, a single uh, part of scattering is here main con the main contributor here. But uh, it remains compatible within error bar. Okay. Okay, is there any other question to Marco? Otherwise we move to the next speaker, Jennifer uh, Roloff, who is uh, now switch subjects to uh, so measurement of jet substructure and jet fragmentations in the, in the atlas detector. Okay, Great. I see the slides whenever we're ready. Thanks. Okay, very good. Yep, so today I'm going to be talking about uh, measurements of jet substructure and jet fragmentation uh, with ATLAS. So before I dive into the measurements, I think it's useful to take a, a moment to talk about why we're interested in doing these measurements. Um, so first off, jet substructure provides uh, an insight into QCD across multiple scales. So you can, in a single measurement, understand everything from your fixed order effects to your parton showers to your hadronization. Uh, in addition, I mean, at the LHC, we uh, use jets in many of our analyses, um, and for these, uh, we require Monte Carlo generators to model our jets. Um, and this is the dominant source of uncertainties for a lot of analyses, and in particular, our modeling of gluons is particularly poor. Uh, so if we have a better understanding of jet formation, um, if we have more measurements of, uh, of QCD at these different scales, this can go into providing better models of jets and better tuning of uh, the different models that are available. And then finally, if we do understand jets better, of course, this can also lead to better observables for our tagging, uh, which is relevant for everything from quark gluon tagging to uh, W and top tagging, uh, as well as Higgs tagging. So the first measurement I want to talk about today is a measurement of jet fragmentation. Um, so jet fragmentation is kind of the first uh, types of substructure measurements that have been uh, done. They've been done for many years now. Um, and uh, essentially what these look at is looking at the distribution of particles within a jet. Uh, so there are many different types of observables you can measure. Uh, this includes uh, the number of charged particles or the number of particles, the radial profile, and many, thing more, many mo more things. Uh, these aren't calculable, but their energy dependence is calculable with perturbation theory. Uh, and these are important inputs to tuning Monte Carlo. Uh, and you can see in the plot here of the average number of charged particles as a function of the jet PT, you can see that there are some significant disagreements between data and Monte Carlo, uh, motivating measurements like this to help with the tuning. Um, so uh, the measurement that was done recently at 13 TeV on Atlas uh, this is done using uh, tracks within a jet, so charged particles. Uh, this is because it gives very precise measurements of the substructure of a jet. Uh, and one th interesting thing to note is that um, the jet fragmentation doesn't depend strongly on eta, just on the initiating parton. So if you have a gluon initiated jet, it looks you know, about the same if you have it produced very centrally or very forward. 
Um, but the uh, fraction of gluon or cork jets changes as a function of eta because of the parton distribution functions. So you can see in the plot um, on the, the right, the fraction of uh, jets which are initiated by gluons. Um, so you can see that more central jets tend to be more gluon dominated than the forward jets. Uh, and uh, since cork and gluon jets look a little bit different, uh, this results in different um, distributions of these uh, fragmentation, jet fragmentation functions uh, as uh, a function of eta. So you can see in the bottom a plot of the average number of charged particles um, for more forward and more central jets. And you can see that as you might expect, uh, the more central jets, which are the more gluon-like ones, uh, have more charged particles because gluons tend to radiate more. Um, so this is one handle on understanding the behavior of gluon jets, which as I mentioned before, is very important for our understanding of the modeling of jets. Uh, but you can go one step further actually, and you can actually extract the underlying quark and gluon uh, distributions. Um, so like I said, since uh, the actual fragmentation doesn't depend on the uh, eta uh, region that you're in, it only depends on the initiating parton. Uh, you can imagine that these distributions are a linear combination of the quark and gluon distributions multiplied by the uh, fraction of quark and gluons. So if you look at the number of charged particles distribution, it should be you know, the quark uh, distribution times the quark fraction plus the gluon distribution times the gluon fraction. So this is simply a linear equation and you can invert this if you have two measurements in different eta regions uh, with different quark and gluon fractions. Um, and so you can do this, uh, you can do this inversion to produce your quark and gluon distributions uh, determined by a Monte Carlo uh, generator uh, where you get the quark and gluon fractions from, for example, Pythia. Uh, in, uh, in addition, I can't talk about this too much here, but um, one other possibility uh, for doing this is using topic modeling, which extracts the distributions um, using some sort of minimization process. Uh, and essentially, you know, it, it doesn't require any sort of uh, model input into the quark and gluon fractions. And so it's able to do this in a much more model independent way. Uh, and you can see the results of this on the next slide, um, where you can see the uh, extracted quark and gluon distributions, um, as well as the kind of underlying quark and gluon uh, distributions as given by the Pythia labels. Uh, and you can see that both of these methods uh, provide very similar results um, for the underlying, the extracted quark and gluon distributions and uh, look very nice. Um, so this is the first time we've used topic modeling in a measurement. Um, which is, I think, a very uh, exciting way forward to produce uh, more model independent ways of extracting this information. So on to the next uh, topic. Um, so um, one interesting thing about substructure uh, observables is uh, that in general, they're not typically calculable. So uh, this is because you have contributions from non-global logarithms, uh, which make it very difficult to produce uh, accurate calculations. Um, but uh, there is a type of grooming algorithm where grooming algorithms remove soft and wide angle radiation from a jet. Um, and uh, soft drop in particular does this in a very theoretically nice way. So it removes uh, any contributions from these non-global logarithms, meaning that you're actually able to produce accurate calculations beyond leading logarithmic, logarithmic accuracy. Um, and so uh, we did a measurement of the soft drop jet mass in die jet events. Um, we actually measured the relative jet mass instead of the mass directly because this reduces your dependence on the PT of the jet. For quark and gluon jets, your mass uh, scales uh, with PT um, since you have more radiation. Um, and in addition, uh, we used the logarithmic scale for the re uh, in order to get better access to what's called the resummation region, um, where these non-global logarithms would have been relevant. And instead, you have the logarithmic uh, logarithms that are dominant. So we're measuring rho, which is log of m squared over pt squared. And you can see an example here of the, the measurement of the jet mass uh, compared to three different calculations. So um, an NNLL, an NLO plus NLL, and an LO plus NNLL. Um, and it's interesting to look at this. There's uh, some interesting features that you can note. So uh, you can divide this into three different regions, uh, the non-perturbative region, the resummation region, and the fixed order region. In the non-perturbative region, uh, the uh, analog predictions do not agree very well with your data, but they're also not designed to work very well here. This is not where you would expect them to behave properly. In the, re uh, the resummation region, this is where the uh, logarithm is coming to play. And you can see that there's very good agreement uh, between all of the analytical predictions um, and the uh, unfolded data. 
Then finally, in the fixed order region, um, you can see that, uh, for instance, the NLO plus NLL prediction agrees much better than the LO plus NNLL prediction. This is because the fixed order effects are very important here. Um, and uh, so obviously the NLO is uh, going to provide a better uh, understanding of this region. Uh, you can do a similar trick here where you extract the cork and the gluon distributions for these as well. Um, this is done using uh, the plot. Um, the plot I'm showing here is done using a track-based measurement instead of the calorimeter-based measurement. So this can't be compared to calculations, but it does provide a much uh, better precision for the jet mass. Um, and one interesting thing about the jet mass in particular is that in the resummation region, so in this kind of middle mass region, uh, the slope of this uh, distribution is pro proportional to alpha s times the color factor. So as you would expect, the gluon slope is larger than the cork slope because it has a larger color factor. Um, and you can kind of see a nice, uh, yeah, nice little slope here uh, that, um, yeah, is related to alpha s. Um, this is currently done using the linear extraction. So there is some model dependence in this based on the cork and gluon labels from Pythia. Um, and the dominant uncertainty is the jet modeling um, as well. Uh, so finally, I want to talk about um, one final measurement that we did of the Lund jet plane. Um, and so this is a fairly new uh, idea for an observable. Um, and uh, yeah, the measurement came out earlier this year. Um, so you can imagine a jet as a, uh, an approximation uh, um, as a series of soft emissions around a hard core, where the hard core represents your originating cork or gluon. And you can characterize these emissions. I mean, there's a couple of ways you can characterize them, but one way you can do this is using Z which is the relative momentum of the emission with respect to the jet core, and delta R, which is the angle of emissions with uh, relative to the jet core. And the re reason that this is very nice is that this factorizes different effects into different regions of this two-dimensional plane. Um, so just like the jet mass, where you had these three different regions, you have a, a similar sort of effect for the Lund plane. Um, the reason the jet mass uh, exhibited some of the same behavior is because it's actually just a line in this plane. So what happens if we measure the whole thing? So we measured the two-dimensional Lund jet plane in uh, diejet events, uh, again, using tracks in order to have a higher precision um, and unfolded to the charged particle level here. Uh, there's a lot of physics information in this uh, picture, but it's uh, you know too much to get into in a short talk here. Um, so instead, what can be useful is to look at a single slice of this. So for instance, if we take a slice in Z, and we look at this, we can actually see the uncertainties and the comparison to different Monte Carlo generators. So um, here you can see a comparison to six different Monte Carlo generators. Uh, and these six were chosen with a reason. So the Powhag and the Pythia, um, these have the different you know, fixed order calculation, um, but the rest, of the, uh, the rest of it is the same. Um, for the Sherpa, um, this has different uh, hadronization models, so, uh, but everything else is the same. So the parton shower and the fixed order calculation is the same. Uh, and then finally, for the Herwig, you have two different parton showers. Um, so uh, you know, the hadronization and the fixed order is the same, but the parton shower should look different. So you can neatly see this factorization here. So in um, the, uh, the wide angle region um, where you have the hard and wide angle emissions, you expect the parton shower effects to be really dominant. And this is exactly what we see. Um, whereas when, when you move to the more hard collinear region where you expect the uh, non-perturbative effects to be large, such as hadronization, um, you see large differences between the two different Sherpa models um, and very small differences between the other, other uh, Monte Carlos. And so this, this nicely demonstrates the um, power of this factorization in being able to understand our jets. So just to sum up, uh, jet substructure measurements are a really powerful tool for understanding QCD across multiple scales. Um, and uh, we can now do, uh, we now have uh, comparisons of measurements and theoretical predictions for certain substructure observables um, based on um, advances in different grooming algorithms. And uh, one powerful thing about a lot of these is the uh, separation of different physical effects uh, into different regions of a measurement. So you can actually see where different uh, parts of QCD are coming into play uh, within a single measurement. And these measurements are gonna be really important moving forward uh, in understanding the behavior of gluons much better, which is going to be important to help us move towards uh, precision for the HLHC. 
um, and things such as topic modeling will help to allow for more model and independent extractions of this behavior. Thanks. Okay, thanks a lot. Very nice presentation measurements. Um, David, I see your, your hand raised. Is it, uh, do you have a question or we just kept from the um, Yes, yes, I okay, have a ahead. question. Um, okay, nice talk. Ahead. Can you please go back to slide 17? Um, where is the Pohek plus Pythia here? Where does it show? I cannot read it off. I, I mean, you said that these have the different, um, the same order in, in, in fixed order accuracy, but that's not true. No Pohek, it's an law. Uh, whereas Sherpa and Herwig are... No, I said they have different fixed order calculations. Uh, sorry. Okay, yeah. so what is the POHEC here? It I lies right on it. top of the Pythia, actually. Um, uh, so you can see, for instance, here you can see that they are slightly, slightly different. Um, but this is part of the factorization effect that I was talking about, where uh, the um, fixed order calculation shouldn't be very important in either of these two regions, and so you don't see large differences between the Pythia and the Pauheg plus Pythia, um, which is yeah exactly what you'd expect uh, based on how this plane is divided. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Okay, thanks. So we have time for another question. Idia? Oh, this is Idia Gurbunov. Um, I have a question regarding um, glue, um, glue, gluon identification, core gluon discrimination. Um, are you aware of the rock curves uh, for gluon identification and the, can you compare those ones uh, for Atlas and CMS who have uh, better working points uh, available and uh, if you now the ways to improve uh, the uh, super, uh, discrimination power. So yeah, um, I guess the measurements we're doing here aren't directly trying to improve our cork glue on taggers, um, but you know I think a lot of this stuff will help reduce our uncertainties on these, which are quite large because our gluon modeling is very bad. Um, and so it, by getting better models of our gluons, it will help make these tigers a lot better um, for both Atlas and CMS. Thank you. Okay, thanks again to, uh, to Jennifer. If there's no uh, other question, we move to the next speaker. So Denise uh, Sunasasi will talk about uh, jet substructure and booster jet measurements at, uh, at CMS. Okay, I see your slide. Okay. Please start whenever you're ready. Thank you. Thank you very much, Antonio. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Denise Sunarciaci. Uh, I'm going to talk about the jet substructure and boosted jet measurements at CMS on behalf of the CMS collaboration. Um, Okay, uh, let me just give you a kind of a reminder about the main goal of the QCD studies that is to improve our detailed description of the standard model physics. And as we all know that the QCD is the theory of strong interactions describing the interactions between the quarks and the gluons. And uh, since the experimental signature of quarks and gluons, which are the jets, they are abundantly produced at the LHC. And one can easily say that uh, jet is, uh, LHC is a kind of a jet factory. So uh, it is very important to have a look at the solid and uh, insightful description of jets and their substructure uh, relies on the deep understanding of the dynamics of strong interactions in collider experiments like uh, LHC. Um, better knowledge of jet substructure will help to improve precision measurements involving jets beyond standard model searches with boosted objects, flavor tagging, as well as pileup identification. 
um, uh, the most commonly used JET algorithms are actually the cone algorithms as well as the sequential algorithms. In the sequential JET clustering algorithms, which is based on the concept of the jets are the product of the uh, successive parton branchings. And in this algorithm, it is defined with uh, interparticle distance, which is denoted here with the ij and the beam distance with uh, the iv. Uh, there is here is a one free parameter, which is called p uh, and the behavior is controlled with this parameter. And it can have uh, uh, these, three param uh, these three values according to the algorithms. Um, here you can see that uh, there are two uh, um, figures are shown in here. Uh, jets are obtained on the left hand side the cam with the Cambridge Aachen uh, algorithm when the radius uh, is equal to one. On the right hand side, the jets are obtained with the anti KT algorithm. Um, the shaded uh, regions here uh, correspond to the catchment area of each jet and uh, I just would like to emphasize that typical choice for the CM within the CMS for the jets are the cone size is uh, 0 0.4 or in some analysis 0 0.8 is used. Um, for the uh, jets with substructure, uh, typically is called grooming. Uh, in these algorithms, uh, which are used to remove the soft uh, contributions and especially the large angle uh, soft radiation of the jet and underlying plant activities and uh, to focus on the heart uh, structure of the jet. Uh, grooming makes comparison easier with theoretical calculation though uh, we can remove the large uh, logarithms by using uh, this. Uh, for the modified mass drop tagger um, uh, which can uh, which is a kind of a tool to isolate the uh, um, boosted Higgs bosons decaying into BB bar pairs and uh, from the QCD background uh, by using the condition uh, given with, uh, uh, with this item. So uh, there are uh, various experimental jet uh, substructure observables such as I picked up a couple of them here and I'm going to focus the, the shared momentum fraction uh, which is kind uh, which is uh, also uh, kind of a um, uh, observable that uh, can, if it has a value of uh, 0 0.5, uh, one can identify two hard subjects. And if it has a smaller value, uh, as you can see, one hard uh, subject can be identified. And there are some other jet substructure observables like heart splitting, opening angle, RG, and boom jet radius. And one another is the groom jet mass. This uh, observable depends on opening angle. And when it has a small mass, uh, there are collimated jets having with few constituents inside. When uh, it has a larger mass, uh, we have a broader jet uh, having with uh, many constituents inside. Um, for the uh, soft, uh, in soft drop grooming, the goal is to find two hardest substructures inside the jet. So here, as you can see, uh, the jets are uh, measured with uh, anti-KT uh, algorithm and it is rec reconstructed with anti-KT anti jet algorithm. And then uh, reclustered is uh, done with the uh, Cambridge Aachen scheme to create a pairwise uh, tree of subjects. Uh, subjects, uh, then uh, if it fails this condition, the soft, which is called soft drop condition, uh, as you can see here, uh, if it fails, uh, it, uh, it is removed from the algorithm, uh, from the process, and then uh, the, it co the process continues until the uh, branching passes. And, and uh, uh, when this uh, CA finishes, uh, the cluster uh, iteratively starting from the last step, on the right hand side of this uh, slide, uh, the kinematic diagram uh, in terms of two variables, Z cut and the R0 uh, are, are shown here. As you can see, this is the area for the soft drop uh, when the beta uh, is uh, above the zero and when it has a beta equal to zero is, uh, uh, this is the collinear uh, area and this is the beta uh, less than zero. Uh, this is the area, so the main uh, interest in the soft uh, drop part here. Okay, let me come to the uh, measurements that we have performed uh, with the CMS detector. This is the measurement uh, of the differential jet cross section, which are determined uh, as a function of the ungroomed and the groomed jets, uh, jet mass in die jet events. 
uh, and in bins of PT. Uh, this is the PT region uh, I have picked up in here for the two one. On the left hand side, you see the ungroomed uh, jet mass, and the right hand side, the groomed jet mass MG as a function of the uh, differential cross section. Uh, what we can see in here is the higher systematical uncertainties uh, observed uh, for the ungroomed rather than the groomed jets. And uh, when we look at the grooming algorithm, we see clearly see that uh, this, uh, this um, grooming algorithm considerably lowers the jet mass and suppresses the uh, stucco peak. Uh, in this uh, measurement, uh, improves the precision by remo removing contamination from soap particles and the, and the pileup events. Uh, for the normalized cross sections, uh, which is shown also for the ungroup on the left hand side and the groom jet mass uh, for the all PT bins starting from 200 and above uh, 1300 GV, just for a uh, clear uh, or better visualization, the data uh, points are multiplied with a scale factor here. Uh, for uh, for generally speaking, uh, the theoretical predictions uh, agree with uh, measured cross sections within the uncertainties for masses uh, from 10% to 30% of the uh, transverse momentum of the jet. Okay, uh, so uh, as we are interested in the jet substructure and, and why don't we have a look at the TT bar events? Because we know that the top core pair events are abundantly produced at the LAC and it is a very good trope, uh, probe for uh, jet substructure measurements since they have very rich final states having uh, light quarks, B quarks, gluon with high PT boosted W and top. And it uh, uh, such kind of events also has high purity and relative orthogonal, events, uh, orthogonal event selection criteria. In the following slides, uh, uh, the lepton plus jets event samples uh, uh, as uh, used uh, in the measurements. Okay, uh, this is the one of the measurements that we have uh, published. Uh, actually, we have made uh, various, in, in this publication, uh, various uh, observables measured, uh, listed in here. Um, and the all jet, uh, all jet substructure observables uh, have been measured uh, not only for inclusive jets, but also for bottom quarks and for samples enriched with light quarks uh, or, and uh, gluon jets. Uh, on, the, on the right hand side of the slide, the distribution of charge multiplicity relevant for uh, uh, the quark gluon uh, discrimination is shown for the, those four uh, jet flavors in here. In this uh, second panel, uh, this panel shows the corresponding ratios of the different flavors over the inclusive jets data. And at the bottom uh, of the uh, plot, uh, three panels, three sub panels, show the ratios of the different Monte Carlo predictions over the jet flavors. And uh, differences between the uh, quark, uh, quark and uh, gluon and read samples do not seem to be uh, very strong. Uh, for the, um, uh, the results uh, were compared to the various generators, uh, POVEC plus PTA8, uh, POVEC plus P uh, Herbic 7, and also uh, PP8 uh, with uh, final, uh, final state radiation up and final state uh, radiation down were also uh, checked. And the Sharper 2 and the Dyer 2 uh, was the prediction that have been used in this, present, uh, in this uh, measurement. Um, this is the actually uh, unfolded uh, distributions are shown here for the um, charge and uh, the charge neutral particles for all jet samples. I just uh, show here the, the charge ones. Uh, the, for the more information, you may have a look at the, uh, for uh, in, inside the paper in here. Uh, I would like to emphasize that the, the distribution of the groomed momentum uh, fraction, which is ZG distribution, is presented first time uh, in here in this uh, in this paper, and uh, there is a good data model agreement in this observable only for the Herwig Seven. Uh, however, there is a large spread in generator uh, predictions when we look at the other predictions, and when we look at the angle between uh, groomed subjects delta R G, uh, we see a strong dependency uh, on the amount of the point of state radiation. Uh, we have also made a recent publication. Uh, this, is, this publication is related with the running of top quark mass, uh, which is 
experimentally investigated for the first time. And uh, the aim was following. So we have measured the top quark mass as a function of the scale MTT bar. Uh, and uh, we have performed the precise measurement of the differential uh, TT bar cross, cross section as a function of the uh, TT bar mass. And uh, the running uh, was uh, extracted by comparing to differential uh, theory predictions in minimal uh, subtraction renormalization skill, uh, scheme. Um, measured uh, cross sections and their uncertainties are compared to NLO predictions in this scheme as well. Uh, as I said, the, uh, the reference, uh, the normalization um, scale factor uh, is uh, taken as the, uh, the top mass. Uh, and here, uh, different, uh, three different values of the top mass starting from 162 GV to up to 166 uh, GV uh, were used. So um, uh, the, I should also say that this data was unfolded to, uh, to the uh, parton level. Uh, for the running of the, uh, in order to extract the, uh, the running in TT bar, uh, as a, uh, which is defined as a ratio of the top quark mass uh, 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 to the reference mass of the uh, top quark mass. So this is the definition given by the theory and this is the uh, experimental definition that we have used. Uh, what we can see that here that the, our, uh, the, the theoretical side, uh, the running depends only on the uh, RGE, but uh, for the experimental side, we can uh, get benefit from cancellation of the uh, correlated uncertainties. Um, here, the initial scale was chosen as a, um, 476 GV. Um, so the upper plot um, shows the extracted uh, running of top quark mass uh, compared to uh, one loop RG uh, precision, which this is evolved from uh, the, this mu ref. This is the initial scale that is written uh, uh, here. Um, and uh, on the bottom, uh, this result is uh, compared to the value of the uh, MMT extracted at, uh, at the NLO from the inclusive uh, TT bar uh, differential cross section. Um, and uh, we can see that uh, there's a good agreement between the um, good agreement with the RG on a wide range of scales up to uh, one TV. Um, one another analysis, which is uh, a very fresh one, actually, uh, this is the differential TT bar cross sections. Uh, we have we have uh, measured the high uh, PT uh, top quark pairs, uh, the production cross section for high PT top quark pairs. So in this analysis, um, uh, events uh, where uh, either both top quark candidates uh, decay hadronically. Uh, and one of the top quarks decay uh, to uh, a B jet, uh, neptonically uh, to a B jet uh, are used. So uh, the substructure observable used extensively uh, for the tagging of the top quark, and this is the N jet subtenance variables that are uh, uh, that are measured and available in the in the uh, physics analysis paper. Um, on the uh, Right hand side of the slide, you see the absolute cross sections, differential cross section, and uh, on the bottom of the, uh, the slide, uh, the normalized cross section is uh, given, and the data is compared with uh, POVEC plus uh, PTA8 and uh, Monte Carlo et al. Uh, together with uh, PTA8, and POVEC plus or plus plus is uh, also one of the predictions uh, used uh, to compare the data, and both. Uh, data uh, unfolded to particle level. Um, so uh, hard radiation uh, centers found uh, with exclusive KT algorithm. Uh, we have applied this uh, grooming technique in order to remove soft and wide angle radiation from the jet uh, just to improve the mass resolution. And as you can see, it really helps to, to uh, improve the, uh, the mass uh, of the, to, to measure the mass of the uh, top quark. Um, so this brings me to the summary. Uh, so there is a significant ongoing effort to improve our understanding of QCD with jet substructure measurements. 
uh, and this kind of measurements can uh, give, a, uh, give a light on uh, the standard model in extreme phase space region. Uh, both inclusive and uh, differential cross-section measurements performed by the CMS collaboration, and this can uh, tackle different modeling aspects at different phase space region. Changing from the low uh, PT to high PT, various interesting measurements allow us to see the strengths of different Monte Carlo too. So uh, some of the Monte Carlos needs uh, fine tuning. Of course, we are not done yet, and there are still more measurements and efforts are ongoing. And uh, please stay tuned. And thank you for your attention. Thanks a lot, Denise. That's very nice presentation results. So I have time for one quick question. Thank you. So I don't see any uh, enhanced raised. So I think it was all very clear. Um, so we can uh, we can move now then to the last uh, contribution in this session by Anthony Badea. Anthony, are you there? Yeah, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Could you try to share slides? Yeah, I'll share right now. Okay. Uh, can you Wait. see them? Yeah, I can see them. So Anthony will talk about multi-differential and unbeam measurements of hadronic event shapes in uh, E plus E minus collisions at 91 GV from Aleph uh, using open data. Uh, so please go ahead whenever you're ready. Fantastic. So, hey everybody, my name is Anthony Badea, and I'm a graduate student at Harvard University. And today I'll be showing preliminary results on the use of a new multi-differential and unbend unfolding technique known as Omnifold, applied to archived LUP1 data from the ALF collaboration. And I'm presenting this work on behalf of Patrick Kaminsky, Eric Matayadev, Ben Nachman, Yenji Lee, Jesse Thaler, Austin Batty, and Chris McGinn. And before I start, I want to thank the organizing committee for the IHEP conference for adjusting to the circumstances and helping us all stay connected from our homes. And thanks everybody for making the best out of the situation. And since this talk is only supposed to be around 10, 12 minutes long, I'm going to be quite brief in some of my explanations and where possible focus on exciting ideas rather than uh, exact details. But of course, uh, if there's anything you have questions about, please reach out to me or any of my collaborators with any questions or comments. And throughout this talk, I'll cover three main topics. Uh, first is unfolding, data, and physics. I'll begin by describing what we view as the current challenges facing traditional unfolding methods and offer an overview of the new technique deployed. Then I'll give a quick overview of the Aleph archive data and after this, we'll touch on the physics we are interested in, namely one minus thrust and log one minus thrust, and I'll show our preliminary results. And finally, I'll wrap up with a summary, a few comments, and provide my contact info. Moving on to slide three. As I said, we think that there are that the current traditional unfolding techniques face several challenges, as outlined in this slide by one of my collaborators, Patrick. First, these methods, such as iterative Bayesian unfolding, are inherently binned. This means that the binning is fixed ahead of time and cannot be changed later, and the unfolding performance is highly sensitive to the binning. Second, the methods are only practically useful for a limited number of observables, since the binning of each individual one induces a large computational complexity. Third, the unfolding or response matrix typically depends on an auxiliary feature, i.e. that the detector level quantity may not capture the full detector effect. An example of such a feature can be seen in the case of two jets acquiring the same mass in different ways as shown in the bottom left of this slide. Though the jet's mass is the same to the unfolding algorithm, the detector effects could be quite different. Another example of these challenges is a recent, very nice and interesting moon plane measurement by the ALICE collaboration, which was shown, I think, two talks ago. And this measurement was extremely interesting, extremely nice. It's something that was brought up at Boost was that the axes that were chosen weren't exactly what the theory paper used to compare with. And if the collaboration wished to change the binning or add in another observable to change the axes, they would need to redo in the unfolding, which would likely drastically increase the computational complexity and have to go through another procedure to be published. Now on slide four, uh, the these challenges were the primary motivation behind Omnifold. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to go into the details of the technique, but you can find links to other talks and an example Jupyter notebook in my backup slides. 
But in a nutshell, Omnifold is a multi-differential and unbinned machine learning based generalization of iterative Bayesian unfolding or IBU. And for those of you familiar with IBU, the key insight going from IBU to Omnifold is the following. First, the unfolding matrix is accessible via the likelihood ratios of data reconstruction and truth. Second, the likelihood ratio is the optimal binary classifier according to the Neiman Pearson lemma. And third, if you assume a softmax activation, then the likelihood ratios can be accessed by training a network to classify events as either data or reconstruction and either reconstruction or truth. So as I said, there's more details in the backup slides. And if you wanna see the original paper, please check out the publication by my collaborators. Moving on to slide five. Up until now, Omnifold has only been applied to Monte Carlo, but it, thanks in large part to the ALF collaboration, we're able to deploy the technique on real collider data. So data that were used was collected at LEP at 91 GV. And for this analysis, we are using approximately 1.36 million events. We use the event and track selections supplied by the collaboration, which are detailed in the backup slides. And the unfolding also utilized archived Pythia 6.1 with matched reconstruction events, which were also supplied by the ALF collaboration. And in particular, we wanna thank Marcello Maggi and Gunther Dissatori for their foresight in preserving the data, which is now enabling us and others to expose different aspects of it in ways that were not known in the 1990s and for helping us work with the data today. Personally, I hope that in the future, people like us will be able to do the same thing with LHD data. And for this data set, myself, BNG, and others not involved in this specific analysis have already published a measurement of the two-particle correlation function um, that you can check out if you wanna read more about the data or if you wanna read more about progress in small system collectivity and heavy ion physics. Now on slide six. So we're currently working on the measurements of one minus thrust referred to as tau and log tau. And briefly, the thrust axis is the axis that is most in line with the momentum of the particles in an event. And the thrust value is the normalized projection of the momenta along that axis. Tau, which is one minus thrust, goes between zero and 0.5, with zero being a perfectly back-to-back -back event and 0.5, the perfectly uniform event. We're interested in these observables because there's a large discrepancy between theory and experiment in the highly perturbative regions of phase space, which correspond to low thrust or high tau, as well as in the non-perturbative regions. And we chose to focus on tau because most modern theoretical calculations work with tau to better highlight the nuclear physics, resummation, and fixed order re regions. And very briefly, the reason we worked in both linear and log space is because these spaces highlight different physics. Together, they provide insight into the perturbative and non-perturbative physics and play in particle collisions. And an example of this is the measurement of the soft drop jet observables and PP collisions to the right by the Atlas collaboration, which coincidentally was also shown, I think in the, in the same talk as one of the earlier plots I showed. And this is an extremely nice and interesting measurement. And by conducting the measurements in both linear and log space, the collaboration exposed the contributions from non-perturbative and perturbative physics. Now, moving on to slide seven for the one minus thrust result or tau. In the top panel, the black line is the not unfolded Aleph raw archive data. The orange is the Pythia 6.1 reconstruction. The dashed blue is the truth level archive Pythia 6.1. The green is the Aleph collaborations measurement. The gray is the unfolded distribution with IBU and the red is the unfolded distribution using unifold which is omnifold one dimensional variant. And in the bottom panel, the ratio of the above distribution to so the generation level distribution is shown. And the green uh, bands around the Aleph measurement are the uncertainties that are provided by the collaboration on hepdata.net, which is also where we got their exact data points. And if you're looking in, in both plots, notice in the, region, in the regime where the Monte Carlo accurately models the physics, Unifold performs similarly, similarly well to IBU and is with, within the uncertainty supplied by the ALF collaboration for the entire phase space. As this is only a preliminary result, there are more details that we're working through at the moment, but this already gives us confidence that the method is performing as expected and further results will be available in the future.
Moving on to slide eight for the log tile result, we once again have the same color coding as the previous slides and the bottom panel ratios are also with respect to the gen level distribution. We can see that working in log space spreads out the nuclear physics region or the non-perturbative region over more bins and compresses the perturbative regions. So the issues in Pythia are better highlighted. For large values of tau or small negative values of log tau, Pythia is missing fixed order corrections. Whereas for small values of tau or large negative values of log tau, the non-perturbative model in Pythia is, hasn't yet been tuned to data in the very low log tau region. This is shown on either ends of the, unif of the unfolded distribution where the ratio to gen is significantly away from one. With modern Monte Carlo generators, we expect to get better agreement in the large tau region, but in the small tau regions, it's not clear because the discrepancy arises from a tuning issue, no matter which generator you, you use. In the future, we're gonna use different generators and try out different combinations to see what the different effects are, and we'll, re we'll report the findings in the paper that's to come. And to wrap up, uh, my collaborators and I are in the process of deploying a new highly promising unfolding technique on real E plus E minus data to measure tau and log tau. The current and previous results suggest that Omnifold is a viable solution to the challenges facing modern unfolding techniques. And as I've shown, significant progress has already been made in deploying Omnifold or Unifold on real collider data via the Aleph archive data. And going forward, we're working on handling uncertainties, comparing the results with different Monte Carlo generators, and ultimately performing a multi-differential unfolded measurement. Lastly, before I go, I wanna say thank you again to the IHEP organizers, all the participants, and those of you watching this talk on behalf of my collaborators, I hope that everyone's safe and well and still having some fun and it's great to stay connected. And if anybody has any questions or comments, uh, my email is there at the bottom and please reach out to myself or any of the collaborators. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Very interesting and nice talk. Um, I see uh, 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 Marek, uh, go ahead. Yes, <laughs> this was uh, fascinating, Anthony. Uh, in the example you discussed, you focused on shape variables. Mm -hmm. Are there any thoughts of using this approach for BSM physics? I know that from some of my other collaborators, they're thinking about this right now for testing it with the Aleph archive data. We're currently focusing on these event, on these event shape variables because the other details of the technique still need to be hashed out a bit more, but I think in the future, definitely folks trying to use it for BSM physics is, is for sure for, an option. For example, you have Mike Williams in MIT and LA, who is a part of LHCB and LHCB has all these uh, fascinating data about possible lepton flavor violation. And I wonder what you could do for them. Yeah, I definitely agree. And I know I, I was at MIT as an undergrad and Yenji and Jesse, I think, I don't know exactly, but I'm sure they're in, in contact with Mike about something, something regarding that. I'm pretty sure Jesse is. Right, so that would be very interesting. Thank you. Yeah, I'm taking a note of that. Thanks for the comment. Okay, thanks a lot. Is there any other question? To Anthony? If not, uh, thanks again to Anthony and all the speakers in this, uh, in this session. So this is the end for today. Uh, and uh, we'll reconvene tomorrow at uh, 8 a.m. Uh, uh, Europe time. Uh, thanks to everyone. Have a nice day. <laughs>